Chapter One of The Millionaire Baby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Don Larson in Minnesota. The Millionaire's Baby by Anna K. Green. Chapter One Two Little Shoes. The morning of August 18th was a memorable one to me. For two months I had had a run of bad luck. During that time I had failed to score in at least three affairs of unusual importance, and the result was a decided loss in repute as well as great financial embarrassment. As I had a mother and two sisters to support, and knew but one way to do it, I was in a state of profound discouragement. This was before I took up the morning papers. After I had opened and read them, not a man in New York could boast of higher hopes or greater confidence in his power to rise by one bold stroke from threatened bankruptcy to immediate independence. The paragraph which had occasioned this amazing change must have passed under the eyes of many of you. It created a widespread excitement at the time and raised in more than one breast the hope of speedy fortune. It was attached to, or rather introduced, the most startling feature of the week, and it ran thus, A Fortune for a Child, by Cable from Southampton. A reward of $5,000 is offered by Philo Ocampa to whoever will give such information as will lead to the recovery, alive or dead, of his six-year-old daughter, Gwendolen, missing since the afternoon of August the 16th, from her home on the Hudson, New York, USA. Fifty thousand dollars additional and no questions asked if she is restored unharmed within the week to her mother at Homewood. All communications to be addressed to Samuel Atwater on the Hudson. A minute description of the child followed, but this did not interest me, and I did not linger over it. The child was no stranger to me. I knew her well and consequently was quite aware of her personal characteristics. It was the great amount offered for her discovery and restoration which moved me so deeply. Fifty thousand dollars. A fortune for any man. More than a fortune to me, who stood in such need of ready money. I was determined to win this extraordinary sum. I had my reason for hope and, in the light of this unexpectedly munificent reward, decided to waive all the considerations which had hitherto prevented me from stirring in the matter. There were other reasons less selfish which gave impetus to my resolve. I had done business for the Ocampas before and had been well treated in the transaction. I recognized and understood both Mr. Ocampa's peculiarities and those of his admired and devoted wife. As man and woman, they were kindly, honorable, and devoted to many more interests than those connected with their own wealth. I also knew their hearts to be wrapped up in this child, the sole offspring of a long and happy union, and the actual as well as prospective inheritor of more millions than I shall ever see thousands. Unless I am fortunate enough to solve the mystery now exercising the sympathies of the whole New York public. You have all heard of this child under another name. From her birth she has been known as the millionaire baby, being the direct heir to three fortunes, two of which she has already received. I saw her first when she was three years old, a cherubic little being, lovely to look upon, and possessing unusual qualities for so young a child. Indeed, her picturesque beauty and appealing ways would have attracted all eyes and won all hearts, even if she had not represented in her small person the wealth both of the Ocampa and Rathbone families. There was an individuality about her, combined with sensibilities of no ordinary nature, which fully accounted for the devoted affection with which she was universally regarded. And when she suddenly disappeared, it was easy to comprehend if one did not share, the thrill of horror which swept from one end of our broad continent to the other. Those who knew the parents, and those who did not, suffered an equal pain at the awful thought of this petted innocent lost in the depths of the great unknown, with only the false caresses of her abductors to comfort her, for the deprivation of all those delights which love and unlimited means 
could provide to make a child of her years supremely happy. Her father, and this was what gave the keen edge of horror to the whole occurrence, was in Europe when she disappeared. He had been cabled at once, and his answer was the proffered reward with which I have opened this story. An accompanying dispatch to his distracted wife announced his relinquishment of the project which had taken him abroad, and his immediate return on the next steamer sailing from Southampton. As this chanced to be the fastest on the line, we had reason to expect him in six days. Meanwhile, but to complete my personal recapitulations, when the first news of this startling abduction flashed upon my eyes from the bulletin boards, I looked on the matter as one of too great magnitude to be dealt with by any but the Metropolitan Police. But as time passed and further details of the strange and seemingly inexplicable affair came to light, I began to feel the stirring of the detective instinct within me. Did I say that I was connected with a private detective agency of some note in the metropolis? And a desire, quite apart from any mere humane interest in the event itself, to locate the intelligence back of such a desperate crime, an intelligence so keen that, up to the present moment, if we may trust the published accounts of the affair, not a clue had been unearthed by which its author could be traced, or the means employed for carrying off this petted object of a thousand cares. To be sure, there was a theory which eliminated all crime from the occurrence, as well as the intervention of any one in the child's fate. She might have strayed down to the river and been drowned. But the probabilities were so opposed to this supposition that the police had refused to embrace it, although the mother had accepted it from the first, and up to the present moment, or so it was stated, had refused to consider any other. As she had some basis for this conclusion, I am still quoting from the papers, you understand. I was not disposed to ignore it in the study I proceeded to make of the situation. The details, as I ran them over in the hurried trip I now made up the river, were as follows. On the afternoon of Wednesday, August 16th, the guests assembled in Mrs. Ocampa's white and gold music room were suddenly thrown into confusion by the appearance among them of a young girl in a state of great perturbation, who, running up to the startled hostess, announced that Gwendolen, the petted darling of the house, was missing from the bungalow where she had been lying asleep, and could not be found, though a dozen men had been out on search. The wretched mother, who, as it afterward transpired, had not only given the orders by which the child had been thus removed from the excitement of the house, but had actually been herself but a few moments before to see that the little one was well cared for and happy, seemed struck as by a mortal blow at these words, and, uttering a heart-rending scream, ran out onto the lawn. A crowd of guests rushed after her, and as they followed her flying figure across the lawn to the small copse in which lay hidden this favored retreat, they could hear, borne back on the wind, the wild protests of the young nurse, that she had left the child for a minute only, and then to go no farther than the bench running along the end of the bungalow facing the house, that she had been told she could sit there and listen to the music, but that she never would have left the child's side for a minute if she had not supposed she would hear her least stir, protests which the mother scarcely seemed to heed, and which were presently lost in the deep silence which fell on all. As, brought to a stand in the thick shrubbery surrounding the bungalow, they saw the mother stagger up to the door, look in, and turn toward them with death in her face. "'The river!' she gasped. "'The river! And heedless of all attempt to stop her, heedless even of the efforts made by the little one's nurse to draw her attention to the nearness of a certain opening in the high hedge marking off the Ocampa's grounds on this side. She ran down the bank in the direction of the railway, but fainted before she had more than cleared the thicket. When they lifted her up, they all saw the reason for this. She had come upon a little shoe which she held frantic, clutched against her breast, her child's shoe, which, as she afterward acknowledged, she had loosened with her own hand on the little one's foot. 
Of course, after this, the whole hillside was searched down to the fence which separated it from the railroad track. But no further trace of the child was found, nor did it appear possible to anyone that she could have strayed away in this direction. For not only was the bank exceedingly steep, and the fence at its base impassable, but a gang of men, working as good fortune would have it, at such a point on the road below as to render it next to impossible for her to have crossed the track within a half-mile either way without being observed, had one and all declared that not one of them had seen her or any other person descend the slope. This, however, made but little impression on the mother. She would listen to no hints of abduction, but persisted in her declaration that the river had swallowed her darling, and would neither rest nor turn her head from its waters, till some half a dozen men about the place had been set systematically to work to drag the stream. Meanwhile, the police had been notified and the whole town aroused. The search, which had been carried on up to this time in a frantic but desultory way, now became methodical. Nor was it confined to the Acumpa estate. All the roads and byways within half a mile either way were covered by a most careful investigation. All the nearby houses were entered, especially those which the child was most in the habit of frequenting, but no one had seen her, nor could any trace of her presence be found. At five o'clock all hope of her return was abandoned, and, much against Mrs. Ocampa's wish, who declared that the news of the child's death would affect her father far less than the dreadful possibilities of abduction, the exact facts of the case had been cabled to Mr. Ocumpa. The night and another day passed, bringing but little relief to the situation. Not an eye had yet been closed in Homewood, nor had the search ceased for an instant. Not an inch of the great estate had been overlooked, yet men could still be seen beating the bushes and peering in all the secluded spots, which once had formed the charm of this delightful place. As on the land, so on the river. All the waters in the dock had been dragged, yet the work went on, some said under the very eye of Mrs. Ocumpa, but there was no result as yet. In the city the interest was intense. The telegraph at police headquarters had been clicking incessantly for thirty-six hours, under the direction, some said, of the superintendent himself. Everything which could be done had been done, but as yet the papers were able to report nothing beyond some vague stories of a child with its face much bound up, having been seen at the heels of a woman in Grand Central Station in New York, and hints of a covered wagon with a crying child inside, which had been driven through Westchester County at a great pace shortly before sunset on the previous day, closely followed by a buggy with the storm apron up, though the sun shone and there was not a cloud in the sky. But nothing definite, nothing which could give hope to the distracted mother, or do more than divide the attention of the police between two different but equally tenable theories. Then came the cablegram from Mr. Ocumpa, which threw amateur as well as professional detectives into the field. Among the latter was myself, which naturally brings me back once more to my own conclusions. Of one thing I felt sure. Very early in my cogitations, before we had quitted the Park Avenue Tunnel, in fact, I had decided in my own mind that if I were to succeed in locating the lost heiress, it must be by subtler methods than lay open to the police. I was master of such methods, in this case at least, and though one of many owning to similar hopes on this very train which was rushing me through to Homewood, I had no feeling but that of confidence in the final success. How well founded this confidence was will presently appear. The number of seedy-looking men with a mysterious air who alighted in my company at the station, and immediately proceeded to make their way up the steep street toward Homewood, warned me that it would soon be extremely difficult for anyone to obtain access to the parties most interested in the child's loss. Had I not possessed the advantage of being already known to Mrs. Ocumpa, I should have immediately given up all hope 
of ever obtaining access to her presence, and even with this fact to back me, I approached the house with very little confidence in my ability to win my way through the iron gates I had so frequently passed before without difficulty. And, indeed, I found them well guarded. As I came nearer, I could see man after man being turned away, and not till my card had been handed in, and a hurried note to boot, did I obtain permission to pass the first boundary. Another note secured me admission to the house, but there my progress stopped. Mrs. Ocumpa had already been interviewed by five reporters and a special agent from the New York police. She could see no one else at present. If, however, my business was of importance, an opportunity would be given for me to see Miss Porter. Miss Porter was her companion and female factotum. As I had calculated upon having a half-dozen words with the mother herself, I was greatly thrown out by this, but, going upon the principle that half a loaf was better than no bread, I was about to express a desire to see Miss Porter, when an incident occurred which effectually changed my mind in this regard. The hall in which I was standing, and which communicated with the side door by which I had entered, ended in a staircase leading, as I had reason to believe, to the smaller and less pretentious rooms in the rear of the house. While I hesitated what reply to give the girl awaiting my decision, I caught the sound of soft weeping from the top of this staircase, and presently beheld the figure of a young woman coming slowly down, clad in coat and hat, and giving every evidence, both in dress and manner, of leaving for good. It was Miss Graham, a young woman who held the position of nursery governess to the child. I had seen her before, and had no small admiration for her, and the sensation I experienced at the sight of her leaving the house, where her services were apparently no longer needed, proved to me, possibly for the first time, that I had more heart in my breast than I had ever before realized. But it was not this which led me to say to the maid standing before me, that I preferred to see Mrs. Ocumpa herself, and would call early the next day. It was the thought that this sorrowing girl would have to pass the gauntlet of many prying eyes on her way to the station, and that she might be glad of an escort whom she knew and had shown some trust in. Also, but the reasons behind that also will soon become sufficiently apparent. I was right in supposing that my presence on the porch outside would be a pleasing surprise to her. Though her tears continued to flow, she accepted my proffered companionship with gratitude, and soon we were passing side by side across the lawn, toward a short cut leading down the bank to the small flag station used by the family and by certain favored neighbors. As we threaded the shrubbery, which is very thick about the place, she explained to me the cause of her abrupt departure. The sight of her, it seemed, had become insupportable to Mrs. Ocumpa. Though no blame could be rightfully attached to her, it was certainly true that the child had been carried off while in her charge, and, however hard that might be for her, few could blame the mother for wishing her removed from the house, desolated by the lack of vigilance but she was a good girl and felt the humiliation of her departure, almost in the light of a disgrace. As soon as we came again into an open portion of the lawn, she stopped short and looked back. Oh, she cried, gripping me by the arm, there is Mrs. Ocumpa still at the window. All night she has stood there except when she flew down to the river at the sound of some imaginary call from the boats. She believes, she really believes, that they will yet come upon Gwendolen's body in the dock there. Following the direction of her glance, I looked up. Was that Mrs. Ocumpa, that haggard, intent figure, with eyes fixed in awful expectancy, on the sinister group I could picture to myself, down at the water's edge? Never could I have imagined such a look on features that I had always considered as cold as they were undeniably beautiful. As I took in the misery it expressed, that awful waiting for an event momently anticipated and momently postponed, I found myself, without reason and simply in response to the force of her expression, unconsciously sharing her expectation, 
and with a momentary forgetfulness of all the probabilities, was about to turn toward the spot upon which her glances were fixed, when a touch on my arm recalled me to myself. Come, whispered my trembling companion, she may look down and see us here. I yielded to her persuasion and turned away into the cluster of trees that lay between us and the opening in the hedge through which our course lay. Had I been alone, I should not have budged until I had seen some change, any change, in the face whose appearance had so deeply affected me. Mrs. Ocumpa certainly believes that the body of her child lies in the water, I remarked, as we took our way onward as rapidly as possible. Do you know her reasons for this? She says, and I think she is right so far, that the child has been bent for a long time on fishing, that she has heard her father talk repeatedly of his great luck in Canada last year, and wished to try the sport for herself, that she has been forbidden to go to the river, but must have taken the first opportunity when no eye was on her to do so, and, and Mrs. Ocumpa shows a bit of string which she found last night in the bushes alongside the tracks when she ran down, as I have said, at some imaginary shout from the boats, a string which she declares she saw rolled up in Gwendolen's hand when she went into the bungalow to look at her. Of course it may not be the same, but Mrs. Ocumpa thinks it is, and do you think it possible, after all, that the child did stray down to the water? No, was the vehement disclaimer. Gwendolen's feet were excessively tender. She could not have taken three steps in only one shoe. I should have heard her cry out. What if she went in someone's arms? A stranger's? She has a decided instinct against strangers. Never could any one she did not know and like have carried her so far as that without her waking. Then those men on the track, they would have seen her. No, Mr. Trevitt, it was not in that direction she went. The force of her emphasis convinced me that she had an opinion of her own in regard to this matter. Was it one she was ready to impart? In what direction, then, I asked, with a gentleness I hoped would prove effective. Her impulse was toward frank reply. I saw her lips part and her eyes take on the look which precedes a direct avowal. But, as chance would have it, we came at that moment upon the thicket enclosing the bungalow, and the sight of its picturesque walls showing brown through the verdure of surrounding shrubbery seemed to act as a check upon her, for, with a quick look and a certain dry accent, quite new in her speech, she suddenly inquired if I did not want to see the place from which Gwendolen had disappeared. Naturally I answered in the affirmative, and followed her as she turned aside into the circular path which embraces the hidden retreat. But I had rather have heard her answer to my question than have gone anywhere or seen anything at that moment. Yet, when in full view of the bungalow's open door, she stopped to point out to me the nearness of that place to that opening in the hedge we had just been making for, and when she even went so far as to indicate the tangled little path by which that opening could be reached directly, from the farther end of the bungalow, I considered that my question had been answered, though in another way than I had anticipated, even before I noted the slight flush which rose to her cheek under my earnest scrutiny. As I took this all in, I ventured to ask some particulars of the family living so near the Ocumpas. Who occupies that house? I asked, pointing to the sloping roof's ornamental chimney, arising just beyond us over the hedgerows. Oh, that is Mrs. Carew's home. She is a widow and Mrs. Ocumpa's dearest friend. How she loved Gwendolen, how we all loved her, and now, that wretch, she burst into tears. They were genuine ones. So was her grief. I waited till she was calm again, then inquired very softly, What wretch? You have not been inside, she suggested, pointing sharply to the bungalow. I took the implied rebuke and entered the door she indicated. A man was sitting within, but he rose and went out when he saw us. He wore a policeman's badge and evidently recognized her or possibly myself. I noted, however, that he did not go far from the doorway. 
"'It is only a den,' remarked Miss Graham. "'I looked about me. "'She had described it perfectly, "'a place to lounge on an August day like present. "'Walls of Georgia pine, "'across one of which hung a series of long dark rugs, "'a long low window looking toward the house, "'a few articles of bamboo furniture described the place. "'Among the latter was a couch. "'It was drawn up underneath the window.' on the other side of which ran the bench where my companion declared she had been sitting while listening to the music. "'Wouldn't you think my attention would have been caught by the sound of anyone moving about here?' she cried, pointing to the couch and then to the window. "'But the window was closed, and the door, if you see, is round the corner from the bench.' "'A person with a very stealthy step, apparently.' "'Very,' she admitted. "'Oh, how can I ever forgive myself?' "'How can I ever, ever forgive myself?' "'As she stood wringing her hands in sight of that empty couch, "'I cast a scrutinizing glance about me, which led me to remark, "'This interior looks new, much newer than the outside. "'It has quite a modern air. "'Yes, the bungalow is old, very old, "'but this room or den or whatever you might call it "'was all remodeled and fitted up as you see it now "'when the new house went up. It had long been abandoned as a place of retreat and had fallen into such decay that it was a perfect eyesore to all who saw it. Now it is likely to be abandoned again, and for what a reason! Oh, the dreadful place! How I hate it now Gwendolen is gone! One moment. I notice another thing. This room does not occupy the whole of the bungalow. Either she did not hear me or thought it unnecessary to reply, and perceiving that her grief had now given way to an impatience to be gone, I did not press the matter, but led the way myself to the door. As we entered the little path which runs directly to that outlet in the hedge, I ventured to speak again. You have reasons, or so it appears, for believing that the child was carried off through this very path? The reply was impetuous. How else could she have been spirited away so quickly? Besides, here her eye stole back at me over her shoulder. I have since remembered that as I ran out of the bungalow in my fright at finding the child gone, I heard the sound of wheels on Mrs. Carew's driveway. It did not mean much to me then, for I expected to find the child somewhere about on the grounds. But now, when I come to think it, it means everything, for a child's cry mingled with it, or I imagined that it did. "'And that child?' "'But,' I forcibly interposed, "'the police should know this.' "'They do, and so does Mrs. Ocumpa, "'but she has only the one idea, "'and nothing can move her.' "'I remembered the wagon with the crying child inside, "'which had been seen on the roads the previous evening, "'and my heart fell a little in spite of myself. "'Couldn't Mrs. Carew tell us something about this?' I asked." with a gesture toward the house we were now passing. No, Mrs. Carew went to New York that morning, and had only just returned when we missed Gwendolen. She had been for her little nephew, who has lately been made an orphan, and she was too busy making him feel comfortable at home to notice if a carriage had passed through her grounds. Her servants, then? She had none. All had been sent away. The house was quite empty. I thought this rather odd, but having at that moment reached the long flight of steps leading down the embankment, I made no reply till we reached the foot. Then I observed, I thought Mrs. Carew was very intimate with Mrs. Ocumpa. She is, they are more like sisters than mere friends. Yet she goes to New York the very day her friend gives a music hall? Oh, she had good reasons for that. Mrs. Carew is planning to sail this week for Europe, and this was her only opportunity for getting her little nephew— who is to go with her. But I don't know as she will sail now. She is wild with grief over Gwendolen's loss, and will not feel like leaving Mrs. Acumpa until she knows whether we shall ever see the dear child again. But I shall miss my train. Here her step visibly hastened. As it was really very nearly due, I had not the heart to detain her. But as I followed in her wake, I noticed that for all her hurry a curious hesitancy crept into her step at times, and I should not have been surprised at any moment to see her stop and confront me, 
on one of the two remaining long flights of steps leading down the steep hillside. But we both reached the base without having yielded to this impulse, and presently we found ourselves in full view of the river and the small flag station, located but a few rods away toward the left. As we turned toward the latter, we both cast an involuntary look back at the Ocampa deck, where a dozen men could be seen at work dragging the riverbed with grappling irons. It made a sadly suggestive picture, and the young girl at my side shuddered violently as we noted the expression of morbid curiosity on the faces of such onlookers, men and women, as were drawn up at the end of the small point on which the boathouse stood. But I had another reason than this for urging her on. I had noticed how, at the sight of her slight figure descending the slope, some half-dozen or so men separated themselves from this group, with every appearance of intending to waylay and question her. She noticed this, too, and drawing up more closely to my side, exclaimed with marked feeling, "'Save me from these men, and I will tell you something that no one—' But here she stopped. Here our very thoughts stopped." A shout had risen from the group at the water edge, a shout which made us both turn, and even caused the men who had started to follow us to wheel about and rush back to the dock, with every appearance of intense excitement. "'What is it? What can it be?' faltered my greatly alarmed companion. "'They have found something, see? What is that? The man in the boat is holding up. It looks like—' but she was already halfway to the point, outstripping the very men whose importunities she had shrunk from a moment before. I was not far behind her, and almost immediately we found ourselves wedged among the agitated group, leaning over the little object which had been tossed ashore into the first hand outstretched to receive it. It was a second little shoe, filled with sand and dripping with water, but recognizable as similar to the one already found the preceding day, high up on the bank. As this fact was borne in on us all, a groan of pity broke from more than one pair of lips, and eye after eye stole up the hillside to that far window, in the great pile above us where the mother's form could be dimly discerned swaying in an agitation caught from our own excitement but there was one amongst us whose glance never left that little shoe. The train she had been so anxious to take whistled and went thundering by, but she never moved or noticed. Suddenly she reached out her hand. "'Let me see it, please,' she entreated. "'I was her nurse. Let me take it in my hand.' The man who held it passed it over. She examined it long and closely. "'Yes, it is hers,' she said." but in another moment she had laid it down with what I thought was a very peculiar look. Instantly it was caught up and carried with a rush up the slope, where Mrs. Ocumpa could be seen awaiting it with outstretched arms. But I did not linger to mark her reception of it. Miss Graham had drawn me to one side and was whispering in my ear. "'I must talk to you. I cannot keep back another moment what I think or what I feel.' "'Someone is playing with Mrs. Ocumpa's fears. "'That shoe is Gwendolen's, "'but it is not the mate of the one found on the bank above. "'That one? That was for the left foot, "'and so is this one. Did you not notice?' "'End of chapter 1「Two of the Millionaire Baby」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. « Millionaire Baby » by Anna K. Green Chapter 2 A Fearsome Man The effect of this statement upon me was greater than even she had contemplated. "'You thought the child had been stolen for the reward she would bring?' she continued. "'She was not. She was taken out of pure hate, and that is why I suffer so.' What may they not do to her? Oh, in what hole hide her? My darling, oh, my darling. She was going off into hysterics, but the look and touch I gave her recalled her to herself. We need to be calm, I urged. 
you because you have something of importance to impart, and I because of the action I must take as soon as the facts you have concealed become known to me. What gives you such confidence in this belief, which I am sure is not shared by the police, and who is the someone who, as you say, is playing upon Mrs. Ocumpaugh's fears? A short time ago it was as the wretch you spoke of him. Are not someone and the wretch one and the same person, and can you not give him now a name? We had been moving all this time in the direction of the station, and had now reached the foot of the platform. Pausing, she cast a last look up the bank. The trees were thick and hid from our view the Ocumpa mansion, but in imagination she beheld the mother moaning over that little shoe. "'I shall never return there,' she muttered. "'Why do I hesitate so to speak?' Then in a burst, as I watched her in growing excitement, she— Mrs. Ocumpa begged me not to tell what she believed had nothing to do with our Gwendolen's loss, but I could not keep silent. This proof of a conspiracy against herself certainly relieves me from any promise I may have made her. Mr. Trevitt, I am positive that I know who carried off Gwendolen. This was becoming interesting, intensely interesting to me. Glancing about and noting that the group down at the water's edge had become absorbed again in renewed efforts toward further discoveries, I beckoned her to follow me into the station. It was but a step, but it gave me time to think. What was I encouraging this young girl to do, to reveal to me, who had no claim upon her but that of friendship, a secret which had not been given to the police? True, it might not be worth much, but it was also true that it might be worth a great deal. Did she know how much? I wanted money, few wanted it more, but I felt that I could not listen to her story till I had fairly settled this point. I therefore hastened to interpose a remark. Miss Graham, you are good enough to offer to reveal some fact hitherto concealed. Do you do this because you have no closer friend than myself? or because you do not know what such knowledge may be worth to the person you give it to, in money, I mean. In money? I am not thinking of money, was her amazed reply. I am thinking of Gwendolen. I understand, but you should think of the practical results as well. Have you not heard of the enormous reward offered by Mr. Ocumpa? No, I... Five thousand dollars for information and fifty thousand to the one who will bring her back within the week unharmed. Mr. Ocumpa cabled to that effect yesterday. It is a large sum, she faltered, and for a moment she hesitated. Then with a sweet and candid look, which sank deep into my heart, she added gravely, I had rather not think of money in connection with Gwendolen. If what I have to tell you leads to her recovery, you can be trusted, I know, to do what is right toward me. Mr. Trevitt, the man who stole her from her couch and carried her away through Mrs. Acumpa's grounds in a wagon or otherwise, is long-haired, a heavily whiskered man of sixty or more years of age. His face is deeply wrinkled, but chiefly marked by a long scar running down between his eyebrows, which are so shaggy that they would quite hide his eyes if they were not lit up with an extraordinary expression of resolution, carried almost to the point of frenzy. A fearsome man, making your heart stand still when he pauses to speak to you. Startled as I had seldom been, for reasons which will hereafter appear, I surveyed her in mingled wonder and satisfaction. His name, I demanded. I do not know his name. Again I stopped to look at her. Does Mrs. Ocampa? I do not think so. She only knows what I told her. And what did you tell her? Ah, who are these? Two or three persons had entered the station, probably to wait for the next train. No one who will molest you. But she was not content till we had withdrawn to where the timetable hung on the opposite wall. Turning about as if to consult it, she told the following story. I never see a timetable now, but I think of her expression as she stood there, looking up as if her mind were fixed on what she probably did not see at all. Last Wednesday, no, it was on the Wednesday preceding, 
I was taking a ride with Gwendolen on one of the side roads branching off toward Fordham. We were in her own little pony cart, and as we seldom rode together like this, she had been chattering away about a hundred things till her eyes danced in her head, and she looked as lovely as I had ever seen her. But suddenly, just as we were about to cross a small wooden bridge, I saw her turn pale and her whole sensitive form quiver. "'Someone I don't like,' she cried. "'There is someone about whom I don't like. "'Drive on, Ellie, drive on.' But before I could gather up the reins, a figure which I had not noticed before stepped from behind a tree at the farther end of the bridge, and advancing into the middle of the road with arms thrown out, stopped our advance. I have told you how he looked, but I can give you no idea of the passionate fury lighting up his eyes, or the fiery dignity with which he held his place, and kept us subdued to his will, till he had looked the shrinking child all over, and laughed, not as a madman laughs, oh, much too slow and ironically for that, but like one who takes an unholy pleasure in mocking the happy present with evil prophecy. Nothing that I can say will make you see him as I saw him in that one instant, and though there was much in the circumstance to cause fear, I think it was more awe than fright we felt, so commanding was his whole appearance, and so forcible the assurance with which he held us there until he was ready to move. Gwendolen cried out, but the imploring sound had no effect upon him. It only reawakened his mirth and led him to say, in a clear, cold, mocking tone which I hear yet, "'Cry out, little one, cry out, for your short day is nearly over.' "'Silks and feathers and carriages and servants "'will soon be a half-forgotten memory to you. "'And write that it should be so. Ten days, little one, only ten days more.' "'And with that he moved and slipped aside behind the tree, "'allowing us to drive on. "'Mr. Trivet, yesterday was the end of those ten days, "'and where is she now? "'Only that man knows. "'He is one man in a thousand. "'Can you not find him?' "'She turned. "'A train was coming, a train which it was very evident "'she felt it her duty to take. "'I had no right to detain her, "'but I found time for a question or two. "'And you told Mrs. Ocumpa this? "'The moment we arrived home. "'And she? What did she think of it? "'Mrs. Ocumpa is not a talkative woman. "'She grew very white and clasped the child passionately in her arms.' but the next minute she had to all appearances dismissed the whole occurrence from her thoughts. Some socialistic fanatic, she called him, and merely advised me to stop driving with Gwendolen for the present. Didn't you recall the matter to her when you found the child missing? Yes, but then she appeared to regard it in a superstitious way only. It was a warning of death, she said, and the man an irresponsible clairvoyant. When I tried to urge my own idea upon her and describe how I thought he might have obtained access to the bungalow and carried her off, while still asleep, to some vehicle awaiting them in Mrs. Carew's grounds, she only rebuked me for my folly and bade me keep still about the whole occurrence, saying that I should only be getting some poor, half-demented old wretch into trouble for something for which he was not in the least responsible." "'A very considerate woman,' I remarked, "'to which Miss Graham made reply as the train came storming up. "'Nobody knows how considerate, "'even if she has dismissed me rather suddenly from her service. "'Don't let that wretch,' again she used the word, "'deceive her or you into thinking "'that that little one perished in the water. "'Gwendolen is alive, I say. "'Find him and you will find her.' I saw his resolution in his eye. Here she made a rush for the cars, and I had time only to get her future address before the train started, and all further opportunity of conversation between us was over for that day. I remained behind because I was by no means through with my investigations. What she had told me only convinced me of the necessity I had already recognized 
of making myself master of all that could be learned at Homewood, before undertaking the very serious business of locating the child, or even the aged man just described to me, and who I was now sure had been the chief, if not the sole, instrument in her abduction. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of the Millionaire Baby》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Millionaire Baby》by Anna K. Green, Chapter Three. A charming woman. Stopping only long enough to send a telegram to my partner in New York, for which purpose I had to walk along the tracks to the main station, I returned by the short cut to Homewood. My purpose in doing this was twofold. I should have a chance of seeing if the men were still at work in the river, and I should also have the added opportunity of quietly revisiting the bungalow, on the floor of which I had noted some chalk marks, which I felt called for a closer examination than I had given them. As I came in view of the dock, I saw that the men were still busy, but at a point farther out in the river, as if all hope had been abandoned of their discovering anything more inshore. But the chalk marks in the bungalow were almost forgotten by me in the interest I experienced in a certain adventure which befell me on my way there. I had just reached the opening in the hedge communicating with Mrs. Carew's grounds when I heard steps on the walk inside and a woman's rich voice saying, There, that will do. You must play on the other side of the house, Harry. And Dinah? See that he does so, and that he does not cross the hall again till I come back. The sight of so merry a child might kill Mrs. Ocumpaugh if she happened to look this way. Moved by the tone, which was one in a thousand, I involuntarily peered through the outlet I was passing, in the hope of catching a glimpse of its owner, and thus was favored with the sight of a face which instantly fixed itself in my memory as one of the most enchanting I had ever encountered. Not from its beauty, yet it may have been beautiful, nor from its youth, for the woman before me was not youthful, but from the extraordinary eloquence of its expression caught at a rare moment, when the heart which gave it life was full. She was standing halfway down the path, throwing kisses to a little boy who was leaning toward her from an upper window. The child was laughing with glee, and it was this laugh she was trying to check, but her countenance, as she made the effort, was almost as merry as his, and yet filled with such solemn joy, such ecstasy of motherhood, I should be inclined to call it, if I had not been conscious that this must be Mrs. Carew, and that the child her nephew. That in my admiration for this exhibition of pure feeling, I forgot to move as she advanced into the hedgerow, and so we came face to face. The result was as extraordinary to me as all the rest. Instantly all the gay abandonment left her features, and she showed me a grave, almost troubled countenance, more in keeping with her severe dress, which was as nearly like mourning as it could be and not be made of crape. It was such a sudden change, and of so complete a character, that I was thrown off my guard for a moment, and probably betrayed the curiosity I undoubtedly felt, for she paused as she reached me, and, surveying me very quietly but very scrutinizingly too, raised again that marvellous voice of hers and pointedly observed, "'This is a private path, sir. Only friends of Mrs. Ocumpa or myself pass here.' This was a speech calculated to restore my self-possession. With a bow which evidently surprised her, I answered with just enough respect to temper my apparent presumption. I am here in the interests of Mrs. Ocumpa to assist her in finding her child. Moments are precious, so I ventured to approach by the shorter way. Pardon me. The words did not come instantly, but after some hesitation during which she kept her eyes on my face, in a way to rob me of all thought save that she possessed a very strong, magnetic quality, to which it were well for a man like myself to yield. 
"'You will be my friend, too, if you succeed in restoring Gwendolen.' Then quickly, as she crossed to the Ocumpa grounds, "'You do not look like a member of the police. "'Are you here at Mrs. Ocumpa's bidding? "'And has she at last given up all expectation "'of finding her child in the river?' "'I, too, thought a minute before answering. "'Then I put on my most candid expression. "'For was not this woman on her way to Mrs. Ocumpa? "'And would she not be likely to repeat what she heard me say?' I do not know how Mrs. Ocumpa feels at present, but I know what her dearest wish is to see her child again alive and well. That wish I shall do my best to gratify. It is true that I am not a police detective, but I have an agency of my own, well known to both Mrs. and Mr. Ocumpa. All its resources will be devoted to this business, and I hope to succeed, madam. If, as I suspect, you are on your way to Mrs. Ocumpa. Please tell her that Robert Trevitt, of Trevitt and Jupp, hopes to succeed. I will, she emphasized, then stepped back to me, in all the grace of her thrilling personality, she eagerly added, If there is any information I can give, do not be afraid to ask me. I love children, and would give anything in the world to see Mrs. Ocumpa as happy with Gwendolen again as I am with my little nephew. Are you quite sure that there is any possibility of this? I was told that the child's shoe had been found in the river, but almost immediately following this information came a report that there was something odd about this shoe, and that Mrs. Ocumpa had gone into hysterics. Do you know what they mean by that? I was just going over to see. I did know what they meant, but I preferred to seem ignorant. I have not seen Mrs. Ocumpa, I evasively rejoined, but I don't look for the child to be drawn from the water. Nor I, she repeated with a hoarse catch in her breath. It is thirty-six hours since we lost her. Time enough for the current to have carried that sweet little body far from here. I surveyed the lady before me in amazement. "'Then you think she strayed down to the water?' "'Yes, it would madden me to believe otherwise, "'loving her so well, and her parents so well. "'I dare not think of a worse fate.' "'Taking advantage of her amiability "'and the unexpected opportunity it offered for a leading question, "'I hereupon ventured to say, "'You were not at home, I hear, when she vanished from the bungalow?' "'No, that is, if it happened before three o'clock.' I arrived from the station just as the clock was striking the hour, and, having my little nephew with me, I was too much occupied in reconciling him to his new home, to hear or see anything outside. Most unfortunate, she mourned, most unfortunate. I shall never cease reproaching myself. A tragedy at my door. Here she glanced across the shrubbery at the bungalow and I occupied with my own affairs. With a flush, the undoubted result of her own eagerness, she turned as if to go, but I could not let her depart without another question. Excuse me, Mrs. Carew, but you gave me permission to seem importunate. With the exception of her nurse, you were the one person nearest the bungalow at the time. Didn't you hear a carriage drive through your grounds at about the hour the alarm first started? I know you have been asked this before, but not by me. It is a very important fact to have settled, very important for those who wish to discover this child at once. For reply she gave me a look of honest amazement. Of course I did, she replied. I came in a carriage myself from the station, and naturally heard it drive away. At her look, at her word, the thread which I had seized with such avidity, seemed to slip from my fingers. Had little Miss Graham's theory no better foundation than this? And were the wheels she heard only those of Mrs. Carew's departing carriage? I resolved to press the matter, even as I ran risk of displeasing her. Mrs. Carew, for it must be Mrs. Carew I am addressing, did your little nephew cry when you first brought him to the house? I think he did, she admitted slowly. 
I think he did. I must have given evidence of the sudden discouragement this brought me, for her lips parted and her whole frame trembled with sudden eagerness. Did you think, did anyone think, that those cries came from Gwendolen, that she was carried out through my grounds? Could anyone have thought that? I have been told that the nursery governess did. Little Miss Graham, poor girl, but she is defending herself from despair. She is ready to believe everything but that the child is dead. Was it so? Was I following the false light of a will-o'-the-wisp? No. No. The strange coincidence of the threat made on the bridge, with the disappearance of the child on the day named, was at least real. The thread had not altogether escaped from my hands. It was less tangible, but it was still there. You may be right, I acquiesced, for I saw that her theories were entirely opposed to those of Miss Graham. But we must try everything, everything. I was about to ask whether she had ever seen in the adjoining grounds, or on the roads about, an old man with long hair and a remarkable scar running down between his eyebrows, when a young girl in a cap and apron of a maid-servant came running through the shrubbery from the Ocampa house, and, seeing Mrs. Carew, panted out, "'Oh, do come over to the house, Mrs. Carew. Mrs. Ocumpa has been told that the two shoes which have been found, one on the bank and the other in the river, are not mates, and it has quite distracted her. She has gone to her room and will let no one else in. We can hear her moaning and crying, but we can do nothing. Perhaps she will see you. She called for you, I know, before she shut her door.' "'I will go.' Mrs. Carew had turned quite pale.' and from standing upright in the road had moved so as to gain support from one of the hedges. I expected to see her turn and go as soon as the trembling fit was over, but she did not, though she waved the girl away as if she intended to follow her. Had I not learned to distrust my own impressions of people's motives from their manners and conduct, I should have said that she was waiting for me to precede her. Two shoes and not mates?' she finally exclaimed. "'What does she mean?' "'Simply that another shoe had been drawn up from the river bottom, "'which does not mate the one picked up near the bungalow. "'Both are for the left foot.' "'Ah!' gasped this sympathetic woman. "'And what inference can we draw from that?' "'I should not have answered her, "'but the command in her eyes or the thrilling effect of her manner compelled me and I spoke the truth at once, just as I might have done to Mrs. Ocumpa, or better still, to Mr. Ocumpa, if either had insisted. But one, said I, there is a conspiracy on the part of one or more persons to delude Mrs. Ocumpa into believing the child is dead. They blundered over it, but they came very near succeeding. Who blundered? "'And what is the meaning of the conspiracy you hint at? "'Tell me, tell me what such men as you think.' "'Her plastic features had again shown a change. "'She was all anxiety now, cheeks burning, eyes blazing, "'a very beautiful woman. "'We think that the case looks serious. "'We think from the very mystery it displays "'that there is a keen intelligence back of this crime.' I cannot go any further than that. The affair is yet too obscure. You amaze me, she faltered, making an effort to collect her thoughts. I have always thought, just as Mrs. Ocampa has, that the child had somehow found her way to the water and was drowned. But if all this is true, we shall have to face a worse evil. A conspiracy against such a tender little being as that, a conspiracy, and for what? Not to extort money, or why these blundering efforts to make the child appear dead? She was the same sympathetic woman, agitated by real feelings as before. Yet at this moment, I do not understand now just why, I became aware of an inner movement of caution against too many a display of candor on my own part. Madam, it is all a mystery at present. I am sure that the police will tell you the same. 
but another day may bring developments. Let us hope so, was her ardent reply, accompanied by a gesture, the freedom of which suited her style and person, as it would not have done those of a less impressionable woman. And, seeing that I had no intention of leaving the spot where I stood, she moved at last from where she held herself upright against the hedge, and entered the Ocumpa grounds. "'Will you call in to see me tomorrow? she asked, pausing to look back at the turn in the path. "'I shall not sleep tonight for thinking of those possible developments. "'Since you permit me,' I returned, "'that is, if I am still here, "'affairs may call me away at any moment. "'Yes, and so with me, "'affairs may call me away also. "'I was to sail on Saturday for Liverpool. "'Only Mrs. Ocumpa's distress detains me. "'If the situation lightens, "'if we hear any good news tonight, "'or even early tomorrow,' I shall continue my preparations, which will take me again to New York. I will call if you are at home. She gave me a slight nod and vanished. Why did I stand there a good three minutes where she had left me, thinking, but not getting anything from my thoughts, save that I was glad that I had not been betrayed into speaking of the old man Miss Graham had met on the bridge? yet it might have been well, after all, if I had done so, if only to discover whether Mrs. Ocumpa had confided this occurrence to her most intimate friend. End of chapter 3THE MILLIONAIRE BABY by Anna K. Green, Chapter 4 CHALK MARKS My next move was toward the bungalow. Those chalk marks still struck me as being worthy of investigation, and not only they, but the bungalow itself. That certainly merited a much closer inspection than I had been able to give it under Miss Graham's eye. It was not quite a new place to me, nor was I so ignorant of its history, and it had a history as I had appeared to be in my conversation with Miss Graham. Originally it had been a stabling place for horses, and tradition said that it had once harbored for a week the horse of General Washington. This was when the house on the knoll above had been the seat and home of one of our most famous revolutionary generals. Later, as the trees grew up around this building, it attracted the attention of a new owner, William Ocumpa, the first of that name to inhabit Homewood, and he, being a man of reserved manners and very studious habits, turned it into what we would now call, as Miss Graham did, a den, but which he styled a pavilion, and used it as a sort of study or reading room. His son, who inherited it, Judge Philo Ocumpa, grandfather of the present Philo, was as studious as his father, but preferred to read and write in the quaint old library up at the house, famous for its wide glass doors opening onto the lawn, and its magnificent view of the Hudson. His desk, which many remember, it has a place in the present house, I believe, was so located that for forty years or more he had this prospect ever before him, a prospect which included the site of his own pavilion, around which, for no cause apparent to his contemporaries, he had caused a high wall to be built, effectually shutting in both trees and building. This wall has since been removed, but I have often heard it spoken of, and always with a certain air of mystery, possibly because, as I have said, there seems no good reason for its erection, the place holding no treasure, and the gate standing always open, possibly because of its having been painted, in defiance of all harmony with everything about the place, a dazzling white, and possibly because it had not been raised till after the death of the judge's first wife, who, some have said, breathed her last within the precincts it enclosed. However that may be, there seems to be no doubt that this place exerted, very likely against his will, for he never visited it, a singular fascination over the secretive mind of this same upright but strangely taciturn ancestor of the Ocumpas. For during the forty years in which he wrote and read at this desk, the shutters guarding the door overlooking those decaying walls were never drawn to, 
or so the tradition runs, and when he died it was found that by a clause in his will this pavilion, hut, or bungalow, all of which names it bore at different stages of its existence, was recommended to the notice of his heirs as an object which they were at liberty to leave in its present forsaken condition, though he did not exact this, but which was never under any circumstances, or to serve any purpose, to be removed from its present site, or even to suffer any demolition save such as came with time, and the natural round of the seasons, to whose tender mercies he advised it to be left. In other words, it was to stand, and to stand unmolested, till it fell of its own accord, or was struck to the earth by lightning, a tragic alternative in the judgment of those who knew it for a structure of comparative insignificance, and one which, in the minds of many, and perhaps I may say in my own, appeared to point to some serious and unrevealed cause not unlinked with the almost forgotten death of that young wife to which I have just alluded. This was years ago, far back in the fifties, and his son, who was a minor at his death, grew up and assumed the natural proprietorship. The hut, it was nothing but a hut now, had remained untouched, a ruin no longer habitable. The spirit, as well as the letter of that particular clause in his father's will, had so far been literally obeyed. The walls being of stone had withstood decay, and still rose straight and firm, but the roof had begun to sag, and whatever of woodwork yet remained about it had rotted and fallen away, till the building was little more than a skeleton, with holes for its windows and an open gap for its door. As for the surrounding wall, it no longer stood out an incongruous landmark from its background of trees and shrubbery. Young shoots had started up and old branches developed, till brick and paint alike were almost concealed from view by a fresh girdle of greenery. And now comes the second mystery. Sometime after this latter Ocampa had attained his majority, his name was Edwin, and he was, as you already imagine, the father of the present Philo. He made an attempt, a daring one it was afterward called, to brighten this neglected spot and restore it to some sort of use, by giving a supper to his friends within its broken-down walls. This supper was no orgy, nor were the proprieties in any way transgressed by so harmless a festivity. Yet from this night, a singular change was observed in this man. Pleasure no longer charmed him, and, instead of repeating the experiment I have just described, he speedily evinced such an antipathy to the scene of his late revel, that only from the greatest necessity would he ever again visit that part of the grounds. What did it mean? What had occurred on that night of innocent enjoyment to disturb or alarm him? Had some note in his own conscience been struck by an act which, in his cooler moments, he may have looked upon as a species of sacrilege? Or had some whisper from the past reached him amid the feasting, the laughter and the jesting, to render these old walls henceforth intolerable to him? He never said, but whatever the cause of this sudden aversion, the effect was deep and promised to be long-lasting. For, one morning, not long after this event, a party of workmen was seen leaving these grounds at daybreak, and soon it was noised about that the massive brick partition had been put across the interior of the same pavilion, completely shutting off, for no reason that anyone could see, some ten feet of what had been one long and undivided room. It was a strange enough act, but when a few days later, it was followed by one equally mysterious, and they saw the encircling wall which had been so carefully raised by Judge Ocumpa ruthlessly pulled down, and every sign of its former presence there destroyed. Wonder filled the highway, and the curiosity of neighbors and friends passed all bounds. But no explanation were volunteered then or ever. People might query and peer, but they learned nothing. What was left open to view told no tales beyond the old one, and as for the single window, which was the sole opening into the shut-off space, 
It was then, as now, so completely blocked off by a network of closely impacted vines, that it offered little more encouragement than the wall itself to the eyes of the curiosity-mongers, as crept in by way of the hedgerows to steal a look at the hut, and if possible gain a glimpse of an interior which had suddenly acquired, by the very means taken to shut it off from every human eye, a new importance pointing very decidedly toward the tragic. But soon even this semblance of interest died out, or was confined to the strange tales whispered under breath on weird nights at neighboring firesides, and the old neglect prevailed once more. The whole place, new brick, old stone, seemed doomed to a common fate under the hand of time, when the present Philo Ocampa, succeeding to the property, brought new wealth and business enterprise into the family, and the old house on the hill was replaced by the marble turrets of Homewood, and this hut, or rather the portion open to improvement, was restored to some sort of comfort and rechristened the bungalow. Was fate to be appeased by this effort at forgetfulness? No. In emulation of the long-abandoned portion so hopelessly cut off by that dividing wall, this brightly furnished adjunct to the great house had linked itself in the minds of men to a new mystery, the mystery which I had come there to solve, if wit and patience could do it, aided by my supposedly unshared knowledge of a fact connecting me with this family's history in a way it little dreamed of. Naturally my first look was at the building itself. I have described its location in the room from which the child was lost. What I wanted to see now, after studying those chalk marks, was whether that partition which had been put in was as impassable as was supposed. The policeman on guard having strolled a few feet away, I approached the open doorway without hindrance, and at once took that close look I had promised myself, of the marks which I had observed scrawled broadly across the floor just inside the threshold. They were as interesting and as fully important as I had anticipated. Though nearly obliterated by the passing of policemen's feet across them, I was still enabled to read one word which appeared to me significant. If you will glance at the following reproduction of a snapshot which I took of this scrawl, you will see what I mean. The significant character was the sixteen. Taken with the U.S.T., there could be no doubt that the whole writing had been a record of the date on which the child had disappeared, August 16. This in itself was of small consequence, if the handwriting had not possessed those marked peculiarities which I believed belonged to one man, a man I had once known, a man of revered aspect, upright carriage and a strong distinguished mark like an old-time scar, running straight down between his eyebrows. This had been my thought when I first saw it. It was doubly so on seeing it again after the doubts expressed by Miss Graham of a threatening old man who possessed similar characteristics. Satisfied on this point, I turned my attention to what still more seriously occupied it, the three or four long rugs which hung from the ceiling across the whole wall at my left, evidently concealed the mysterious partition put up in Mr. Ocumpa's father's time, directly across this portion of the room. Was it a totally unbroken partition? I had been told so, but I never accept such assertions without a personal investigation. Casting a glance through the doorway, and seeing that it would take my dreaming friend, the policeman, some two or three minutes yet to find his way back to his post, I hastily lifted these rugs aside, one after the other, and took a look behind them. A stretch of Georgia pine, laid, as I readily discovered, by more than one wrap of my knuckles, directly over the bricks it was intended to conceal, was visible under each, from end to end a plain partition with no indications of its having been tampered with since the alterations were first made. Dismissing from my mind one of those vague possibilities which add such interest to the calling of a detective, I left the place, with my full thought concentrated on the definite clue I had received from the chalk marks. 
but I had not walked far before I met with a surprise which possibly possessed a significance equal to any I had already observed, if only I could have fully understood it. On the path into which I now entered, I encountered again the figure of Mrs. Carew. Her face was turned full on mine, and she had evidently retraced her steps to have another instant's conversation with me. The next moment I was sure of this. Her eyes, always magnetic, shone with increased brightness as I advanced to meet her, and her manner, while grave, was that of a woman quite conscious of the effect she produced by her least word or action. "'I have returned to tell you,' she said, "'that I have more confidence in your efforts "'than in those of the police officers around here. "'If Gwendolen's fate is determined by anyone, "'it will be by you. "'So I want to be of aid to you if I can. "'Remember that. "'I may have said this to you before, "'but I wish to impress it upon you.' "'There was a flutter in her movements which astonished me. "'She was surveying me in a straightforward way, and I could not but feel the fire and force of her look. Happily she was no longer a young woman, or I might have misunderstood the disturbance which took place in my own breast, as I waited for the musical tones to cease. "'You are very good,' I rejoined. "'I need help, and I shall be only too glad to receive your assistance.' Yet I did question her, though I presently found myself walking toward the house at her side, she may not have expected me to presume so far. Certainly she showed no dissatisfaction when, at a parting in the path, I took my leave of her and turned my face in the direction of the gates. A strange, sweet woman, with a power quite apart from the physical charms, which usually affected men of my age, but one not easily read nor parted from, unless one had an imperative errand, as I had. This errand was to meet and forestall the messenger boy, whom I momentarily expected with the answer to my telegram. That an opportunity for gossip was likewise afforded by the motley group of men and boys drawn up near one of the gate-posts gave an added interest to the event, which I was quite ready to appreciate. Approaching this group, I assimilated myself with it as speedily as possible and, having some tact for this sort of thing, soon found myself the recipient of various gratuitous opinions as to the significance of the find which had offered such a problem both to the professional and the unprofessional detective. Two mismated shoes. Had Gwendolen Ocampa by any chance worn such? No, or the ones mating them would have been found in her closet, and this, someone shouted, had not been done. Only the one corresponding to the one fished up from the waters of the dock had come to light. The other, the one which the child must really have worn, was nowhere nearer being found than the child herself. What did it all mean? No one knew, but all attempted some sort of hazardous guess, which I was happy to see fell entirely short of the mark. There was not a word of the vindictive old man described by Miss Graham, till I myself introduced the topic. My reason, or rather my excuse, for introducing it was this. On the gatepost near me I had observed the remnants of a strip of paper, which had been pasted there, and afterward imperfectly torn off. It had an unsightly look, but I did not pay much attention to it, till some movement in the group forced me a little nearer to the post when I was surprised enough to see that this scrap of paper showed signs of words, and that these words gave evidence of being a date written in the very hand I now had no difficulty in recognizing as that of the old man uppermost in my mind, even if he were not the one whom Miss Graham had seen on the bridge. This date, strange to say, was the same significant one already noted on the floor of the bungalow, a fact which I felt merited an explanation if any one about me could give it. Waiting, therefore, for a lull in the remarks passing between the stable men and other employees about the place, I drew the attention of the first man who would listen to the half-torn-off strip of paper on the post, 
and asked if that was the way the Ocumpas gave the notice of their entertainments. He started, then turned his back on me. That wasn't put there for entertainment, he growled. That was posted up there by someone who wanted to show off his writing. There don't seem to be no other reason. As the man who spoke these words had thereby proved himself a blockhead, I edged away from him as soon as possible, toward a very decent-looking fellow who appeared to have more brains than speech. "'Do you know who pasted that date upon the post?' I inquired. He answered very directly. "'No, or I should have been laying for him long before this. "'Why, it is not only there you can see it. "'I found it pinned to the carriage cushions one day "'just as I was going to drive Mrs. Ocumpa out. "'Evidently I had struck upon the coachman. "'And not only that, one of the girls up at the house, "'one as I knows pretty well, tells me, "'I don't care who hears it now, that it was written across a card which was left at the door for Mrs. Ocumpa, and all in the same handwriting, which is not a common one, as you can see. This means something, seeing it was the date when our bad luck fell on us. He had noted that. You don't mean to say that these things were written and put about before the date you see on them. But I do. Would we have noticed since? "'But who are you, sir, if I may ask? "'One of them detective fellows? "'If so, I have a word to say. "'Find that child, or Mrs. Ocumpa's blood will be on your head. "'She'll not live till Mr. Ocumpa comes home "'unless she can show him his child. "'Wait,' I called out, for he was turning away toward the stable. "'You know who wrote those slips?' "'Not a bit of it. No one does. "'Not that anybody thinks much of them but me.' "'The police must,' I ventured. "'Maybe, but they don't say anything about it. "'Somehow it looks to me as if they were all at sea.' "'Possibly they are,' I remarked, letting him go "'as I caught sight of a small boy "'coming up the road with several telegrams in his hand. "'Is one of those directed to Robert Trevitt?' I asked, "'crowding up with the rest as his small form was allowed to slip through the gate.' "'Specs there is,' he replied, looking them over and handing me one. I carried it to one side and hastily tore it open. It was, as I expected, from my partner, and read as follows. "'Man you want has just returned after two days' absence. Am on watch. Saw him just alight from buggy with what looked like a sleeping child in his arms. Closed and fastened front door after him. Safe for to-night.' Did I allow my triumph to betray itself? I do not think so. The question which kept down my elation was this. Would I be the first man to get there? End of chapter 4「The Millionaire Baby」by Anna K. Green, Chapter 5 The Old House in Yonkers The old man, whose handwriting I had now positively identified, was a former employer of mine. I had worked in his office when a lad. He was a doctor of very fair reputation in Westchester County, and I recognized every characteristic of his, as mentioned by Miss Graham, save the frenzy which she described as accompanying his address. In those days he was calm and cold, and, while outwardly scrupulous, capable of forgetting his honor as a physician under sufficiently strong temptation. I had left him when new prospects opened, and in the years which had elapsed had contented myself with the knowledge that his shingle still hung out in Yonkers, though his practice was nothing what it used to be when I was in his employ. Now I was going to see him again." That his was the hand which had stolen Gwendolen seemed no longer open to doubt. That she was under his care in the curious old house I remembered in the heart of Yonkers seemed equally probable. But why so sordid a man, one who loved money above everything else in the world, should retain the child one minute after the publication of the bountiful reward offered by Mr. Ocumpa 
was what I could not at first understand. Miss Graham's theory of hate had made no impression on me. He was heartless, and not likely to be turned aside from any project he had formed, but he was not what I considered vindictive where nothing was to be gained. Yet my comprehension of him had been but a boy's comprehension, and I was now prepared to put a very different estimate on one whose character had never struck me as being an open one, even when my own had been most credulous. That my enterprise, even with the knowledge I possessed of this man, promised well or held out any prospects of easy fulfillment, I no longer allowed myself to think. If money was his object, and what other could influence a man of his temperament, the sum offered by Mr. Ocumpa, large though it was, had apparently not sufficed to satisfy his greed. He was holding back the child, or so I now believed, in order to wring a larger, possibly double, amount from the wretched mother. Fifty thousand was a goodly sum, but one hundred thousand was better, and this man had gigantic ideas where his cupidity was concerned. I remember how firmly he had once stood out for ten thousand dollars when he had been offered five, and I began to see, though in an obscure way as yet, how it might very easily be part of his plan to work Mrs. Ocumpa up to a positive belief in the child's death, before he came down upon her for the immense reward he had fixed his heart upon. The date he had written all over the place might thus find some explanation in a plan to weaken her nerve before pressing his exorbitant claims upon her. Nothing was clear, yet everything was possible in such a nature, and anxious to enter upon the struggle both for my own sake and that of the child of whose condition under that terrible eye I scarcely dared to think, I left Homewood in haste and took the first train for Yonkers. Though the distance was not great, I had fully arranged my plans before entering the town where so many of my boyish years had been spent. I knew the old fox well enough, or I thought I did, to be certain that I should have anything but an easy entrance into his house, in case it still harboured the child whom my partner had seen carried in there. I anticipated difficulties, but was concerned about none but the possibility of not being able to bring myself face to face with him. Once in his presence, the knowledge which I secretly possessed of an old but doubtful transaction of his would serve to make him mine even to the point of yielding up the child he had forcibly abducted. But would he accord me an interview? Could I, without appeal to the police, and you can readily believe I was not anxious to allow them to put their fingers in my pie, force him to open his door and let me into the house, which, as I well recalled, he locked up at nine, after which he would receive no one, not even a patient. It was not nine yet, but it was very near that hour. I had but twenty minutes in which to mount the hill to the old house, marked by the doctor's sign and by another peculiarity of so distinct a nature that it would serve to characterize a dwelling in a city as large as New York, though I doubt if New York can show its like from the Battery to the Bronx. The particulars of this I will mention later. I have first to relate the relief I felt when, on entering the old neighborhood, I heard a response to a few notes of a certain popular melody which I had allowed to leave my lips, an added note or two which warned me that my partner was somewhere hidden among the alleys of this unaristocratic quarter. Indeed, from the sound, I judged him to be in the rear of the doctor's house, and, being anxious to hear what he had to say before advancing upon the door, which might open my way to easy fortune or complete defeat, I paused a few steps off and waited for his appearance. He was at my elbow before I had either seen or heard him. He was always light of foot, but this time he seemed to have no tread at all. Still here, was his comforting assurance. Both, I whispered back. Both. Anyone else? No, a boy drove away the buggy and has not come back. Sawbones keeps no girl. Is the child quiet? 
Has there been no alarm? Not a breath. No cops in the neighborhood? No spies around? Not one. We've got it all this time, but... Hush! There's nobody. Yes, the doctor. He's fastening up the house. I must hasten. Nothing would induce me to let that innocent remain under his roof all night. It's not the window he is at. What then? The door, the big front door. The... Yes. I gave my partner a surprised look, undoubtedly lost in the darkness, and drew a step nearer the house. It's just the same old gloom box, I exclaimed, and paused for an instant to mark the changes which had taken place in the surroundings. They were very few, and I turned my eye back to fix on the front door, where a rattling sound could be heard, as of someone fingering the latch. It was this door which formed the peculiarity of the house. In itself it was like any other that was well-fashioned and solid, but it opened upon space, that is, if it ever opened, which I doubted. The stoop and even the railing which had once guarded it had all been removed, leaving a bare front, with this inhospitable entrance shut against every one who had not the convenience for mounting to it by a ladder. There was another way in, but this was round on one side, and did not present itself to the eye unless one approached from the west end of the street, so that to half the passers-by the house looked like a deserted one till they came abreast of the flagged path which led to the office door. As the windows had never been unclosed in my day and were not now, I took it for granted that they had remained thus inhospitably shut during all the years of my absence, which certainly offered but little encouragement to a man bent on an errand which should soon take him into those dismal precincts. What goes on behind those shuttered windows, thought I? I know of one thing, but what else? The one thing was the counting of money and the arranging of innumerable gold pieces on the great top of a baize-covered table in what I should now describe as the back parlor. I remembered how he used to do it. I caught him at it once, having crept up one windy night from my little room off the office to see what kept the doctor up so late. As I now stood listening in the dark street to those strange touches on a door disused for years, I recalled the tremor with which I rounded the top of the stair that night of long ago, and the mingled fear and awe with which I recognized not only such a mint of money as I had never seen out of the bank before, but the greedy and devouring passion with which he pushed the glittering coins about and handled the banknotes and gloated over the pile it all made when drawn together by his hooked fingers, till the sound, perhaps of my breathing in the dark hall, startled him with a thought of discovery, and his two hands came together over that pile, with a gesture even more eloquent than the look with which he seemed to penetrate the very shadows in the silent space wherein I stood. It was a vision short, but inexpressibly vivid, of the miser incarnate, and having seen it and escaped detection, as was my undeserved luck that night, I needed never to ask again why he had been willing to accept risks, from which most men shrink from fear, if not from conscience. He loved money, not as the spender loves it, openly and with luxurious instincts, but secretly and with a knavish dread of discovery which spoke of treasure ill-acquired. And now he was seeking to add to his gains, and I stood on the outside of his house listening to sounds I did not understand, instead of attempting to draw him to the office door by ringing the bell he never used to disconnect until nine. "'Do you know that I don't quite like the noises which are being made up there?' came a sudden whisper to my ear. "'Suppose it was the child trying to get out. "'She does not know there is no stoop. "'She seemed sleeping or half dead when he carried her in, "'and if by any chance she had got a hold of the key, "'and the door should open? "'Hush!' I cried, starting forward in horror of the thought he had suggested. "'It is opening. I see a thread of light. 
"'What does it mean, Jupp? The child?' "'No, there is more than a child's strength in that push. Hist! Here I drew him flat against the wall. The door above had swung back, and someone was stamping on the threshold over our heads, in what appeared to be an outburst of ungovernable fury. That it was the doctor I could not doubt. But why this anger? Why this mad gasping after breath and the half-growl, half-cry, with which he faced the night and the quiet of the street, which to his glance, passing as it did over our heads, must have appeared altogether deserted. We were consulting each other's faces for some explanation of this unlooked-for outbreak, when the door above us suddenly slammed to, and we heard a renewal of that fumbling with lock and key which had first drawn our attention. But the hand was not sure, or the hall was dark, for the key did not turn in the lock. Suddenly awake to my opportunity, I wheeled Jupp about, and making use of his knee and back, climbed up till I was enabled to reach the knob, and turned it just as the man within had stepped back, probably to procure more light. The result was that the door swung open, and I stumbled in, falling almost face downward on the marble floor, faintly checkered off to my sight in the dim light of a lamp, set far back in a bare and dismal hall. I was on my feet again in an instant, and it was in this manner, and with all the disadvantages of a hatless head and a disordered countenance, that I encountered again my old employer after five years of absence. He did not recognize me. I saw it by the look of alarm which crossed his features, and the involuntary opening of his lips, in what would certainly have been a loud cry, if I had not smiled and cried out with false gaiety. "'Excuse me, doctor. I never came in by that door before. Pardon my awkwardness. The step is somewhat high from the street.' My smile is my own, they say. At all events it served to enlighten him. "'Bob Trevitt!' he exclaimed, but with a growl of displeasure I could hardly condemn under the circumstances. I hastened to push my advantage, for he was looking very threateningly toward the door, which was swaying gently and in an inviting way to a man who, if old, had more power in his arms than I had in my whole body." "'Mr. Trevitt,' I corrected, and on a very important errand. "'I am here on behalf of Mrs. Ocumpaugh, whose child you have at this moment under your roof.'" End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Millionaire Baby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green, Chapter 6 Dr. Poole It was a direct attack, and for a minute I doubted if I had not made a mistake in making it so suddenly, and without gloves. His face purpled, the veins on his forehead started out, his great form shook with an ire that in such domineering natures as his can only find relief in a blow but the right hand did not rise, nor did the heavy fist fall. With admirable self-restraint, he faced me for a moment, without attempting either protest or denial. Then his blazing eyes cooled down, and with a sudden gesture, which at once relaxed his extreme tension of nerve and muscle, he pointed toward the end of the hall, and remarked with studied politeness, "'My office is below, as you know.' "'Will you oblige me by following me there?' "'I feared him, for I saw that studiously as he sought to hide his impressions, "'he too regarded the moment as one of critical significance. "'But I assumed an air of perfect confidence, "'merely observing as I left the neighborhood of the front door "'and the proximity of Jupp. "'I have friends waiting outside for me, "'so you must not keep me too long.' He was bending to take up the lamp from a small table near the basement stairs, as I threw out these words in apparent carelessness, and the flash which shot from under his shaggy brows was thus necessarily heightened by the glare in which he stood. Yet with all allowances made, 
I marked him down in my own mind as dangerous, and was correspondingly surprised when he turned on the top step of the narrow staircase I remembered so vividly from my experience I have before named, and in the mildest of accents remarked, "'These stairs are a trifle treacherous. Be careful to grasp the handrail as you come down.' Was the game deeper than I thought? In all my remembrance of him, I had never before seen him look benevolent, and it alarmed me, coming as it did after the accusation I had made. I felt tempted to make a stand and demand that the interview be held then and there. For I knew his subterranean office very well, and how difficult it would be to raise a cry there which could be heard by anyone outside." Still, with a muttered, Thank you, I proceeded to follow him down, only stopping once in the descent, to listen for some sound by which I might determine in which room of the many I knew to be on this floor the little one lay, on whose behalf I was incurring a possible bullet from the pistol I once saw lurking amongst bottles and corks in one of the innumerable drawers of the doctor's table but all was still around and overhead, too still for my peace of mind, in which dreadful visions began to rise of a drugged or dying child, panting out its innocent breath in darkness and solitude. Yet, no. With those thousands to be had for the asking, any man would be a fool to injure or even seriously to frighten a child upon whose good condition they depended, much less a miser whose whole heart was fixed on money. The clock struck as I put my foot on the landing. So much can happen in twenty minutes, when events crowd and the passions of men reach their boiling point. I expected to see the old man try that door, even to double-bolt it as in the years gone by. But he merely threw a look that way and proceeded on down the three or four steps, which led into the species of basement, where he had chosen to fix his office. In another moment that dim and dismal room broke upon my view, under the vague light of the small and poorly trimmed lamp he carried. I saw again its musty walls, covered with books, where there were shelves laden with bottles and a loose array of miscellaneous objects I had often handled, but out of which I could never make any meaning. I recognized it all, and detected but few changes. But these were startling ones. The old lounge standing under the two barred windows, which I had often likened in my own mind to those of a jail, had been recovered, and lying on the table, which I had always regarded with a mixture of awe and apprehension, I perceived something which I had never seen there before. A Bible, with its edges torn and its leaves rumpled, as if often and eagerly handled. I was so struck by this last discovery that I stopped, staring in the doorway, looking from the scarred volume to the worn but vigorous figure, drawn up in the middle of the room, with the lamp still in his hand, and his small but brilliant eyes fixed upon mine, with a certain ironical glitter in them, which gave me my first distrust of the part I had come there to play. "'We will waste no words.' said he, setting down the lamp, and seizing with his disengaged hand the long locks of his flowing beard. In what respect are you a messenger from Mrs. Ocumpa, and what makes you think I have her child in this house? I found it easier to answer the last question first. I know the child is here, I replied, because my partner saw you bring her in. I have gone into the detective business since leaving you. Ah, there was an astonished edge to his smile, and I felt that I should have to make the most of that old discovery of mine if I were to hold my own with this man. And may I ask, he coldly continued, how you have succeeded in connecting me with this young child's disappearance. It's straight as a string, I retorted. You threatened the child to its face in the hearing of its nurse some weeks ago, on a certain bridge, where you stopped them, even set the day when the little Gwendolen should pass from luxury to poverty. Here I cast an involuntary glance about the room, where the only sign of comfort was the newly upholstered lounge. 
The day was the 16th, and we all know what happened on that date. If this is not plain enough, I had seen his lip curl. Allow me to add, by way of explanation, that you have seen fit to threaten Mrs. Ocumpaugh herself with this date, for I know well the hand which wrote August 16th on the bungalow floor, and in various other places about Homewood, where her eye was likely to fall. And I let my own fall on a sort of manuscript lying open not far from the Bible, which still looked so out of place to me on this pagan-hearted old miser's table. Such chirography as yours is not to be mistaken, I completed, with a short gesture toward the disordered sheets he had left spread out to every eye. I see, a detective without doubt. Did you play the detective here? The last question leaped like a shot from his lips. You have not denied the threats to which I have just called your attention, was my cautious reply. What need of that, he retorted. Are you not a detective? There was sarcasm as well as taunt in the way he uttered the last word. I was conscious of being at a loss, but put a bold front on the matter and proceeded as if conscious of no secret misgiving. Can you deny as well that you have been gone two days from this place? That during this time a doctor's buggy, drawn by a horse I should know by description, having harnessed him three times a day for two years, was seen by more than one observer in the wake of a mysterious wagon, from the interior of which a child's cry could be heard? The wagon did not drive up to this house to-night, but the buggy did, and from it you carried a child which you brought with you into this house. With a sudden downbringing of his old but powerful hand on top of the table before him, he seemed about to utter an oath or some angry invective. But again he controlled himself, and eyeing me without any show of shame or even of desire to contradict any of my assertions, he quietly declared, "'You are after that reward, I observe. Well, you won't get it. Like many others of your class, you can follow a trail, but the insight to start right and to end in triumphant success is given only to genius. And you are not a genius.' With a blush I could not control, I advanced upon him, crying, "'You have forestalled me. You have telegraphed or telephoned to Mr. Atwater. I have not left my house since I came in here three hours ago.' Then I began, but he hushed me with a look. "'It is not a matter of money,' he declared almost with dignity. Those who think to reap dollars from the distress which has come upon the Ocumpa family will eat ashes for their pains. Money will be spent, but none of it earned, unless you, or such as you, are hired at so much an hour to follow trails. Greatly astounded not only by the attitude he took, but by the calm and almost indifferent way in which he mentioned what I had every reason to believe to be the one burning object of his existence, I surveyed him with undisguised astonishment till another thought, growing out of the silence of the many-roomed house above us, gripped me with secret dread. And I exclaimed aloud and without any attempt at subterfuge, "'She is dead, then. The child is dead?' "'I do not know.' was his reply. The four words were uttered with undeniable gloom. "'You do not know?' I echoed, conscious that my jaw had fallen, and that I was staring at him with fright in my eyes. "'No, I wish I did. I would have given half of my small savings to know where that innocent baby is tonight. "'Sit down,' he vehemently commanded. "'You do not understand me, I see.' You confound the old Dr. Poole with the new one. I confound nothing, I violently retorted in a strong revulsion against what I now come to look upon as the attempt of a subtle actor to turn aside my suspicions and brave out a dangerous situation by ridiculous subterfuge. I understand the miser whom I have beheld gloating over his hoard in the room above, and I understand the doctor who for money could lend himself to a fraud, the secret results of which are agitating the whole country at this moment. 
So, the word came with difficulty. So you did play the detective, even as a boy. Pity I had not recognized your talents at the time. But, no, he contradicted himself with great rapidity. I was not a redeemed soul then. I might have done you harm. I might have had more, if not worse, sins to atone for than what I have now. And with scant appearance of having noted the doubtful manner in which I received this astonishing outburst, he proceeded to cry aloud and with commanding gesture, Quit this! You have undertaken more than you can handle. You, a messenger from Mrs. Ocumpa? Never! You are but the messenger of your own cupidity, and cupidity leads to the straightest of roads directly down to hell. This you proved six long years ago. Lead me to the child I believe to be in this house, or I will proclaim aloud the pact you entered into then, a pact to which I was an involuntary witness, whose word, however, will not go for less on that account. Behind the curtain, still hanging over that old closet, I stood while... His hand had seized my arm with a grip few could have proceeded under. Do you mean... The rest was a whisper in my ear. I nodded and felt that he was mine now. But the laugh which the next minute broke from his lips dashed my assurance. Oh, the ways of the world, he cried. Then in a different tone and not without reverence, Oh, the ways of God. I made no reply. For every reason I felt that the next words must come from him. It was an unexpected one. That was Dr. Poole unregenerate and more heedful of the things of this world than of those of the world to come. You have to deal with quite a different man now. It is of that very sin I am now repenting in sackcloth and ashes. I live but to expiate it. Some things have been done toward accomplishing this, but not enough. I have been played upon, used. This I will avenge. New sin is a poor apology for an old one. I scarcely heeded him. I was again straining my ears to catch a smothered sob or a frightened moan. What are you listening for? he asked. For the sound of little Gwendolen's voice. It is worth fifty thousand dollars, you remember. Why shouldn't I listen for it? Besides, I have a real and uncontrollable sympathy for the child. I am determined to restore her to her home. Your blasphemous babble of a changed heart does not affect me. You are after the larger hall than the sum offered by Mr. Ocumpa. You want some of Mrs. Ocumpa's fortune. I have suspected it from the first. I want? Little you know what I want. Then quickly, convincingly, you are strangely deceived. Little Miss Ocumpa is not here. What is that I hear, then? was the quick retort with which I hailed the sigh, unmistakably from infantile lips, which now rose from some place very much nearer us, than the hollow regions overhead toward which my ears had been so long turned. That, he flashed with uncontrollable passion, and if I am not mistaken, clenched his hands so violently as to bury his nails in his flesh. Would you like to see what this is? Come. And taking the lamp, he moved, much to my surprise, as well as to my intense interest, toward the door of the small cupboard where I myself had slept when in his service that he still meditated some deviltry which would call for my full presence of mind to combat successfully, I did not in the least doubt. Yet the agitation under which I crossed the floor was more the result of an immediate anticipation of seeing, and in this place of all others in the world, the child about whom my thoughts had clung so persistently for forty-two hours, than of any result to myself in the way of injury or misfortune. Though the room was small, and my passage across it necessarily short, I had time to remember Mrs. Ocumpa's pitiful countenance, as I saw it gazing in agony of expectation from her window overlooking the river, and to catch again the sounds, less true and yet strangely thrilling, of Mrs. Carew's voice as she said, 
a tragedy at my doors, and I occupied with my own affairs. Nor was this all. A recollection of Miss Graham's sorrow came up before my eyes also, and truest of all, most penetrating to me of all the loves which seemed to encompass this rare and winsome infant, the infinite tenderness with which I once saw Mr. Ocumpaugh lift her to his breast during one of my interviews with him at Homewood. All this before the door had swung open. Afterward I saw nothing and thought of nothing but the small figure lying in the spot where I had once pillowed my own head, and with no more luxuries or even comforts about her than had been my lot under this broad but by no means hospitable roof. A bare wall, a narrow cot, a table with a bottle and glass on it, and the child in the bed, that was all. But God knows it was enough for me at that breathless moment, and advancing eagerly, I was about to stoop over the little head sunk deep in its pillow, when the old man stepped between, and with a short laugh remarked, "'There's no hurry. I have something to say first, in explanation of the anger you have seen me display, an anger which is unseemly in a man professing to have conquered the sins and passions of lost humanity. I did follow this child.' You were right in saying that it was my horse and buggy which were seen in the wake of the wagon which came from the region of Homewood and lost itself in the crossroads running between the North River and the Sound. For two days and a night I followed it, through more difficulties than I could relate in an hour, stopping in lonely woods or at wretched taverns, watching, waiting for the transfer of the child, whose destination I was bound to know, even if it cost me a week of miserable travel without comfortable food or decent lodging. I could hear the child cry out from time to time, an assurance that I was not following a will-o'-the-wisp, but not till today, not till very late today, did any words pass between me and the man and woman who drove that wagon. At Fordham, just as I suspected them of making final efforts to escape me, they came to a halt, and I saw the man get out. I immediately got out, too. As we faced each other, I demanded what the matter was. He appeared reckless. "'Are you a doctor?' he asked. I assured him that I was, at which he blurted out, "'I don't know why you've been following us so long, and I don't care. I've got a job for you.' A child in our wagon is ill. With a start, I attempted to look over the old man's shoulder toward the bed, but the deep, if irregular, breathing of the child reassured me, and I turned to hear the doctor out. This gave me my chance. Let me see her, I cried. The man's eye lowered. I did not like his face at all. If it's anything serious, he growled, I shall cut. It isn't my flesh and blood, nor yet my old woman's here. You'll have to find some place for the brat beside my wagon if it's anything that won't get cured without nussin'. So come along and have a look. I followed him, perfectly determined to take the child under my own care, sick or well. Where were you going to take her? I asked. I didn't ask who she was. Why should I? I don't know as I'm obliged to tell, was the surly reply. "'Where we are going ourselves,' he reluctantly added. "'But not to Nuss. "'I got no time for Nuss and Brats, nor my wife neither. "'We have a journey to make. "'Sarah,' this to his wife, for by this time we were beside the wagon, "'lift up the flap and hold the youngster's hand out. "'Here's a doctor who'll tell us if it's fever or not.' "'A puny hand and wrist were thus thrust out. "'I felt the pulse.' and held out my arms. Give me the child, I commanded. She's sick enough for a hospital. A grunt from the woman within, an oath from the man, and a bundle was presently put in my arms, from which a little moan escaped as I strode with it toward my buggy. I do not ask your name, I called back to the man, who reluctantly followed me. Mine is Dr. Poole, and I live in Yonkers. 
He muttered something about not peaching on a poor man who was really doing an unfortunate a kindness, and then slunk hurriedly back and was gone, wagon, wife, and all, by the time I had whipped up my tired old nag and turned about toward Yonkers. But I had the child safe and sound in my arms, and my fears of its fate were relieved. It was not well, but I anticipated nothing serious. When it moaned, I pressed it a little closer to my breast, and that was all. In three-quarters of an hour we were in Yonkers. In fifteen minutes I had it on this bed, and had begun to unroll the shawl in which it was closely wrapped. Did you ever see the child about whom there has been all this coil? Yes, about three years ago. Three years? I have seen her within a fortnight, yet I could carry that young one in my arms for a whole hour without the least suspicion that I was making a fool of myself. Quickly slipping aside, he allowed me to approach the bed and to take my first look at the sleeping child's face. It was a sweet one, but I did not need the hint he had given me to find the features strange, and lacking every characteristic of those of Gwendolyn Ocumpaugh. Yet, as the cutting off of the hair will often change the whole aspect of the face, and this child's hair was short, I was stooping in great excitement to notice more particularly the contour of cheek and chin, which had given individuality to the little heiress, when the doctor touched me on the arm and drew my attention to a pair of little trousers and a shirt which were hanging on the door behind me. Those are the clothes I came upon under the great shawl. The child I have been following, and whom I have brought into my house, under the impression it was Gwendolyn Ocumpa, is not even a girl. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of the Millionaire Baby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green, Chapter Seven. Find the Child. I could well understand the wrath to which this man had given way by the feeling which now took hold of my own breast. A boy! I exclaimed. A boy. Still incredulous, I leaned over the child and lifted into the full light of the lamp one of the little hands I saw lying outside of the coverlet. There was no mistaking it for a girl's hand, let alone a little lady's. "'So we are both fools,' I vociferated in my unbounded indignation, careful, however, to lay the small hand gently back on the panting breast. And turning away both from the doctor and his patient, I strolled back into the office." The bubble, whose gray colors I had followed with such avidity, had burst in my face with a vengeance. But once from under the influence of the doctor's sarcastic eye, my better nature reasserted itself. Wheeling about, I threw this question back. If this is a boy and a stranger, where is Gwendolyn Ocumpa? A moan from the bed and a hurried movement on the part of the doctor, who took this opportunity to give the child another dose of medicine, were my sole response. Waiting till the doctor had finished his task and drawn back from the bedside, I repeated the question, and with increased emphasis, Where, then, is Gwendolyn Ocumpa? Still the doctor did not answer, though he turned my way and even stepped forward. His long visage, cadaverous from fatigue and the shock of his disappointment, growing more and more somber as he advanced. When he came to a stand by the table, I asked again, Where is the child idolized by Mr. Ocumpa, and mourned to such a degree by his almost maddened wife, that they say she will die if the girl is not found? The threat in my tones brought a response at last, a response which astonished me. Have I not said that I do not know? Do you not believe me? Do you think me as blind today to truth and honor as I was six years ago? Have you no idea of repentance and regeneration from sin? You are a detective. Find me that child. You shall have the money. Hundreds, thousands, if you can bring me proofs of her being yet alive. If the Hudson has swallowed her, here his figure rose. 
dilated and took on a majesty which impressed itself upon me through all my doubts. I will have vengeance on whoever has thus dared the laws of God and man, as I would on the foulest murderer in the foulest slums of that city which breeds wickedness in high places as in low. I lock hands no longer with Belial. Find me the child, or make me at least to know the truth. There was no doubting the passion which drove these words hot from his lips. I recognized at last the fanatic whom Miss Graham had graphically described in relating her extraordinary adventure on the bridge, and met him with this one question, which was certainly a vital one. Who dropped a shoe from the little one's closet into the water under the dock? Did you? No, his sharp reply came. But, I insisted, you have had something to do with this child's disappearance. He did not answer. A sullen look was displacing the fire of resolve in the eyes I saw sinking slowly before mine. I will not acknowledge it, he muttered, adding, however, in what was little short of a growl, not yet, not till it becomes my duty to avenge innocent blood. You foretold the date. Drop it. You were in league with the abductor, I persisted. I declare to your face, in spite of all the vaunted scruples with which you seek to blind me to your guilt, that you were in league with the abductor, knowing what money Mrs. Ocumpaugh would pay. Only he was too smart for you, and perhaps too unscrupulous. You would stop short of murder, now that you have got religion. But his conscience is not so nice, and so you fear... You do not know what I fear, and I am not going to tell you. It is enough that I am conscious of my own uprightness, and that I say, find the child. You have incentive enough. It was true, and it was growing stronger every minute. Confine yourself to such clues as are apparent to every eye, he now admonished me with an eagerness that seemed real. If they are pointed by some special knowledge you believe yourself to have gained, that is all the better, perhaps. I do not propose to say. I saw that he had uttered his ultimatum. Very good, I said. I have, nevertheless, one more question to ask, which relates to those very clues. You cannot refuse to answer it if you are really desirous of aiding me in my efforts. Where did you first come upon the wagon which you followed so many hours, in the belief that it held Gwendolyn Ocumpa? He mused a moment with downcast head, his nervous frame trembling with the force with which he threw his whole weight on the hand he held outspread on the table before him. Then he calmly replied, I will tell you that, at the gate of Mrs. Carew's grounds, you know them, they adjoin the Ocumpas on the left. My surprise made me lower my head, but not so quickly that I did not catch the oblique glint of his eye as he mentioned the name which I was so little prepared to hear in this connection. I was in my buggy on the high road, he continued. There was a constant passing by of all kinds of vehicles on their way to and from the Ocampa entertainment, but none of that attracted my attention till I caught sight of the covered wagon I have endeavored to describe being driven out of the adjoining grounds. Then I pricked up my ears, for a child was crying inside, in the smothered way that tells of a hand laid heavily over a mouth. I thought I knew what child this was, but you have been witness to my disappointment after forty-eight hours of travel behind that wretched wagon. It came out of Mrs. Carew's grounds, I repeated, ignoring everything but the one important fact. And during the time, you say, when Mrs. Ocumpa's guests were assembling, did you see any other vehicle leave by the same gate at or about that time? Yes, a carriage. It appeared to have no one in it. Indeed, I know that it was empty, for I peered into it as it rolled by me down the street. Of course, I do not know what might have been under the seats. Nothing, was my sharp retort. That was the carriage in which Mrs. Carew had come up from the train. Did it pass out before the wagon? Yes, by some minutes. There is nothing, then, to be gained by that. 
There does not seem to be. Was his accent in uttering this simple phrase peculiar? I looked up to make sure. But his face, which had been eloquent with one feeling or another during every minute of this long interview till the present instant, looked strangely impassive, and I did not know how to press the question hovering on my lips. "'You have given me a heavy task,' I finally remarked, "'and you offer very little assistance in the way of conjecture. "'Yet you must have formed some.' "'He toyed with his beard, combing it with his nervous muscular fingers, "'and as I watched how he lingered over the tips, "'caressing them before he dropped them, "'I felt that he was toying with my perplexities in much the same fashion, "'and with equal satisfaction.' Angry and all out of patience with him, I blurted out, I will do without your aid. I will solve this mystery and earn your money, if not that of Mr. Ocumpaugh, with no assistance save afforded by my own wits. I expect you will, he retorted, and for the first time since I burst in upon him, like one dropping from the clouds, through an unapproachable doorway on the upper floor, he lost that look of extreme tension which had nerved his aged figure into something of the aspect of youth. With it vanished his impressiveness. It was simply a tired old man I now followed upstairs to the side door. As I paused to give him a final nod and an assurance of intended good faith toward him, he made a kindly enough gesture in the direction of my old room below and said, Don't worry about the little fellow down there. He'll come out all right. I shan't visit on him the extravagance of my own folly. I am a Christian now. And with this encouraging remark he closed the door, and I found myself alone in the dark alley. My first sense of relief came from the coolness of the night air on my flushed forehead and cheeks. After the stifling atmosphere of the underground room, reeking with the fumes of the lamp and the heat of the struggle which his dogged confidence in himself had made so unequal it was pleasurable just to sense the quiet and the cool of the night and feel myself released from the bondage of a presence from which i frequently recoiled but had never thoroughly felt the force of till to-night my next from the touch and voice of my partner who at that moment rose from before the basement windows where he had evidently been lying out for a long time outstretched. "'What have you been doing down there?' was his very natural complaint. I tried to listen, I tried to see, but beyond a few scattered words when your voices rose to an excited pitch, I have learned nothing but that you were in no danger save from the overthrow of your scheme. That has failed, has it not?' Would you have interrupted me long ago if you had found the child? Yes, I acknowledged, drawing him down the alley. I have failed for tonight, but I start afresh tomorrow. Though how I can rest idle for nine hours, not knowing under what roof, if under any, that doomed innocent may be lying, I do not know. You must rest. You are staggered with fatigue now. Not a bit of it, only with uncertainty. I don't see my way. Let us go down street and see if any news has come over the wires since I left Homewood. But first, what a spooky old house that is! And what did the old gentleman have to say of your tumbling in on him from space, without a by your leave or even an excuse me? Tell me about it. I told him enough to allay his curiosity. That was all I thought necessary, and he seemed satisfied. Jupp is a good fellow, quite willing to confine himself to his particular end of the business, which does not include the thinking end. Why should it? There was no news, this we soon learned, only some hints of a contemplated move on the part of the police in a district where some low characters had been seen dragging along a resisting child of an unexpectedly refined appearance. As no one could describe the child, and I had refused from the first to look upon the case as one of ordinary abduction, I laid little stress on the report, destined though it was to appear under startling headlines on the morrow, and startled my more credulous partner quite out of his usual equanimity by ordering him on our arrival at the station to buy me a ticket for Homewood, as I was going to go back. 
to Homewood so late? Exactly. It will not be late there, or if it is, anxious hearts make light sleepers. His shoulders rose a trifle, but he bought a ticket. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Millionaire Baby This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna Kate Green Chapter Eight Philo 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 Never have I felt a weirder sensation than when I stepped from the cars onto the solitary platform from which a few hours before I had seen the little nursery governess depart for New York. The train soon disappeared in the darkness of the long perspective was all that gave life and light to the scene, and when it was gone, nothing remained to relieve the gloom or to break the universal stillness, save the quiet lap of the water and the moaning of the wind through the trees which climbed the heights to Homewood. I had determined to enter, if possible, by way of the private path, though I expected to find it guarded against such intrusion. In approaching it I was given a full view of the river, and thus was in a position to note that the dock and the adjoining banks were no longer bright with lanterns in the hands of eager men bending with fixed eyes over the flowing waters. The search which had kept so many busy at this spot for well on to two days had been abandoned, and the darkness seemed doubly dark and the silence doubly oppressive in contrast. Yet hope spoke in the abandonment, and with renewed spirit and a more than lively courage I turned toward the little gate through which I had passed twice before that day. As I expected, a silent figure rose up from the shadows to prevent me, but it fell back at the mention of my name and business, thus proving the man to be in the confidence of Mrs. Ocumpa, or at least in that of Miss Porter. I am come for a social chat with the coachman, I explained. Lights burn late in such extensive stables. Don't worry about me. The people at the house are in sympathy with my investigation. Thus we stretch the truth at great crises. I know you, was the answer, but keep away from the house. Our orders are imperative to allow no one to approach it again tonight, except with the child in hand, or with such news as would gain instant admission. Trust me, said I, and I went up the steps. It was so dark between the hedgerows that my ascent became mere groping. I had a lantern in my pocket which I had taken from Jupp, but I did not choose to make use of it. I preferred to go on and up, trusting to my instinct to tell me when I had reached a fresh flight of steps. A gleam of light from Mrs. Carew's upper windows was the first intimation I received that I was at the top of the bank, and in another moment I was opposite the gap in the hedge opening upon her grounds. For no particular reason that I know of, I here paused and took a survey of what was, after all, nothing but a cluster of shadows, broken here and there by squares of subdued light I felt a vague desire to enter to see and to talk again with the charming woman whose personality had made such an impression upon me, if only to understand the peculiar feelings which those indistinguishable walls awakened, and why such a sense of anticipation should disturb my admiration of this woman, and the delight which I had experienced in every accent of her trained and exquisite voice. I was standing very still in almost total darkness. The shock, therefore, was great, when in finally making up my mind to move, I became conscious of a presence near me, totally indiscernible and as silent as myself. Whose? No watchman, or he would have spoken at the rustle I made, stumbling back against the hedgerow. Some marauder, then, or a detective like myself? I would not waste time in speculating. Better to decide the question at once for the situation was eerie. The person, whoever he was, stood so near and so still and so directly in the way of my advance. Drawing the lantern from my pocket, I pushed open the slide and flashed the light on the immovable figure before me. The face I beheld staring into mine was one quite unknown to me, but as I took in its expression, 
My arm gradually fell, and with it the light from the man's features, till face and form were lost again in the darkness, leaving in my disturbed mind naught but an impression, but such an impression. The countenance thus flashed upon my vision must have been a haunting one at any time, but seen as I saw it, at a moment of extreme self-abandonment, the effect was startling. Yet I had sufficient control over myself to utter a word or two of apology, which was not answered, if it was even heard. A more exact description may be advisable. The person whom I thus encountered hesitating before Mrs. Carew's house was a man of meager build, sloping shoulders, and handsome but painfully pinched features. That he was a gentleman of culture and the nicest refinement was evident at first glance. That this culture and refinement were at this moment under the dominion of some fierce thought or resolve was equally apparent, giving to his look an absorption which the shock attending the glare I had thus suddenly thrown onto his face could not immediately dispel. Dazed by an encounter for which he seemed even less prepared than myself, he stood with his heart in his face, if I may so speak, and only gradually came to himself as the sense of my proximity forced itself upon his suffering and engrossed mind. When I saw that he had quite emerged from his dream, I dropped the light, but I did not forget his look. I did not forget the man, though I hastened to leave him, in my desire to fulfill the purpose for which I had entered these grounds at so late an hour. My plan was, as I have said, to visit the Ocumpa stables and have a chat with the coachman. I had no doubt of my welcome and not much doubt of myself. Yet, as I left the vicinity of Mrs. Carew's cottage, and came upon the great house of the Ocumpas looming in the moonlight above its marbled terrace, I felt impressed as never before by both the beauty and magnificence of the noble pile, and shrank with something like shame from the presumption which had led me to pit my wits against a mystery having its birth in so much grandeur and material power. The prestige of great wealth as embodied in this superb structure well nigh awed me from my task, and I was passing the twin pergolas and flower-bordered walks with hesitating foot, when I heard through one of the open windows a cry which made me forget everything but our common heritage of sorrow and the equal hold it had on high and low. Philo, the voice rang out in misery to wring a heart of the most callous. Philo, Philo, Mr. Ocumpa's name called aloud by his suffering wife. Was it delirium? It would seem so. But why Philo, always Philo? and not once, Gwendolen. With hushed steps, ears ringing and heart palpitating with a new and indefinable sensation, I turned into the road to the stables. There were men about, and I caught one glimpse of a maid's pretty head looking from one of the rear windows, but no one stopped me, and I reached the stable just as a man came sauntering out to take his final look at the weather. It was the fellow I sought, Thomas the coachman. I had not miscalculated the nature of my man. In ten minutes we were seated together on an open balcony, smoking and beguiling the time with a little harmless gossip. After a free and easy discussion of the great event, mingled with the naturally to be expected criticism of the police, we proceeded under my guidance to those particulars for which I had risked losing this very valuable hour. He mentioned Mrs. Ocumpa. I mentioned Mrs. Carew. A beautiful woman, I remarked. I thought he looked astonished. She, beautiful, was his doubtful rejoinder. What do you think of Mrs. Ocumpa? She is handsome, too, but in a different way. I should think so. I've driven rich and I've driven poor. I've even sat on the box in front of an English duchess but never have I seen such features as Mrs. Ocumpa's. That's why I consent to drive an American millionaire's wife, when I might be driving the English nobility. A statue, said I, cold. True enough, but one you never tire of looking at. 
"'Besides, she can light up wonderfully. "'I have seen her when she was all a-quiver, "'and lovely as the loveliest. "'And when do you think that was? "'When she had her child in her arms? "'I spoke in lowered tones, "'as befitted the suggestion and the circumstances. "'No,' he drawled, "'between thoughtful puffs of smoke, "'when Mr. Ocumpa sat on the seat beside her. "'This when I was driving the Victoria.' I often used to make an excuse for turning my head about, so as to catch a glimpse of her smile at some fine view, and the way she looked up at him to see if he was enjoying it as much as she. I like women who love their husbands. And he? Oh, she has nothing to complain of in him. He worships the ground she walks on, and more than worships the child. Here his voice fell. I brought the conversation back as quickly as I could to Mrs. Carew. "'You like pale women,' said I. "'Now I like a woman who looks plain one minute and perfectly charming the next.' "'That's what people say of Mrs. Carew. I know of lots who admire that kind. The little girl, for one. "'Gwendolen? Was she attracted to Mrs. Carew?' "'Attracted? I've seen her go to her from her mother's lap like a bird to its nest.' Many a time have I driven the carriage with Mrs. Ocumpa sitting up straight inside, and her child curled up in the other woman's arms, with not a look or word for her mother. "'How did Mrs. Ocumpa seem to like that?' I asked, between puffs of my cigar. "'Oh, she's one of the cold ones, you know. At least you say so. But I feel sure that the last three years, that is, ever since this woman came into the neighborhood, her heart has been slowly breaking. This last blow will kill her. I thought of the moaning cry of Philo, Philo, which at intervals I still seemed to hear issue from the upper window in the great house, and felt that there might be truth in his fears. But it was of Mrs. Carew I had come to talk, and not of Mrs. Ocumpa. Children's fancies are unaccountable, I sententiously remarked. "'But perhaps there is some excuse for this one. "'Mrs. Carew has what you call a magnetic personality, "'a personality which I should imagine "'would be very appealing to a child. "'I never saw such expression in a human face. "'Whatever her mood, "'she impresses each passing feeling upon you "'as the one reality of her life. "'I cannot understand such changes, "'but they are very fascinating.' "'Oh, they are easy to understand in her case. "'She was an actress once. "'I myself have seen her on the stage, in London. "'I used to admire her there.' "'An actress?' I repeated, somewhat taken aback. "'Yes, I forgot what name she played under, "'but she's a very great lady now, "'in with all the swells and rich enough to own a yacht if she wanted to. "'But a widow? "'Oh, yes, a widow.' I let a moment of silence pass, then nonchalantly remarked, Why is she going to Europe? But this was too much for my simple-hearted friend. He neither knew nor had any conjecture ready. But I saw that he did not deplore her resolve. His reason for this presently appeared. If the little one is found, the mother will want all her caresses. Let Mrs. Carew hug the boy that God in his mercy has thrown into her arms, and leave other children to their mothers. I rose to leave when I bethought me and stopped to ask another question. Who is the gentleman I have seen about here? A man with a handsome face, but very pale and thin in his appearance, so much so that it is quite noticeable. Do you mean Mr. Rathbone? I do not know his name. A light-complexioned man, who looks as if greatly afflicted by some disease or secret depression. Oh, that is Mr. Rathbone, sure. He is sickly-looking enough, and not without his trouble, too. They say, but it's all gossip, of course, that he has set his heart on the widow. Mrs. Carew? Of course, who else? And she? Why, she would be a fool to care for him, unless... "'Unless what?' Thomas laughed, a little uneasily, I could not help thinking. "'I'm afraid we're talking scandal,' said he, 
You know the relationship? What relationship? Why, his relationship to the family. He is Gwendolen's cousin, and I have heard it said that he's named after her in Madame Ocampa's will. Oh, I see. The next heir, eh? Yes, to the Rathbone property. So that if she's not found, your sickly man in that case would be well worth the marrying. Is Mrs. Carew so fond of money as all that? I thought she was a woman of property. She is, but it takes money to make some men interesting. He isn't handsome enough or independent enough to go entirely on his own merits. Besides, he has a troop of relatives hanging on to him, bloodsuckers who more than eat up his salary. A businessman, then? Yes, in some New York house. He was always very fond of Gwendolen, and I am not surprised to hear that he is very much cut up by our trouble. I always thought well of Mr. Rathbone myself, which same ended the conversation, so far as my interest in it was concerned. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Millionaire Baby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green, Chapter Nine. The Bungalow. As soon as I could break away and leave him, I did, and betook myself to Mrs. Carew's house. My resolve was taken. Late as it was, I would attempt an interview with her. The lights still burning above and below gave me the necessary courage yet I was conscious of some embarrassment in presenting my name to the astonished maid, who was in the act of extinguishing the hall light when my vigorous ring prevented her. Seeing her doubtful look and the hesitation with which she held the door, I told her I would wait on the porch outside until she carried my name up to Mrs. Carew. This seemed to relieve her, and in a moment I was standing again under the vines waiting for permission to enter the house. It came very soon, and I had to conquer a fresh embarrassment at the sight of Mrs. Carew's nimble and gracious figure, descending the stairs in all eagerness to greet me. "'What is it?' she asked, running hastily forward so that we met in the center of the hall. "'Good news! Nothing else could have brought you back again so soon, and at an hour so late.' There was a dangerous naivete in the way she uttered the last three words, which made me suspect the actress. Indeed, I was quite conscious, as I met her thrilling and expressive glance, that I should never again feel the same confidence in her sincerity. My judgment had been confounded, and my insight rendered helpless by what I had heard of her art, and the fact that she had once been a capable player of parts but I was man enough and detective enough not to betray my suspicion now that I was brought face to face with her. It had always been latent in my breast, even in the very midst of my greatest admiration for her. Yet I had never acknowledged to myself of what I suspected her, nor did I now, not quite, not enough to give that point to my attack, which would have ensured me immediate victory or defeat. I was obliged to feel my way, and so answered, with every appearance of friendly confidence. I fear, then, that I shall be obliged to ask your pardon. I have no good news. Rather, what might be called, if not bad, of a very perplexing character. The child has been traced. Here I purposely let my voice halt for an instant. Here. Here? Her eyes opened, her lips parted in a look of surprise so ingenuous that involuntarily I felt forced to add, by way of explanation, the child, I mean, who was screaming along the highway in the wagon, and for whom the police, and others, have for two days been looking. Oh, she ejaculated with a slight turn of her head aside as she motioned me toward a chair. And is that child Gwendolen, or don't you know? She was all eagerness as she faced me again. That will be known tomorrow, I rejoined, resisting the beautiful brightness of her face with an effort that must have left its mark on my own features, 
for she smiled with unconscious triumph as she held my eyes for a minute in hers, saying softly, "'Oh, how you excite me! Tell me more. Where was the wagon found? Who is with it? And how much of all this have you told Mrs. Ocumpaugh?' With the last question she had risen, involuntarily, it seemed, and as though she would rush to her friend if I did not at once reassure her of that friend's knowledge of a fact which seemed to throw a gleam of hope upon a situation hitherto entirely unrelieved. "'Mrs. Ocumpa has been told nothing,' I hastily returned, answering the last and most important question first. "'Nor must she be,' at least not until certainty replaces doubt. She is in a critical state, I am told. To rouse her hopes to-night, only to dash them again to-morrow, would be cruel policy. With her eyes still on my face, Mrs. Carew slowly reseated herself. Then there are doubts, she faltered, doubts of it being Gwendolen. There is always doubt, I replied, and openly paused in manifest non-committal. "'Oh!' she somewhat wildly exclaimed, covering her face with her hands, beautiful hands covered with jewels. "'What suspense! What bitter and cruel suspense! I feel it almost as much as if it were my Harry!' was the final cry with which she dropped them again. And she did feel it. Her features had blanched and her form was shaking. "'But you have not answered my questions as to where this wagon is at present,' and under whose care? Can't you see how anxious I must be about that, if it should prove to be Gwendolen? Mrs. Carew, if I could tell you that, I could tell you more. We shall both have to wait till tomorrow. Meanwhile, I have a favor to ask. Have you by any chance the means of entrance to the bungalow? I have a great and inappeasable desire to see for myself if all the nooks and corners of that place have given up their secrets. It's an egotistical desire, no doubt, and may strike you as folly of the rankest, but we detectives have learned to trust nobody in our investigations, and I shall never be satisfied till I have looked the whole spot over, inch by inch, for the clue which may yet remain there. If there is a clue, I must find it. Clue? She was looking at me a little breathlessly. "'Clue to what? Then she wasn't in the wagon? You are still seeking her?' "'Always seeking her,' I put in. "'But surely not in the bungalow?' Mrs. Carew's expression was one of extreme surprise. "'What can you find there?' "'I do not know, but I want to look. I can go to the house for a key, but it is late, and it seems unpardonable to disturb Mrs. Ocumpaugh.' Yet I shall have to do this if you do not have a key, for I shall not sleep till I have satisfied myself that nothing can be discovered on the immediate scene of Gwendolen's disappearance, to help forward the rescue we are both so intent upon. You are right, was the hesitating reply I received. I have a key. I will fetch it if you do not mind. I will accompany you to the bungalow. "'Nothing would give me greater pleasure,' I replied with my best bow. "'White lies come easy in our trade.' "'I will not keep you a minute,' she said, rising and going into the hall. But in an instant she was back. "'A word to my maid and a covering for my head,' she explained, "'and I will be with you.' Her manner pointed unmistakably to the door. I had no alternative but to step out onto the porch to await her. But she was true to her word, and in a moment she had joined me with the key in her hand. "'Oh, what adventures!' was her breathless cry. "'Shall I ever forget this dreadful, this interminable week? "'But it is dark. Even the moon is clouded over. How shall we see? There are no lights in the bungalow. "'I have a lantern in my pocket.' My only hope is that no stray gleam from it may pierce the shrubbery and bring the police upon us. Do you fear the police? she chatted away, almost as a child might. No, but I want to do my work alone. There will be little glory or little money in it if I share any of my discoveries. 
Ah! It was an irrepressible exclamation, or so it seemed. But I should not have noted it if I had not caught, or persuaded myself that I had caught, the oblique glint from her eye which accompanied it. But it was very dark just at this time, and I could be sure of nothing but that she kept close to my side, and seemed more than once on the point of addressing me in the short distance we traversed before reaching the bungalow. But nothing save inarticulate murmurs left her lips, and soon we were too busy, in our endeavors to unlock the door, to think of conversation. The key she had brought was rusty. Evidently she had not often made use of it. But after a few futile efforts I succeeded in making it work, and we stepped into the small building in a silence that was only less profound than the darkness in which we instantly found ourselves enveloped. Light was under my hand, however, and in another moment there opened before us the small square room whose every feature had taken on a ghostly and unfamiliar air from the strange hour and the unwanted circumstances. I saw how her impressionable nature was affected by the scene, and made haste to assume the off-hand air I thought most likely to overcome her apprehension. But the effect of the blank walls before her, relieved, but in no reassuring way, by the long dark folds of the rugs hanging straight down over the mysterious partition, held its own against my well-meant efforts and I was not surprised to hear her voice falter as she asked what I expected to find there. I pointed to a chair and said, If you will sit down, I will show you. Not what I expect to find, but how a detective goes about his work. Whatever our expectations, however small or however great, we pay full attention to details. Now the detail which has worried me in regard to this place is the existence of a certain space in this building unaccounted for by these four walls. In other words, the portion which lies behind these rugs. And throwing aside the same, I let the flame of my lantern play over the walled-up space which I had before examined with little satisfaction. This partition, I continued, seems as firm as any of the walls, but I want to make sure that it hides nothing. If the child should be in some hole back of this partition, what a horror and what an outrage! But it is impossible, came almost in a shriek from the woman behind me. The opening is completely walled up. I have never known of its being otherwise. It looked like that when I came here three years ago. There is no possible passage through that wall. Why was it ever closed up? Do you know? Not exactly. The family are very reticent about it. Some fancy of Mr. Ocumpaugh's father, I believe. He was an odd man. They tell all manner of stories about him. If anything offended him, he ridded himself of it immediately. He took a distaste to that end of the hut, as they used to call it in those days, before it was remodeled to suit the house. So he had it walled up. That is all we know about it. I wish I could see behind that wall, I muttered, dropping back the rug I had all this time held in my hand. I feel some mystery here which I cannot grasp. Then, as I flashed my lantern about in every direction with no visible result, added with the effort which accompanies such disappointments, there is nothing here, Mrs. Carew. Though it is the scene of the child's disappearance, it gives me nothing. End of chapter 9、Chapter 10 of The Millionaire Baby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green. Chapter 10 Temptation. The sharp rustle of her dress as she suddenly rose struck upon my ear. Then let us go, she cried, with just a slight quiver of eagerness in her wonderful voice. I comprehended its culture now. This place is ghostly at this hour of the night. I believe that I am really afraid. 
With a muttered reassurance I allowed the full light of the lantern to fall directly on her face. She was afraid. There was no other explanation possible for her wild staring eyes and blue quivering lips. For the instant I hardly knew her. Then her glance rose to mine, and she smiled, and it was with difficulty I refrained from acknowledging in words my appreciation of her wonderful flexibility of expression. "'You are astonished to see me so affected,' she said. "'It is not so strange as you think. It is a superstition. The horror of what once happened here, the reason for that partition. I know the whole story.' for all my attempts to deny it just now. The hour, too, is unfortunate, the darkness, your shifting mysterious light. It was late like this, and dark, with just the moon to illuminate the scene, when she— Mr. Trevitt, do you want to know the story of this place? The old, much-guessed-at, never-really-understood story, which led first to its complete abandonment, then to the building of that dividing wall, and finally to the restoration of this portion, and of this alone, do you? Her eagerness, in such startling contrast to the reticence she had shown on this very subject a few minutes before, affected me peculiarly. I wanted to hear the story. Any one would who had listened to the gossip of this neighborhood for years. But... She evidently did not mean to give me time to understand my own hesitation. I have the whole story, the touching, hard-to-be-believed history, up at my house at this very moment. It was written by... No, I will let you guess. The naivete of her smile made me forget the force of its late expression. Mr. Ocumpa, I ventured. Which Mr. Ocumpa? There have been so many... She began slowly, naturally, to move toward the door. I cannot guess. Then I shall have to tell you. It was written by the one who... Come, I will tell you outside. I haven't any courage in here. But I have. You haven't read the story. Never mind. Tell me who the writer was. Mr. Ocumpa's father, he by whose orders this partition was put up. Oh, you have his story, written, and by himself? You are fortunate, Mrs. Carew. I had turned the lantern from her face, but not so far that I did not detect the deep flush which dyed her whole countenance at these words. I am, she emphatically returned, meeting my eyes with a steady look I was not sufficiently expert with women's ways, or at all events with this woman's ways, to understand. Seldom has such a tale been written. Seldom. Let us thank God has there been an equal occasion for it. You interest me, I said. And she did. Little as this history might have to do with the finding of Gwendolen, I felt an almost imperative necessity of satisfying my curiosity in regard to it, though I knew she had deliberately roused this curiosity for a purpose which, if not comprehensible to me, was of marked importance to her, and not altogether for the reason she had been pleased to give me. Possibly it was on account of this last-mentioned conviction that I allowed myself to be so interested. "'It is late,' she murmured with a final glance toward those dismal hangings, which in my present mood... I should not have been greatly surprised to see stir under her look. However, if you will pardon the hour and accept a seat in my small library, I will show you what only one other person has seen besides myself. It was a temptation. For several reasons it was a temptation, yet. I want you to see why I am so frightened of this place, she said, flashing her eyes upon me with an almost girlish appeal. I will go, said I, and following her quickly out, I locked the bungalow door, and ignoring the hand she extended toward me, dropped the key into my pocket. I thought I heard a little gasp, the least, the smallest of sounds possible, but if so, the feeling which prompted it was not apparent in her manner or her voice, as she led the way back to her house, 
and ushered me into a hall full of packing boxes and the general litter accompanying an approaching departure. "'You will excuse the disorder,' she cried as she piloted me through the various encumbrances to a small but exquisitely furnished room, still glorying in its full complement of ornaments and pictures. "'This trouble which has come to one I love has made it very hard for me to do anything. I feel helpless, at times completely helpless.' The dejection she expressed was but momentary, however. In another instant she was pointing out a chair and begging me to make myself comfortable, while she went for the letter, I think she called it a letter, which I had come there to read. What was I to think of her? What was I to think of myself? And what would the story tell me to warrant the loss of what might have proved a most valuable hour? I had not answered these questions when she re-entered with a bundle in her hand of discolored, I should almost call them moldering, sheets of crumpled paper. These, she began, then seeing me look at them with something like suspicion, she paused until she caught my eye, when she added gravely, These came to me from Mrs. Ocampa. How she got them you will have to ask her. I should say judging from appearances. Here she took a seat opposite me at a small table, near which I had been placed, that they must have been found in some old chest or possibly in some hidden drawer of one of those curious antique desks of which more than one was discovered in the garrets of the old house when it was pulled down to give place to the new one. Is this letter, as you call it, so old? I asked. It is dated thirty-five years ago. The garret must have been a damp one, I remarked. She flashed me a look. I thought of it more than once afterward, and asked if she should do the reading or I. You, I rejoined, all afire with the prospect of listening to her remarkable voice, in what I had every reason to believe would call forth its full expression. Only let me look at those sheets first and understand as perfectly as I may just what it is you are going to read to me. It's an explanation written for the heirs by Mr. Ocumpa. The story itself, she went on, handing me over the paper she held, begins abruptly. From the way the sheet is torn across at the top, I judge that the narrative itself was preceded by some introductory words now lacking. When I have read it to you, I will tell you what I think those introductory words were. I handed back the sheets. There seemed to be a spell in the air, possibly it arose from her manner, which was one to rouse expectation even in one whose imagination had not already been stirred by a visit at night and in more than commonly bewildering company to the place whose dark and hitherto unknown secret I was about to hear. I am ready, I said, feeling my strange position, but not anxious to change it just then for any other conceivable one. She drew a deep breath, again fixing me with her strange compelling eyes and with the final remark, The present no longer exists. We are back in the seventies, began this enthralling tale. I did not move till the last line dropped from her lips. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of the Millionaire Baby」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green Chapter 11 The Secret of the Old Pavilion I was as sane that night as I have ever been in my life. I am quite sure of this, though I had had a merry time enough earlier in the evening with my friends in the old pavilion, that time-honored retreat of my ancestors, whose desolation I had thought to dissipate with a little harmless revelry. Wine does not disturb my reason, the little wine I had drank under that unwholesome roof, nor am I a man given to sudden excitements or untoward impulses. Yet this thing happened to me. It was after leaving the pavilion, 
My companions had all ridden away, and I was standing on the lawn beyond my library windows, recalling my pleasure with them and gazing somewhat idly, I own, at the bare portion of the old wall where the tree fell a year ago, the place where the moon strikes with such a glitter when it rides high, as it did that night. When, believe it or not, it is all one to me, I became conscious of a sudden mental dread, inexplicable and alarming, which, seizing me after an hour of unmixed pleasure and gaiety, took such a firm grip upon my imagination that I fain would have turned my back upon the night and its influences, only my eyes would not leave that open space of wall where I now saw pass, not the shadow, but the veritable body of a large black hungry-looking dog, which, while I looked, turned into the open gateway connecting with the pavilion, and disappeared. With it went the oppression which held me spellbound. The ice melted from my blood. I could move my limbs and again control my thoughts and exercise my will. Forcing a laugh, I whistled to that dog. The lights with which the banquet had been illuminated were out, and every servant had left the place but the tables had not been entirely cleared, and I could well understand what had drawn this strange animal thither. I whistled then, and whistled peremptorily, but no dog answered my call. Angry, for the rules are strict at my stables in regard to wandering brutes, I strode toward the pavilion. Entering the great gap in the wall where the gate had once hung, I surveyed the dismal interior before me, with feelings I could not but consider odd in a strong man like myself. Though the wine was scarcely dry in the glass which an hour before I had raised in this very spot amid cheers of laughter, I found it a difficult matter to re-enter there now, in the dead of night, alone, and without light. For this building, harmless as it had always seemed, had been in a way cursed, for no reason that he ever gave, my father had doomed this ancient adjunct to our home to perpetual solitude and decay. By his will he had forbidden it to be destroyed, a wish respected by my guardians and afterward by myself, and though there was nothing to hinder its being cared for and in a manner used, the dismal influence which had pervaded the place ever since his death had, under the sensations I have mentioned, deepened into horror and an unspeakable repugnance. Yet never having had any reason to believe myself a coward, I took boldly enough the few steps necessary to carry me inside its dismal precincts, and, meeting with nothing but darkness and silence, began to whistle again for the dog I had certainly seen enter here. But no dog appeared. Hastening out, I took my way toward the stables. As I did so I glanced back, and again my eyes fell on that place in the wall gleaming white in the moonlight. Again I felt the chill, the horror. Again my eyes remained glued to this one spot, and again I beheld the passing of the dog, running with jaws extended and head held low. Fearsome, uncanny, supernaturally horrible, a thing to flee from, if one could only flee instead of standing stock still on the sward, gazing with eyes that seemed starting from their sockets till it had plunged through the gap in the wall and again disappeared. The occult and the imaginary have never appealed to me, and the moment I felt myself a man again, I hurried on to the stables to call up my man, Jared. But halfway there I paused, struck by an odd remembrance, this father of mine, Philo Ocampa, had died, or so his old servants had said, under peculiar circumstances. I had forgotten them till now. Such stories make poor headway with me. But if I was not mistaken, the facts were these. He had been ailing long, and his nurses had got used to the sight of his gaunt white figure sitting propped up but speechless in the great bed opposite the stretch of blank wall in the corner bedroom, where a picture of his first wife, the wife of his youth, had once hung, 
but which, for some years now, had been removed to where there were fewer shadows and more light. He had never been a talkative man, and in all the five years of my own memory of him, I had never heard him raise his voice except in command, or when the duties of hospitality required it. Now, with the shadow of death upon him, he was absolutely speechless, and his nurses were obliged to guess at his wishes by the movement of his hands, or the direction of his eyes. Yet he was not morose, and sometimes was seen to struggle with the guards holding his tongue, as though he would fain have loosed them himself from their inexorable control. Yet he never succeeded in doing so, and the nurses sat by him and saw no difference in him, till suddenly the candle, poised on the table nearby, flickered and went out, leaving only moonlight in the room. It was moonlight so brilliant that the place seemed brighter than before, though the beams were all concentrated on one spot, a blank spot in the middle of the wall upon which those two dim orbs in the bed were fixed in expectancy, none there understood, for none knew that the summons had come, and that for him the angel of death was at that moment standing in the room. Yet as moonlight is not the natural light for a sick man's bedside, one amongst them had risen for another candle, when something, I had never stopped to hear them say what, made him pause and look back, when he saw distinctly outlined upon the white wall space I have mentioned, the figure, the unimaginable figure of a dog, large, fierce, and hungry-looking, which dashed by, and was gone. Simultaneously a cry came from the bed, the first words for months, Aline, the name of his girl-wife dead and gone for years. All sprang, some to chase the dog, one to aid and comfort the sick man. But no dog was there, nor did he need comfort more. He had died with that cry on his lips, and as they gazed at his face, sunk low now in his pillow, as if he had started up and fallen back a dead weight, they felt the terror of the moment grow upon them till they too were speechless for the aged features were drawn into lines of unspeakable anguish and horror. But as the night passed and morning came, all these lines smoothed out, and when they buried him, those who had known him well talked of the beautiful serenity which illuminated the face, which, since their first remembrance of him, had carried the secret of a profound and unbroken melancholy. Of the dog nothing was said, even in whispers, till time had hallowed that grave, and the little children about grown to be men and women. Then the garrulity of age had its way. This story and the images it called up came like a shock as I halted there, and instead of going on into the stables I turned my steps toward the house, where I summoned from his bed a certain old servant who had lived longer in the family than myself. Bidding him bring a lantern, I waited for him on the porch, and when he came, I told him what I had seen. Instantly I knew that it was no new story to him. He turned very pale and set down the lantern, which was shaking very visibly in his hand. "'Did you look up?' he asked. "'When you were in the pavilion, I mean?' "'No, why should I? The dog was on the ground. Besides—' "'Let us go down to the pavilion,' he whispered. "'I want to see for myself if—if—' "'If what, Jared?' He turned his eyes on me, but did not answer. Stooping, I lifted the lantern and put it in his hand. He was quaking like a leaf, but there was a determination in his face, far beyond the ordinary. "'What made him quake?' he who knew of this dog only by hearsay, and what, in spite of this fear, gave him such resolution. I followed in his wake to see what it was. The moon still shone clear upon the lawn, and it was with a certain renewal of my former apprehensions that I approached the spot on the wall where I had seen what I was satisfied not to see again. But though I glanced that way, 
what man could have avoided it, I perceived nothing but the bare paint, and we went on and passed without a word, Jared leading the way. But once on the threshold of the pavilion itself, it was for him to show the coward. Turning, he made me a gesture, one I did not understand, and seeing that I did not understand it, he said after a fearful look around, Do not mind the dog. That was but an appearance. Lift your eyes to the ceiling, over there, at the extreme end toward the south. Do you see? What do you see? Nothing, I replied, amazed at what struck me as utter folly. Nothing, he repeated in a relieved voice, as he lifted up his lantern. Ah! came in a short muttered shriek from his lips as he pointed up. Here and there, along the farther ceiling, over which the light now played freely and fully. What is that spot, and that spot, and that? They were not there today. I was in here before the banquet, and I would have seen. What is it? Master, what is it? They call it. "'Well, well, what do they call it?' I asked impatiently. "'Blood. Do you not see that it is blood? "'What else is red and shiny and shows in such great drops?' "'Nonsense,' I vociferated, taking the lantern in my own hand. "'Blood on the ceiling of my old pavilion? "'Where could it come from? "'There was no quarrel, no fight, only hilarity. "'Where did the dog come from?' he whispered. I dropped my arm, staring at him in mingled anger and certain half-understood sympathy. "'You think these stains,' I began, "'are as unreal as the dog?' "'Yes, master.' Feeling as if I were in a dream, I tossed up the lantern again. The drops were still there, but no longer single or scattered. From side to side, the ceiling at this one end of the building oozed with the thick red moisture to which he had given so dreadful a name. Stepping back for fear the stains would resolve themselves into rain and drop upon my forehead, I stared at Jared, who had now retreated toward the door. "'What makes you think it blood?' I demanded. "'Because some have smelt and tasted it. We have never talked about it. But this is not an uncommon occurrence. Tomorrow all these stains will be gone. They come when the dog circles the wall. Whence, no one knows. It is our mystery. All the old servants have heard of it more than once. The new ones have never been told. Nor would I have told you if you had not seen the dog. It was a matter of honor with us. I looked at him, saw that he believed every word he had said, threw another glance at the ceiling, and led the way out. When we had reached the house again, I said, You are acquainted with the tradition underlying these appearances, as you call them? What is it? He would not tell me. He knew no more than he had already stated, gossip and old wives' tales. But later a certain manuscript came into my possession through my lawyer, which I will append to this. It was written by my unhappy father some little time before his last illness, and given into the charge of the legal representative of our family, with the express injunction that its seal was to remain intact if for twenty years the apparition which had haunted him did not present itself to the eyes of any of his children but if within that time his experience should repeat itself in theirs, this document was to be handed over to the occupant of Homewood. Nineteen out of the twenty years had elapsed, without the dog being seen, or the ceiling of the pavilion dropping blood. But not the twentieth. Hence, the document was mine. You can easily conceive with what feelings I opened it, it was headed with this simple line, my story which I can write but could never tell. I am cursed with an inability to speak when I am most deeply moved, either by anger or tenderness. This misfortune has wrecked my life. 
On the verge of old age, the sorrows and the mistakes of my early life fill my thoughts so completely that I see but one face, hear but one voice. Yet when she was living, then she could see and hear. My tongue was silent, and she never knew. Aline, my Aline. I married her when I was thirty-five, and she eighteen. All the world knows this. But what it does not know is that I loved her. Toy, plaything that she was, a body without a mind, or so I considered her. While she had but followed the wishes of her relatives in giving her sweet youth to a cold and reticent man, who might love, indeed, but who had no power to tell that love, or even to show it in the ways which women like, and which she liked, as I found out when it was too late. I could not help but love her. It was ingrained within me, a part of the curse of my life, to love this gentle, thoughtless, alluring thing to which I had given my name. She had a smile, it did not come often, which tore at my heart-strings as it welled up, just stirring the dimples in her cheeks, and died away again in a strange and moving sweetness. Though I reckoned her at her worth, knew that her charm was all physical, that she neither did nor could understand a passion like mine, much less return it. It was none the less irresistible, and I have known myself to stand before a certain bookshelf in the turn of the stairway for many minutes together, because I knew that she would soon be coming down, and that, when she did, some ribbon from her gown would flutter by me, and I should feel the soft contact and go away happy to my books. Yet if she stopped to look back at me, I could only return her look with one she doubtless called harsh, for she had not eyes to see below the surface. I tell you all this lest you may not understand. She was not your mother, and you may begrudge me the affection I felt for her. If so, thrust these leaves into the fire, and seek not the explanation of what has surprised you, for there is no word written here which does not find its meaning in the intense love I bore for her, my young girl wife, and the tragedy which this love has brought into my life. She was light in body, slight in mind, and of slight feeling. I first discovered this last on the day I put my mother's ring on her finger. She laughed as I fitted it close and kissed her little hand. Not from embarrassment or childish impulse, I could have understood that, but indifferently, like one who did not know and never could. Yet I married her, and for six months lived in a fool's paradise. Then came that ball. It was held near here, very near, at one of our neighbors, in fact. I remember that we walked, and that, coming to the driveway, I lifted her and carried her across. Not with a smile, do not think it, more like with a frown, though my heart was warm and happy, for when I set her down she shook herself, and I thought she did it to hide a shudder, and then I could not have spoken a word had my life depended on it. I little knew what lay back of that shudder. Even after I had seen her dance with him, not only once but twice, I never dreamed that her thoughts, light though they were, were not at all with me. It took that morsel of paper and the plain words it contained to satisfy me of this. And then, but passion is making me incoherent. What do you know of that scrap of paper, hidden from the whole world from the moment I first read it, till this hour of full confession? It fluttered from someone's hand during the dance. I did not see whose. I only saw it after it had fallen at my feet and as it lay there open I naturally read the words. They were written by a man to a woman, urging flight and setting the hour and place for meeting. I was conscious of shame in reading it, and let these last details escape me. As I put it in my pocket I remember thinking, some poor devil made miserable, for there had been hint in it of the husband. But I had no thought, I swear it before God, of who that husband was, 
till I beheld her flit back through the open doorway with terror in her mien and searching eyes fixed on the floor. Then hell opened before me, and I saw my happiness go down into gulfs I had never before sounded, even in my imagination. But even at that hour my countenance scarcely changed. I was opposite a mirror, and I caught a glimpse of myself as I moved. But there must have been some change in my voice, for when I addressed her, she started and turned her face upon me with a wild and pathetic look, which knocked so at my heart that I wished I had never read those words, and so I could return her the paper with no misgivings as to its contents. But, having read it, I could not do this. So beyond a petty greeting I said nothing and let the moment pass, and she with it, for couples were dancing and she was soon again in the whirl. I am not a dancing man myself, and I had leisure to think and madden myself with contemplation of my wrecked life and questions as to what I should do to her and to him and to the world where such things could happen. I had forgotten the details of time and place, or rather had put them out of my mind, and I would not look at the words again, could not. But as the minutes went by, the remembrance returned, startling and convincing that the hour was two and the place our old pavilion. I walked about after that like a man in whose breast the sources of life are frozen. I chatted, I who never chatted, with women and with men. I even smiled once. That was when my little white-faced wife asked me if it were not time to go home. Even a man under torture might find strength to smile if the inquisitor should ask if he were not ready to be released. And we went home. I did not carry her this time across the driveway, but when we parted in the library, where I always spent an hour before retiring, I picked out a lily from a vase of flowers standing on my desk and held it out to her. She stared at it for a moment, quite as white as the lily, then she slowly put out her hand and took it. I felt no mercy after that and bade her good night with the remark that I should have to write far into the morning and that she need not worry over my light, which I should not probably put out till she was half through with her night's rest. For answer, she dropped the lily. I found it next morning lying withered and brown in the hallway. That light did burn far into the morning, but I was not there to trim it. Before the fatal hour had struck, I had left the house and made my way to the pavilion. As I crossed the sward I saw the gleam of a lantern at the masthead of a small boat, riding near our own landing-place, and I understood where he was at this hour, and by what route he hoped to take my darling. A route she will never travel, thought I, striving to keep out of my mind and conscience the vision of another route, another travel, which that sweet young body might take if my mood held and my purpose strengthened. There was no moon that night, and the copse in which our pavilion stands was like a blot against the starless heavens. As I drew near it, my dog, the invariable companion of my walks, lifted a short, sharp bark from the stables. But I knew whose hand had fastened him, and I went on without giving him a thought. At the door of the pavilion I stopped. All was dark within as without, and the silence was something to overwhelm the heart. She was not there then, nor was he. But he would be coming soon, and up or down between the double hedgerows. I went to meet him. It was a small detail, but possibly a necessary one. In her eyes he was probably handsome and gifted with all that I openly lacked. But he was shallow and small for a man like me to be concerned about. I laughed inwardly and with conceivable scorn as I heard the faint fall of his footsteps in the darkness. It was nearly two, and he meant to be prompt. Our coming together in that narrow path was very much what I expected it to be. I had put out my arms and touched the hedge on either side so that he could not escape me. When I heard him drawing close, I found the voice I had not had for her, 
and observed very quietly and with the cold politeness of a messenger, my wife finds herself indisposed since the ball, and begs to be excused from joining you in the pleasant sail you proposed for her. That and no more, except that when he started and almost fell into my arms, I found strength to add, The wind blows fresh tonight, and you will have no difficulty in leaving this shore. The difficulty will be to return. I had no heart to kill him. He was young and he was frightened. I heard the sob in his throat and I dropped my arm and he went flying down to the river. This was child's play. The rest? My portion is to tell it. Forty years ago it all befell. Until now no words of it had ever left my lips. There was no sound of her advancing tread across the lawn as I stepped back into my own grounds to enter the pavilion. But as I left the path and put foot inside the wall, I heard a far, faint sound like the harsh closing of a door in timid hands, followed by another bark from the dog, louder and sharper than the first, for he did not recognize my Aileen as mistress, though I had striven for six months to teach him the place she held in my heart. By this I knew she was coming, and that what preparations I had to make must be made soon. They were not many. Entering the well-known place, I lit the lantern I had brought with me and set it down upon the floor. It cast a feeble light about the entrance, but left great shadows in the rear. This I had calculated on, and into these shadows I now stepped. The pavilion, as you remember it, is not what it was then. I had used it little, fancying more my own library up at the house but it was not utterly without furnishings, and to young eyes might even look attractive with love or fancied love to mellow its harsh lines and lend romance to its solitude. At this hour and under these circumstances it was a dismal hole to me, and as I stood there waiting I thought how the place fitted the deed, if deed it was to be. I had always thought her timid, afraid of the night and all threatening things, but as I listened to the sound of her soft footfall at the door, I realized that even her breast could go strong under the influence of real or fancied passion. It was a shock, but I did not cry out, only set my teeth together and turned a little, so that what light there was would fall on my form rather than on my face. She entered. I felt rather than heard the tremulous push she gave to the door, and the quick drawing in of her breath as she put her foot across the threshold. These sapped my courage. This fear, this almost hesitation, drew me from thoughts of myself to thoughts of her, and it was in a daze of mingled purposes and regrets that I felt her at last at my side. Walter fell softly, doubtfully from her lips. It was the name of him, the dip of whose oars as he made for his boat I could now faintly hear in the river below us. Turning, I looked her in the face. "'You are late,' said I. "'God gave me words in my extremity. "'Walter has gone.' Then, as the madness of terror replaced love in her eyes, I lifted her forcibly and carried her to the window, where I drew aside the vines." That is his boat's lantern you see drawing away from the dock. I bade him God speed. He will not come again. Without a word she looked, then fell back on my arm. It was not life which forsook her face, and left her whole sweet body inert, that I could have borne, for did she not merit death, who had killed my love, killed me? But happiness, the glow of youthful blood, the dreams of a youthful brain. And seeing this, seeing that the heart I thought a child's heart had gone down in this shipwreck, I felt my anger swell and master me body and soul, and before I knew it, I was towering over her and she was cowering at my feet, crushed and with hands held up in defense, hands that had been like rose leaves in my grasp, futile hands, but raised now in entreaty for her life to me, to me who had loved her. Why did they not move me? 
Why did my muscles tighten instead of relax? I do not know. I had never thought myself a cruel man, but at that instant I felt that this toy of my strong manhood had done harm far beyond its value, and that it would comfort me to break it and toss it far aside. Only I could not bear the cry which now left her lips. I am so young! Not yet, not yet, Philo. I am so young. Let me live a little while. Was it a woman's plea, conscious of the tenderness she appealed to, or only a child's instinctive grasping after life, just life? If it were the first, it would be easy to finish. But a child's terror, a child's longing that pulled hard at my manhood, and under the possibility, my own arm fell. Instantly her head dropped. No defense did she utter. No further plea did she make. She simply waited. You have deserved death, this I managed to utter. But if you will swear to obey me, you shall not pay your forfeit till you have had a further taste of life. Not in my house. There is not sufficient freedom within its walls for you. But in the broad world, where people dance and sing and grow old at their leisure, without duty and without care. For three months you shall have this, and have it to your heart's content. Then you shall come back to me, truly my wife, if your heart so prompts. If not, to tell me of your failure and quit me forever. But, here I fear my voice grew terrible, for her hands instinctively rose again, those three months must be lived unstained. As you are in God's sight this hour, I demand of you to swear that, if you forget this or disregard it, or for any cause subject my name to dishonor, that you will return unbidden at the first moment your reason returns to you, to take what punishment I will. On this condition I send you away tonight, Aline. Will you promise? She did not answer, but her face rose. I did not understand its look. There was pathos in it, and something else. That something else troubled me. Are you dissatisfied? I asked. Is the time too short? Do you want more months for dancing? She shook her head, and the little hands rose again. Do not send me away, she faintly entreated. I don't know why, but I had rather stay. With me? Impossible. Are you ready to promise, Aline? Then she rose and looked me in the eye with courage, almost with resolution. As I live, said she, and I knew she would keep her word. The next thing I remember of that night was the sight of her little white shivering figure looking out at me from the carriage that was to carry her away. The night was cold, and I had tucked her in with as much care as I might have done the evening before, when I still worshipped her, still thought her mine, or at least as much mine as she was anyone's. When I had done this and had pressed a generous gift into her hand, I took a minute at the carriage door in pity of her aspect. She looked so pinched and pale, so dazed and hopeless. Had she been alone, but the companion with whom I had provided her, was at her side and my tongue was tied. I turned and the driver started up the horses. Philo, I heard blown by me on the wind. Was it she who called? No, for there was anguish in the cry, the anguish of a woman, and she was only a frightened, disheartened child whom I had sent away to dance. One month, two months went by and I began to take up my life. Another, and she would be home, for good or ill. I thought that I could live through that other. I had heard of her, not from her, that I did not require. And the stories were all of the same character. She was enjoying life in the great city to which I had sent her, radiant at night, if a little spiritless by day. She was at balls, at concerts, and at theaters. She wore jewels and shone with the best. I may be proud of her conquests, and the sweetness and dignity with which she bore herself. Thus her friends wrote. 
but she wrote nothing. I had not required it. Once someone, a visitor at the house, spoke of having seen her. She was surrounded with admirers, he had said. How early our American women ripen, was his comment. She held her head like one who had held sway for years. But I thought her a trifle worn, as if pleasure absorbed too much of her sleep. You must look out for her, Judge. And I smiled grimly enough, I own, to think just how I was looking out for her. Then came the thunderbolt. I am told that no one ever sees her in the daytime, that she is always busy, days. But she does not look as if she took that time for rest. What can your little wife be doing? You ought to hurry up that important opinion of yours and go see. He was right. What was she doing? And why shouldn't I go see? There was no obstacle but my own will, but that is the greatest obstacle a man can have. I remained at Homewood, but the four weeks of our further probation looked like a year. Meanwhile, I had my way with the pavilion. I have shown you my heart, sometimes at its best, often at its worst. I will show it to you again in this. I had a wall built around it, close against the thicket in which it lay embedded. This wall was painted white, and near it I had lamps placed which were lit at nightfall. Should a figure pass that wall, I could see it from my window. No one could enter that doorway now without running the risk of my seeing him from where I sat at my desk. Did I feel easier? I do not know that I did. I merely followed an impulse I dared not name to myself. Two weeks of this final month went by. Then, it was in the evening, Someone came running up from the grounds with the message that Mrs. Ocumpa had ridden into the gate, but that she was not ready to enter the house. Would I meet her at the pavilion? I was in the library at my desk, with my eyes on the wall, when this was told to me. I had just seen a fierce figure of that unmanageable dog of mine run by that white surface, and my lips were open to order him tied up, when he and everything else in the world was forgotten in this crushing news of her return. For the three months were not up, and her presence here could mean but one thing, that she had found temptation too much for her, and she had come back to tell me so in obedience to her promise. "'I will go meet Mrs. Ocumpa,' I said. The man stared. I will go meet Mrs. Ocumpa now, I repeated and tried to rise. But my limbs refused. Death had entered my heart, and it was some few minutes before I found myself upon the lawn outside. When I got there I was trembling and so uncertain of movement that I tottered at the gate, but seeing signs of her presence within I straightened myself and went in. She was standing at the extreme end of the room when I entered, in the full light of the solitary moonbeam which shot in at the western casement. She had thrown aside her hat and coat, and never in all my life had I seen anything so ethereal as the worn face and wasted form she thus disclosed. Had it not been for the haunting and pathetic smile which by some freak of fate gave poignancy to her otherwise infantile beauty, I should not have known the woman who stood there with my name formed on her lips. Destroyed was my thought, and the rage which I felt that moment against fate flushed my whole being, and my arms went up, not in threat against her, but to an avenging heaven, when I heard an impetus rush, an angry growl, and the delicate trembling figure went down under the leap of the monstrous animal which I had taught to love me, but could never teach to love her. In horror and unspeakable anguish of soul I called off the dog, and stooped with bitter cries, I took her in my arms. Hurt, I gasped. Hurt, Aline? I looked at her anxiously. No, she whispered. Happy. And before I realized my own feelings or the passion with which I drew her to my breast, 
She had nestled her head against my heart, smiled, and died. The shock of the dog's onslaught had killed her. I would not believe it at first, but when I was quite sure, I took out the pistol I carried in my breast and shot the cowering brute midway between the eyes. When this was done, I turned back to her. But there was no light but the moon, and I needed no other. The clear beams falling on her face made her look pure and stainless and sweet. I could almost have loved her again as I marked the tender smile which lingered from the passing moment on her lips. Happy, she had said. What did she mean by that happy? As I asked myself, I heard a cry. The companion who had been with her had rushed in the doorway and was gazing in sorrow and amazement at the white form lying outstretched and senseless against that farther wall. Oh, she cried in a tone that assured me she had not seen the dog lying in his blood at my back. Dead already, dead at first glance, at the first word? Ah, she knew better than I, poor lamb. I thought she would get well if she once got home. She wearied so for you, sir, and for Homewood. I thought myself quite mad, past understanding aright the words addressed to me. She wearied, I began. With all her soul for you and Homewood, the young woman repeated. That is, since her illness developed. Her illness? Yes, she has been ill ever since she went away. The cold of the first journey was too much for her. But she kept up for several weeks, doing what no other woman ever did before, with so little strength and so little hope. Danced at night, and... And, and, what, by day, what? I could hardly get the words out of my mouth. Studied, learned what she thought you would like. French, music, politics... It was to have been a surprise. Poor soul, it took her very life. She did not sleep. Oh, sir, what is it? I was standing over her, probably a terrifying figure. Lights were playing before my eyes. Strange sounds were in my ears. Everything about me seemed resolving itself into chaos. What do you mean? I finally gasped. She studied? to please me? Why did she come back then so soon? I paused, choked. I had been about to give away my secret. I mean, why did she come thus suddenly without warning me of what I might expect? I would have gone. I told her so, but she was very determined to come to you herself, to this very pavilion. She had set the time later, but this morning the doctor told her that her symptoms were alarming, and without consulting him or heeding the advice of any of us, she started for home. She was buoyant on the way, and more than once I heard her softly repeating your name. Her heart was very loving. Oh, sir, you are ill. No, no, I cried, crushing my hand against my mouth to keep down the cry of anguish and despair, which tore its way from my heart. Before other hands touch her, other eyes see her, tell me when she began, I will not say to love me, but to weary for me and Homewood. Perhaps she has told you herself. Here is the letter, sir. She bade me give you if she did not reach here alive. She wrote it this morning after the doctor told her what I have said. Give, give. She put it in my hand. I glanced at it in the moonlight, read the first few words, and felt the world reel around me. Thrusting the letter in my breast, I bade the woman, who watched me with fascinated eyes, to go now and rouse the house. When she was gone, I stepped back into the shadows, and catching hold of the murderous beast, I dragged him out about the wall to the thick clump of bushes. Here I left him and went back to my darling. When they came in, they found her in my arms. Her head had fallen back, and I was staring, staring at her white throat. 
that night when all was done for her which could be done i shut myself into my library and again opened that precious letter i give it to show how men may be mistaken when they seek to weigh women's souls my husband i love you as i shall be dead when you read this i may say so without fear of rebuff i did not love you then i did not love anybody i was thoughtless and fond of pleasure and craved affectionate words he saw this and worked on my folly but when his project failed and i saw his boat creep away i found that what feeling i had was for the man who had thwarted him and i felt myself saved if i had not taken cold that night i might have lived to prove this i know that you do not love me very much but perhaps you would have done so had you seen me grow a little wiser and more like what your wife should be i was trying when oh philo i cannot write i cannot think i am coming to you i love forgive and take me back again alive or dead i love you i love as i finished the light which had been burning low suddenly went out the window which opened before me was still unshuttered before me across the wide spaces of the lawn showed the pavilion wall white in the moonlight as i stared in horror at it a trembling seized my whole body and the hair on my head rose the dark figure of a running dog had passed across it the dog which lay dead under the bushes god's punishment i murmured and laid my head down on the pathetic letter and sobbed the morning found me there it was not till later that the man sent to bury the dog came to me with the cry something is wrong with the pavilion when i went down to close the window i found the ceiling at that end of the room strangely dabbled it looks like blood and the spots grew as i looked aghast bruised in spirit and broken of heart i went down after that sweet body was laid in the grave to look the stains he had spoken of were gone but i lived to see them reappear as have you god have mercy on our souls end of chapter 11「Do you wonder that a visit in the dead of night to a spot associated with such superstitious horrors should frighten me? She added as she bundled up the scattered sheets with a reckless hand. I do not. I am not sure but that I am a bit frightened myself, I smiled, following with my eye a single sheet which had escaped to the floor. Allow me, I cried, stooping to lift it. As I did so, I observed that it was the first sheet, the torn one, and that a line or so of writing was visible at the top, which I was sure had not been amongst those she read. "'What words are those?' I asked. "'I don't know. They are half gone, as you can see. They have nothing to do with the story. I read you the whole of that.' Mistress as she was of her moods and expressions, I detected traces of some slight confusion. "'The putting up of the partition is not explained,' I remarked. "'Oh, that was put up in horror of the stains "'which from time to time broke out on the ceiling "'at that end of the room. "'I wished to ask her if this was her conclusion, "'or if that line or two I had mentioned "'was more intelligible than she acknowledged it to be, "'but I refrained from a sense of propriety. "'If she appreciated my forbearance, she did not show it. "'Rising, she thrust the papers into a cupboard, 
casting a scarcely perceptible glance at the clock as she did so. I took the hint and rose. Instantly she was all smiles. "'You have forgotten something, Mr. Trevitt. Surely you did not intend to carry away with you my key to the bungalow.' "'I was thinking of it,' I returned lightly. "'I am not quite through with that key.' Then, before she could recover from her surprise, I added with such suavity as I had been able to acquire in my intercourse with my more cultivated clients. "'I have to thank you, Mrs. Carew, for an hour of thrilling interest. Absorbed though I am in the present mystery, my mind has room for one old one.' possibly because there is sometimes a marked connection between old family events and new. There may be some such connection in this case. I should like the opportunity of assuring myself there is not. She said nothing. I thought I understood why. More suavely yet, I continued with a slight, a very slight movement toward the door. Rarely have I had the pleasure of listening to such a tale read by such an interpreter. It will always remain in my memory, Mrs. Carew. But the episode is over, and I return to my present duty and the bungalow. The bungalow? You are going back to the bungalow? Immediately. What for? Didn't you see all there was to see? Not quite. I don't know what there can be left. Nothing of consequence, most likely, but you cannot wish me to have any doubts on the subject. "'No, no, of course not.' The carelessness of her tone did not communicate itself to her manner. Seeing that my unexpected proposition had roused her alarm, I grew wary and remarked, "'I was always over-scrupulous.' With a lift of her shoulders, a dainty gesture which I congratulated myself, I could see unmoved. She held out her hand in mute appeal for the key. But seeing that I was not to be shaken in my purpose, reached for the wrap she had tossed over a chair, and tied it again over her head. "'What are you going to do?' I asked. "'Accompany you,' she declared. "'Again? I thought the place frightened you.' "'It does,' she replied. "'I had rather visit any other spot on the whole world. "'But if it is your intention to go back there, it is mine to go with you.' "'You are very good,' I replied.' but I was seriously disconcerted notwithstanding. I had reckoned upon a quiet hour in the bungalow by myself. Moreover, I did not understand her motive for never trusting me there alone. Yet, as this very distrust was suggestive, I put a good face on the matter and welcomed her company with becoming alacrity. After all, I might gain more than I could possibly lose by having her under my eye for a while longer." Strong as was her self-control, there were moments when the real woman showed herself, and these moments were productive. As we were passing out, she paused to extinguish a lamp, which was slightly smoking. I also thought she paused to listen an instant. At all events, her ears were turned toward the stairs, down which there came the murmur of two voices, one of them the little boy's. "'It is time Harry was asleep,' she cried. "'I promised to sing to him. "'You won't be long, will you?' "'You need not be very long,' was my significant retort. "'I cannot speak for myself.' "'Was I playing with her curiosity or anxieties "'or whatever it was that affected her? "'I hardly knew. "'I spoke as impulse directed and waited in cold blood, "'or was it hot blood, to see how she took it. "'carelessly enough, for she was a famous actress, "'except when taken by surprise. "'Checking an evident desire of calling out some direction up the stairs, "'she followed me to the door, remarking cheerfully, "'You cannot be very long either. "'The place is not large enough.' "'My excuse, or rather the one I made to myself "'for thus returning to a place I had seemingly exhausted, "'was this. "'In the quick turn I had made in leaving on the former occasion,' My foot had struck the edge of the large rug nailed over the center of the floor, and unaccountably loosened it. To rectify this mishap, and also to see how so slight a shock could have lifted the large brass nails by which it had been held down to the floor, seemed reason enough for my action. But how to draw her attention to so insignificant a fact 
without incurring her ridicule, I could not decide in our brief passage back to the bungalow, and consequently was greatly relieved when, upon opening the door and turning my lantern on the scene, I discovered that in our absence the rug had torn itself further free from the floor, and now lay with one of its corners well curled over. The corner farthest from the door, and nearest the divan, where little Gwendolen had been lying when she was lifted and carried away. Where? Mrs. Carew saw it, too, and cast me a startled look, which I met with a smile possibly as ambiguous as the feeling which prompted it. "'Who has been here?' she asked. "'Ourselves. Did we do that?' "'I did, or rather my foot struck the edge of the rug as I turned to go out with you. Shall I replace it and press back the nails?' "'If you will be so good.' Do what she would, there was eagerness in her tone. Remarking this, I decided to give another and closer look at the floor and the nails. I found the latter had not been properly inserted, or, rather, there were two indentions for each nail, a deep one and a quite shallow. This caused me to make some examinations of the others, those which had not been drawn up from the floor, and I found that one or two of them were equally insecure, but not all, only those about this one corner. Mrs. Carew, who had paused, confused and faltering in the doorway, in her dismay at seeing me engaging in this inspection, instead of replacing the rug as I had proposed, now advanced a step, so that our glances met as I looked up with the remark, "'This rug seems to have been lately raised at this corner. Do you know if the police had it up?' "'I don't. I believe so.' "'Oh, Mr. Trevitt!' she cried, as I rose to my feet with the corner of the rug in my hand. "'What are you going to do?' She had run forward impetuously, and was now standing very close beside me, inconveniently close. "'I am going to raise this rug,' I informed her. "'That is, just at this corner. "'Pardon me, I shall have to ask you to move.' "'Certainly, of course,' she stammered. "'Oh, what is going to happen now?' "'Then, as she watched me, "'there is, there is something under it, "'a door in the floor. "'Ah, uh, ah, uh, Mrs. O'Cumpa never told me of this.' "'Do you suppose she knew it?' I inquired, "'looking up into her face, "'which was very near, but not near enough "'to be in the full light of the lantern, "'which was pointed another way.' "'This rug appears to have been almost sluttered to the floor everywhere but here. "'There! It is thrown back. "'Now, if you will be so very good as to hold the lantern, I will try and lift the door. "'I cannot. See how my hands shake? What are we about to discover? "'Nothing, I pray. Nothing. Suspense would be better than that.' "'I think you will be able to hold it,' I urged, pressing the lantern upon her. "'Yes, I have never been devoid of courage. "'But, but don't ask me to descend with you,' she prayed as she lifted the lantern, "'and turned it dexterously enough on that portion of the door, "'where a ring lay outlined in the depths of its outermost plank. "'I will not, but you will come just the same. "'You cannot help it,' I hazarded, "'as with the point of my knife-blade I lifted the small round of wood, "'which filled into the ring and thus made the floor level.' "'Now if this door is not locked, we will have it up,' I cried, pulling at the ring with a will. The door was not locked, and it came up readily enough, discovering some half-dozen steps down which I immediately proceeded to climb. "'Oh, I cannot stay here alone,' she protested, and prepared to follow me in haste, just as I expected her to do the moment she saw the light withdrawn. "'Step carefully,' I enjoined if you will honor me with your hand. But she was at my side before the words were well out. What is it? What kind of place do you make it out to be? And is there anything here you, you do not want to see? I flashed the light around, and incidentally on her. She was not trembling now. Her cheeks were blazing red, and her eyes were blazing. She was looking at me, and not at the darksome place about her. But, as this was natural, 
it being a woman's way to look for what she desires to learn in the face of the man, who was at the moment her protector. I shifted the light into the nooks and corners of the low, damp cellar in which we now found ourselves. Bins for wine and beer, I observed, but nothing in them. Then, as I measured the space before me with my eye, it runs under the whole of the house. See, it is much larger than the room above. Yes, she mechanically repeated. I lowered the lantern to the floor, but quickly raised it again. What is that on the other side? I queried. I am sure there is a break in the wall, over in that corner. I cannot see, she gasped. Certainly she was very much frightened. Are you going to cross the floor? Yes, and if you do not wish to follow me, sit down on those steps. No, I will go where you go, but this is very fearful. Why, what is the matter? I had stepped aside in order to avoid a trail of footprints I saw, extending across the cellar floor. Come around this way, I urged. If you will follow me, I will keep you from being too much frightened. She did as I told her. Softly her steps fell in behind mine, and thus with wary tread and peering eyes we made our way to the remote end, where we found, or rather where I found, that the break which I had noticed in the uniformity of the wall was occasioned by a pile of old boxes, arranged so as to make steps up to a hole cut through the floor above. With a sharp movement I wheeled upon her. Do you see that? I asked, pointing back over my shoulder. Steps! she cried, going up into that part of the building where... where... Will you attempt them with me, or will you stay here in the darkness? I... We'll stay here. It was said with a shortened breath, but she seemed less frightened than when we started across the cellar. At all events, a fine look of daring had displaced the tremulous aspect which had so changed the character of her countenance a few minutes before. I will make short work of it, I assured her, as I hastily ran up the steps. Drop your face into your hands, and you will not be conscious of the darkness. Besides, I will talk to you all the time. There, I have worked my way up through the hole. I have placed my lantern on the floor, above, and I see... What? Are you coming? Yes, I am coming. Indeed, she was close behind me, maintaining her footing on the toppling boxes by a grip on my disengaged arm. Can you see? I asked. Wait, let me pull you up. We might as well stand on the floor as on these boxes. Climbing into the room above, I offered her my hand, and in another moment we stood together in the noisome precincts of that abominable spot, with whose doleful story she had just made me acquainted. A square of impenetrable gloom confronted me at first glance. What might not be the result of a second? I turned to consult the appearance of the lady beside me before I took this second look. Had she the strength to stand this ordeal? Was she much moved, or possibly more moved than myself? As a woman, and the intimate friend of the Ocumpas, she should be. But I could not perceive that she was. For some reason, once in view of this mysterious place, she was strangely, inexplicably, impassably calm. "'Can you bear it?' I queried. "'I must only end it quickly.' "'I will,' I replied, and I held out my lantern." I am not a superstitious man, but instinctively I looked up before I looked about me. I have no doubt that Mrs. Carew did the same. But no stains were to be seen on those blackened boards now, or rather they were dark with one continuous stain, and next moment I examined with eager scrutiny the place itself. Accustomed to the appearance of the cheerful and well-furnished room on the other side of the partition, it was a shock to me, I will not say what it was to her, to meet the bare decaying walls and mouldering of this dismal hole. True, we had just come from a description of the place in all the neglect of its many years of desolation, yet the smart finish of the open portion we had just left poorly prepared us for what we here encountered. But the first impression over, an impression which was to recur to me many a night afterward in dreams. 
I remembered the near and more imperative cause which had drawn us thither, and turning the light into each and every corner, I looked eagerly for what I so much dreaded to find. A couch to which some old cushions still clung stood against the far wall. Thank God it was empty. So were all the corners of the room. Nothing living and nothing dead. Turning quickly upon Mrs. Carew, I made haste to assure her that our fears were quite unfounded. But she was not even looking my way. Her eyes were on the ground, and she seemed merely waiting, in some impatience evidently, but merely waiting for me to finish and be gone. This was certainly odd, for the place was calculated in itself to rouse curiosity, especially in one who knew its story. A table, thick with dust and blurred with dampness, still gave tokens of bygone festivity, among which a bottle and some glasses stood conspicuous. Cards were there, too, dingy and green with mold, some on the tables, some on the floor, while the open lid of a small desk pushed up close to a bookshelf, full of books, still held a rusty pen, and the remnants of what looked like the mouldering sheets of unused paper. As for the rest, desolation, neglect, horror, but no child. The relief was enormous. It is a dreadful place, I exclaimed, but it might have been worse. Do you want to see things nearer? Shall we cross the floor? No, no, we have not found Gwendolen. Let us go. Oh, let us go! A thrill of feeling had crept into her voice. Who could wonder? Yet I was not ready to humor her very natural sensibilities by leaving so abruptly. The floor interested me. The cushions of that old couch interested me. The sawn boards surrounding the hole, indeed, many things interested me. We will go in a moment, I assured her. But first, cast your eyes along the floor. Don't you see that someone has preceded us here, and that not so very long ago? Someone with dainty feet and a skirt that fell on the ground, in short, a woman and a lady. I don't see, she faltered, very much frightened. Then quickly, show me, show me. I pointed out the marks in the heavy dust along the neglected floor. They were unmistakable. Oh, she cried, what it is to be a detective. But who could have been here? Who would want to be here? I think it is horrible myself, and if I were alone I should faint from terror and the close air. We will not remain much longer, I assured her, going straight to the couch. I do not like it either, but... What have you found now? Her voice seemed to come from a great distance behind me. Was this on account of the state of her nerves or mine? I am willing to think the latter, for at that moment my eye took in two unexpected details. A dent as of a child's head in one of the mangy sofa pillows, and a crushed bit of colored sugar, which must once have been a bit of choice confectionery. Someone besides a lady has been here, I decided, pointing to the one and bringing back the other. See, this bit of candy is quite fresh. You must acknowledge that. This was not walled up years ago with the rest of the things we see about us. Her eyes stared at the sugary morsel I held out toward her in my open palm. Then she made a sudden rush, which took her to the side of the couch. Gwendolen, here? she moaned. Gwendolen, here? Yes, I began. Do not but she had already left the spot and was backing toward the opening up which we had come. As she met my eye, she made a quick turn and plunged below. I must have air, she gasped. With a glance at the floor over which she had so rapidly passed, I hastily followed her, smiling grimly to myself. Intentionally or unintentionally, she had by this quick passage to and fro, effectually confused, if not entirely obliterated, those evidences of a former intrusion, which, with misguided judgment, I had just pointed out to her. 
but recalling the still more perfect line of footprints left below, to which I had not called her attention, I felt that I could afford to ignore the present mishap. As I reached the cellar bottom I called to her, for she was already halfway across. "'Did you notice where the boards have been sawed?' I asked. "'The sawdust is still on the floor, and it smells as fresh as if the saw had been at work there yesterday.' "'No doubt, no doubt,' she answered back over her shoulder, still hurrying on, so that I had to run lest she should attempt the steps in the utter darkness. When I reached the floor of the bungalow, she was in the open door, panting. I watched her with one eye. I drew back the trap into place and replaced the rug and the three nails I had loosened. Then I shut the slide of the lantern and joined her where she stood. "'Do you feel better?' I asked. It was a dismal quarter of an hour. But it was not a lost one. She drew the door to and locked it before she answered. Then it was with a question. "'What do you make of all this, Mr. Trevitt?' I replied as directly as the circumstances demanded. "'Madam, it is a startling answer to the question you put me before we first left your house. You asked then if the child in the wagon was Gwendolen. How could it have been she, with this evidence before us, of her having been concealed here, at the very time that wagon was being driven away from—' "'I do not think you have reason enough,' she began, and stopped and did not speak again until we halted at the foot of her own porch. Then, with the frank accent most in keeping with her general manner, however much I might distrust both accent and manner, she added as if no interval had intervened, If those signs you noted are proofs to you that Gwendolen was shut up in that walled-off portion of the bungalow while some were seeking her in the water and others in the wagon, then where is she now? End of chapter 12。Chapter 13 of The Millionaire Baby。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green。Chapter 13 。We shall have to begin again。It was a leading question which I was not surprised to see accompanied by a very sharp look from beneath the cloudy wrap she had wound about her head. "'You suspect some one, or some thing,' continued Mrs. Carew, with a return of the indefinable manner which had characterized her in the beginning of our interview. "'Whom? What?' "'I should have liked to answer her candidly, and in the spirit, if not the words, of the prophet of old, but her womanliness disarmed me. With her eyes on me I could get no further than a polite acknowledgment of defeat. "'Mrs. Carew, I am all at sea.' "'We shall have to begin again.' "'Yes,' she answered like an echo. "'Was it sadly or gladly? "'You will have to begin again.' "'Then with a regretful accent, "'and I cannot help you, "'for I am going to sail to-morrow. "'I positively must go. "'Cablegrams from the other side hurry me. "'I shall have to leave Mrs. Ocumpa "'in the midst of her distress. "'And what time does your steamer sail, Mrs. Carew?' "'at five o'clock in the afternoon from the Cunard docks. "'Nearly sixteen hours from now. "'Perhaps fate, or my efforts, "'will favor us before then with some solution "'of this disheartening problem. "'Let us hope so.' "'A quick shudder to hide which she was reaching out her hand, "'when the door behind us opened "'and a colored girl looked out. "'Instantly, and with the slightest possible loss of self-possession, "'Mrs. Carew turned to motion the intruder back.' when the girl suddenly blurted out. "'Oh, Mrs. Carew, Harry is so restless. He is sleepy,' he says. "'I will be up instantly. Tell him that I will be up instantly.' Then, as the girl disappeared, she added, with a quick smile, "'You see, I haven't any toys for him. Not being a mother, I forgot to put them in his trunk.' As though in response to these words, the maid again showed herself in the doorway, "'Oh, Mrs. Carew!' she eagerly exclaimed. "'There is a little toy in the hall here, brought over by Mrs. Ocumpa's maid. "'The girl said that hearing that the little boy fretted, "'Mrs. Ocumpa had picked out one of her little girl's playthings "'and sent it over with her love. "'It's a little horse, ma'am, 
with a curly mane and a long tail. I am sure twill please Master Harry. Mrs. Carew turned upon me, a look brimming with feeling. What thoughtfulness, what self-control, she cried. Take up the horse, Dinah. It was one of Gwendolen's favorite playthings, she explained to me as the girl vanished. I did not answer. I was hearing again in my mind that desolate cry of, Philo, 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 which an hour or so before had rung down from Mrs. Ocumpaugh's open window. There had been a wildness in the tone, which spoke of a tossing head on a feverish pillow, certainly an irreconcilable picture with the one just suggested by Mrs. Carew, of the considerate friend sending out the toys of her lost one to a neighbor's peevish child. Mrs. Carew appeared to notice the preoccupation with which I lingered on the lower step. "'You like children?' she hazarded. "'Or have you interested yourself in this matter purely from business reasons?' "'Business reasons were sufficient,' was my guarded reply. "'But I like children very much. "'I should be most happy if I could see this little Harry of yours nearer. "'I have only seen him from a distance, you know.' "'She drew back a step. "'Then she met my look squarely in the moonlight.' Her face was flushed, but I attempted no apology for a presumption which could have but one excuse. I meant that she should understand me, if I did not her. "'You must love children,' she remarked, but not with her usual correctness of tone. Then, before I could attempt an answer to the implied sarcasm, a proud light came into her eyes, and with a gracious bend of her fine figure, she met my look with one equally as frank, and cheerfully declared, "'You shall. Come early in the morning.' In another moment she had vanished inside and closed the door. I was defeated for the nonce, or else she was all she appeared to be, and I a dreaming fool. End of chapter 13《ハッピーバースデー》ミニバージョンが入っているのでこれが私の本日のメインメニューです。ハッピーバースデー・ミニバージョン、エスピアナージュ。私は少し遅くに出てきて、問題を持っていると思っていたのですが、それは少し大きな問題だったのです。彼女は本当に真実だったのですか、それは私の the scheming, unprincipled abductor of Gwendolen Ocumpaugh. She looked true, sometimes acted so, but I had heard and seen what would arouse any man's suspicion. And though I was not in a position to say, Mrs. Carew, this was not your first visit to that scene of old tragedy. You have been there before, and with Gwendolen in your arms. I was morally certain that this was so, that Mrs. Ocumpaugh's most trusted friend was responsible for the disappearance of her child, and I was not quite sure that the child was not now under her very roof. It was very late by this time, but I meant, if possible, to settle some of these doubts before I left the neighborhood of the cottage. How? By getting a glimpse of Mrs. Carew with her mask off, in the company of the child, if I could compass it? If not, then entirely alone with her own thoughts, plans, and subtleties. It was an act more in line with my partner's talents than my own, but I could not afford to let this deter me. I had had my chance with her face to face. For many hours I had been in her company. I had seen her in her various stages of emotion, sometimes real, sometimes assumed, but at no moment had I been sure of her, possibly because at no moment had she been sure of me. In our first visit to the bungalow, in her own little library, during the reading of that engrossing tale, by which she had so evidently attempted to lull my suspicions awakened by her one irrepressible show of alarm on the scene of Gwendolen's disappearance, and afterwards when she saw that they might be so lulled but not dispelled, in the cellar, and above all, in that walled-off room where we had come across the signs of Gwendolen's presence, which even she could not disavow, she had felt my eyes upon her, 
and had made me conscious that she had so felt them. Now she must believe them removed, and if I could but gain the glimpse I speak of, I should see this woman as she was. I thought I could manage this. I had listened to the maid's steps as she returned up the stairs, and I believe I knew in what direction they had tended after she reached the floor above. I would just see if one of the windows on the south side was lighted, and if so, if it was in any way accessible. To make my way through the shrubbery, without rousing the attention of any one inside or out, required a circumspection that tried me greatly. But, by dint of strong self-control, I succeeded in getting to the vantage place I sought, without attracting attention, or causing a single window to fly up. This reassured me, and, perceiving a square of light in the dark mass of wall before me, I peered amongst the trees overlooking this part of the building, for one I could climb without too much difficulty. The one which looked most feasible was a maple with low-growing branches, and, throwing off my coat, I was soon halfway to its top, and on a level, or nearly so, with the window on which I had fixed my eye. There were no curtains to this window, the house being half dismantled in anticipation of Mrs. Carew's departure, but it was still protected by a shade, and this was drawn down nearly to the ledge. But not quite. A narrow space intervened which, to an eye placed where mine was, offered a peephole of more or less satisfactory proportions, and this space I soon saw, widened perceptibly from time to time as the wind caught at the shade and blew it in. With utmost caution I shifted my position, till I could bring my eye fairly in line with the interior of this room, and finding that the glimpse given revealed little but a blue wall and some snowy linen, I waited for a breeze to blow that I might see more. It came speedily, and in a gust which lifted the shade and thus disclosed the whole inside of the room. It was an instantaneous glimpse, but in that moment the picture projected upon my eye satisfied me that, despite my doubts, despite my causes for suspicion, I had been doing this woman the greatest injustice in supposing that her relation to the child she had brought into her home were other than she had made out. She had come up as she had promised, and had seated herself on the bed with her face turned toward the window. I could thus catch its whole expression— an expression this time involuntary and natural as the feelings which prompted it. The child, with his newly obtained toy clutched in one hand, knelt on the coverlet with his head pressed against her breast, saying his prayers. I could hear his soft murmur, though I could not catch the words. But sweet as was the sight of his little white-clad form burying his head, with its mass of dusky curls, against the breast which he most confided, it was not this alone which gave to the moment its most sacred character. It was the rapturous look with which Mrs. Carew gazed down on his little head, the mother look, which admits of nothing false, and which, when once seen on a woman's face, whether she be mother in fact or mother only in heart, idealizes her in the mind forever. Eloquent with love and holy devotion, the scene flashed upon my eyes for only a moment and was gone. But that moment made its impression, and settled for good and all the question with which I had started upon this venture. She was the true woman, and I was the dreaming fool. As I realized this, I also realized that three days out of the seven were gone. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of a Millionaire Baby》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Millionaire Baby》by Anna K. Green Chapter Fifteen A Phantasm I certainly had every right to conclude that this would end my adventures for the day, but I soon found that I was destined to have yet another experience before returning to my home in New York. The weather had changed during the last hour, and at the moment I emerged from the shadows of the hedgerow into the open space fronting the Ocampa dock, a gleam of lightning shot across the west, 
and by it I saw what looked like a dusky figure of a man leaning against a pile at the extreme right end of the boathouse. Something in the immobility maintained by this figure, in face of the quick flashes which from time to time lit up the scene, reminded me of the presence I had come upon hours before in front of Mrs. Carew's house, and moved by the instinct of my calling, I took advantage of the few minutes yet remaining before train time to make my way in its direction, cautiously, of course, and with due allowance for the possible illumination following those fitful bursts of light which brought everything to view in one moment, only to plunge it all back into the profoundest obscurity the next. I had two motives for my proceeding. One, as I say, sprang from the natural instinct of investigation. The other was kindlier and less personal. I did not understand the meaning of the posture which this person had now assumed nor did I like it. Why should this man, why should any man, stand like this at the dead of night, staring into waters, which, if they had their tale to tell, had not told it yet, unless his interest in the story read there was linked with emotions such as it was my business to know? For those most openly concerned in Gwendolen's loss, the search had ceased. Why, then, this lone and lingering watch on the part of one who might, for all I knew, be some overzealous detective, but who I was rather inclined to believe was a person much more closely concerned in the child's fate, vis-à-vis -vis the next heir-in-law, Mr. Rathbone? If it were he, his presence there savored of mystery, or it savored of the tragic. The latter seemed the more likely hypothesis, judging from the expression of his face, as seen by me under the lantern. It behooved me then to approach him, but to approach him in the shadow of the boathouse. What passed in the next few minutes seemed to me unreal and dreamlike. I was tired, I suppose, and so more than usually susceptible. Night had no unfamiliar effects for me, even night on the borders of this great river, nor was my occupation a new one, or the expectation I felt, as fearful and absorbing as that with which, an hour or two before, I had raised my lantern in that room in which the doleful mystery of half a century back trenched upon the still more moving mystery of to-day. Yet that experience had the sharpness of fact, while this had only the vagueness of a phantasm. I was very near him, but the lightning had ceased to flash, and I found it impossible to discern whether or not the form I had come there to identify yet lingered in its old position against the pile. I therefore awaited the next gleam with great anxiety, an anxiety only partially alleviated by the certainty I felt of hearing the faint, scarcely recognizable sound of his breathing. Had the storm passed over? Would no more flashes come? Ah, he is moving. That is a sigh I hear. No detective's exclamation of impatience, but a sufferer's sigh of depression or remorse. What was in the man's mind? A steamboat or some equally brilliantly illuminated craft was passing, far out in the channel. The shimmer of its lights gave sudden cheer to the distant prospect, the churning of its paddles suggesting life and action, and irresistibly drew my eyes that way. Would he follow? Would I find his attitude changed? Ah, the long-delayed flash has come and gone. He is standing there yet, but no longer in an attitude of contemplation. On the contrary, he is bending over the waters, searching with eager aspect, where so many had searched before him, and, in the instant, as his face and form leaped into sight, I beheld his clenched right hand fall on his breast, and heard on his lips the one word, Guilty. End of chapter 15chapter 16 of the millionaire baby this librivox recording is in the public domain the millionaire baby by anna k green chapter 16 an all conquering beauty i was one of the first to procure and read a new york paper next morning 
Would I discover in the columns any hint of the preceding day's events in Yonkers, which, if known, must forever upset the wagon theory? No, that secret was still my secret, only shared by the doctor, who, so far as I understood him, had no intention of breaking his self-imposed silence, till his fears of some disaster to the little one had received confirmation. I had, therefore, several hours before me yet for free work. The first thing I did was to hunt up Miss Graham. She met me with eagerness, an eagerness I found it difficult to dispel with my disappointing news in regards to Dr. Poole. "'He is not the man,' said I. "'Can you think of any other?' She shook her head, her large grey eyes, showing astonishment, and what I felt bound to regard as an honest bewilderment. "'I wish to mention a name,' said I. "'One I know?' she asked. "'Yes.' "'I know of no other person capable of wrongdoing that child.' "'You are probably right, but there is a gentleman, one interested in the family, a man with something to gain. "'Mr. Rathbone, you must not mention him in any such connection. "'He is one of the best men I know. "'Kind, good, and oh so sensitive.' A dozen fortunes wouldn't tempt a man of his stamp to do any one living a wrong, let alone a little innocent child. I know, but there are other temptations greater than money to some men, infinitely greater to one as sensitive as you say he is. What if he loved a woman? What if his only hope of winning her? You must not think that of him, she again interposed. Nothing could make a villain of him. I have seen him too many times in circumstances which show a man's good character. He is good through and through, and in all that concerns Gwendolen honorable to the core. I once saw him save her life at the risk of his own. You did? When? Years ago? No, lately, within the last year. Tell me the circumstances. She did. They were convincing. As I listened, the phantasm of the night before assumed fainter and fainter proportions. When she had finished, I warmly remarked that I was glad to hear the story of so heroic an act. And I was, not that I ascribed too deep a significance to the word which had escaped Mr. Rathbone on the dock, but because I was glad to have my instinctive confidence in the man verified by facts. It seemed to clear the way before me. "'Ellie,' said I, it seemed both natural and proper to call her by that name now. "'What explanation would you give if under the circumstances, "'all circumstances are possible, you know, "'you heard this gentleman speak of feeling guilty in connection with Gwendolyn Ocumpa?' "'I should have to know the circumstances,' was her quiet answer. "'Let me imagine some. "'Say that it was night, late night, at an hour when the most hardened among us are in a particularly responsive condition. Say that he had been spending hours near the house of the woman he had long loved, but had quite despaired of winning in his greatly hampered condition, and with the fever of this longing upon him, but restrained by emotions of the nature which we cannot surmise, had now found his way down to the river to the spot where the boats have clustered, and men crouched in the gruesome and unveiling search we know of. Say that he hung there long over the water, gazing down in silence, in solitude, alone, as he thought, with his own conscience and the suggestions offered by that running stream where some still think, despite facts, despite all the probabilities, that Gwendolen had found rest, and when his heart was full, should be seen to strike his breast and utter with a quick turn of his face up the hill this one word, guilty. What would I think? This, that being overwrought by the struggle you mention, a struggle we can possibly understand when we consider the unavoidable consciousness which must be his, of the great change which would be effected in all his prospects, if Gwendolen should not be found, he gave the name of guilt to feelings which some would call simply human. Ellie, you are an oracle. 
This thought of hers had been my thought ever since I had time really to reflect upon the matter. I wonder if you will have an equally wise reply to give to my next question. I cannot say from my intuition I am really not wise. Intuition is above wisdom. Does your intuition tell you that Mrs. Carew is the true friend she professes to be to Mrs. Ocumpa? Ah, that is a different thing. The clear brow I loved, there. How words escape a man, lost its smoothness, and her eyes took on a troubled aspect while her words came slowly. I do not know how to answer that offhand. Sometimes I have felt that her very soul was knit to that of Mrs. Ocumpa, and again I have had my doubts. But never deep ones, never any such as would make it easy for me to answer the question you have just put me. Was her love for Gwendolen sincere? I asked. Oh, yes, oh, yes. That is, I always thought so, and with no qualification till something in her conduct when she first heard of Gwendolen's disappearance, I cannot describe it, gave me a sense of disappointment. She was shocked, of course, and she was grieved, but not hopelessly so. There was something lacking in her manner, we all felt it. Mrs. Ocumpa felt it, and let her dear friend go the moment she showed the slightest inclination to do so. "'There were excuses for Mrs. Carew, just at that time,' said I. "'You forget the new interest which had come into her life. "'It was natural that she should be preoccupied.' "'With thoughts of her little nephew,' replied Miss Graham. "'True, true. "'But she had been so fond of Gwendolen, and you would have thought. "'But why all this talk of Mrs. Carew? "'You don't believe. "'Surely you cannot believe.' "'that Mrs. Carew is a charming woman. "'Oh, yes, but I do. "'Mr. Rathbone shows good taste. "'Ah, is she the one? "'Did you not know it? "'No, yet I have seen them together many times. "'Now I understand much that had always been a mystery to me. "'He never pressed his suit. "'He loved, but he never harassed her. "'Oh, he is a good man. "'This with emphasis.' Is she a good woman? Miss Graham's eyes suddenly fell, then rose again until they met mine fully and frankly. I have no reason, said she, to believe her otherwise. I have never seen anything in her to hinder my esteem, only... Finish that only. She does not appeal to me, as many less gifted women do. Perhaps I'm secretly jealous of the extreme fondness Gwendolen has always shown for her. If so, the fault is in me, not in her. What I said in reply is not germane to this story. After being assured by a few more discreet inquiries in some other perfectly safe quarters that Miss Graham's opinion of Mr. Rathbone was shared by those who beat knew him, I returned to the one spot most likely to afford me a clue to, if not an explanation of, this elusive mystery. What did I propose to myself? First, to revisit Mrs. Carew and make the acquaintance of the boy Harry. I no longer doubted his being just what she called him, but she had asked me to call for this purpose, and I had no excuse for declining the invitation, even if I had desired to do so afterward, but first let us finish with Mrs. Carew. As she entered her reception room that morning, she looked so bright, that is, with the instinctive brightness of a naturally vivacious temperament, that I wondered if I had been mistaken in my thought that she had had no sleep all that night, simply because many of the lights in her house had not been put out till morning but as inspection of her face revealed lines of care which only her smile could efface, and she was not quite ready for smiles, affable and gracious as she showed herself. Her first words, just as I expected, were, "'There is nothing in the papers about the child in the wagon. "'No, everything does not get into the papers. "'Will what we saw and what we found in the bungalow last night?' I hardly think so. 
This is our own special clue, Mrs. Carew, if it is a clue. You seem to regard it as such. With a shrug, I declared that we had come upon a mystery of some kind. But the child is not dead. That you feel demonstrated. Or don't you? As I said last night, I do not know what to think. Ah, is that the little boy? Yes, she gaily responded, as the glad step of a child was heard descending the stairs. Harry! Come here, Harry! she cried, with a joyous accent which a child's presence seemed to call out in some women. Here is a gentleman who would like to shake hands with you. A sprite of a child entered, a perfect sunbeam irradiating the whole room. If, under the confidence induced by the vision I had had of him on his knees the night before, any suspicion remained in my mind of his being Gwendolyn Ocumpa in disguise, it vanished at the sight of the fearless head, lifted high in boyish freedom, and the gay swish-swish of the whip in his nervous little hand. "'Harry is playing horse!' he cried, galloping toward me in what he evidently considered true jockey-style. I made a gesture and stopped him. "'How do you do, little man? What did you say your name is?' "'Harry,' this very stoutly. "'Harry what? Harry Carew?' "'No, Harry, just Harry. And how do you like it here?' "'I like it, I like it better than my old home. Where was your old home?' "'I don't know. I didn't like it. He was with uncongenial people, and he is very sensitive, put in Mrs. Carew softly. I like it here, he repeated, and I like the big ocean. I am going on the ocean, and I like horses. Get up, Dandy, and he cracked his whip and was off again on his imaginary trot. I felt very foolish over the doubts I had so openly evinced. This was not only a boy to the marrow of his bones, but he was, as any eye could see, the near relative she called him. In my embarrassment I rose. At all events I soon found myself standing near the door with Mrs. Carew. A fine fellow, I enthusiastically exclaimed, and startlingly like you in expression. He is your nephew, I believe? Yes, she replied somewhat wistfully, I thought. I felt that I should apologize for, well, perhaps for the change she must have discerned in my manner. The likeness caused me a shock. I was not prepared for it, I suppose. She looked at me wonderingly. I have never heard anyone speak of it before. I am glad that you see it. And she seemed glad, very glad but I know that for some reason she was gladder yet when I turned to depart. However, she did not hasten me. "'What are you going to do next?' she inquired as she courteously led the way through the piles of heaped boxes and baskets, the number of which had rather grown than diminished since my visit the evening before. Pardon my asking. "'Resort to my last means,' said I. "'See and talk with Mrs. Ocumpa.' An instant of hesitation on her part, so short, however, that I could hardly detect it. Then she declared, "'But you cannot do that.' "'Why not?' "'She is ill. I am sure that they will let no one approach her. One of her maids was in this morning. She did not even ask me to come over.' "'I am sorry,' said I, "'but I shall make the effort.' The illness which affects Mrs. Ocumpa can best be cured by the restoration of her child. "'But you have not found Gwendolen,' she replied. "'No, but I have discovered footprints on the dust of the bungalow floor, and, as you know, a bit of candy which looks as if it had been crushed in a sleeping child's hand, and I am in need of every aid possible in order to make the most of these discoveries.' They may point the way to Gwendolen's present whereabouts, and they may not, but they shall be given every chance. Whoop! Get up! Get up! broke in a childish voice from the upper landing. Am I not right? I asked. Always. Only, 
I am sorry for Mrs. Ocumpaugh. May I tell you, as I laid my hand upon the outer doorknob, just how to approach her? Certainly, if you would be so good. I would not ask for Miss Porter. Ask for Celia. She is Mrs. Ocumpaugh's special maid. Let her carry your message if you feel that it will do any good to disturb her. Thank you. The recommendation is valuable. Good morning, Mrs. Carew. I may not see you again. May I wish you a safe journey? Certainly. Are we not almost friends? Why did I not make my bow and go? There was nothing more to be said, at least by me. Was I held by something in her manner? Doubtless, for while I was thus reasoning with myself, she followed me out onto the porch, and with some remark as to the beauty of the morning, led me to an opening in the vines whence a fine view could be caught of the river. But it was not for the view she had brought me there. This was evident enough from her manner, and soon she paused in her observations of the beauties of nature, and with a strange ringing emphasis, for which I was not altogether prepared, remarked with feeling, I may be making a mistake. I was always an unconventional woman, but I think you ought to know something about Mrs. Ocumpaugh's private history before you see her. It's not a common one, at least its romantic elements, and an acquaintance with some of its features is almost necessary to you if you expect to approach her on so delicate a matter with any hope of success. But perhaps you are better informed on this subject than I supposed. Detectives are a mine of secret intelligence, I am told. Possibly you have already learned from some other source the story of her marriage and homecoming to Homewood, and the particular circumstances around her early married life? No, I disclaimed in great relief, and I have no doubt with unnecessary vivacity. On the contrary, I have never heard anything said in regard to it. Would you like to? Men have not the curiosity of women, and I do not wish to bore you. But I see that I shall not do that, she exclaimed. Sit down, Mr. Trevitt. I shall not detain you long. I have not much time myself. As she sank into a chair in saying this, I had no alternative but to follow her example. I took pains, however, to choose one which brought me into the shadow of the vines, for I felt some embarrassment at this new turn in conversation, and was conscious that I should have more or less difficulty in hiding my only too intense interest in all that concerned the lady of whom we were speaking. Mrs. Ocumpaugh was a western woman, Mrs. Carew began softly, the oldest of five daughters. There was not much money in the family, but she had beauty, all commanding, all conquering beauty, not the beauty you see in her today, but the exquisite, pervasive loveliness which seizes upon the imagination as well as moves the heart. I have a picture of her at eighteen, but never mind that. Was it affection for her friend which made Mrs. Carew's always rich voice so very mellow? I wished I knew, but I was successful, I think, in keeping that wish out of my face, and preserving my manner of the simply polite listener. Mr. Ocumpaugh was on a hunting trip, she proceeded, after a slight glance my way. He had travelled the world over and seen beautiful women everywhere, but there was something in Marian Allison which he had found in no other, and at the end of their first interview he determined to make her his wife. A man of impulses, but also a man of steady resolution, Mr. Trevitt. Perhaps you know this? I bowed. A strong man, I remarked. And a romantic one. He had this intention from the first, as I have said, but he wished to make himself sure of her heart. He knew how his advantages counted, how hard it is for a woman to disassociate the man from his belongings, and, having a spirit of some daring, he resolved that this Pearl of the West, so I have heard him call her, should marry the man and not his money. 
Was he as wealthy then as now? Almost. Possibly he was not quite such a power in the financial world, but he had Homewood in almost as beautiful a condition as now, though the new house was not put up till after his marriage. He courted her, not as the landscape painter of Tennyson's poems, but as a rising young businessman who had made his way sufficiently to give her a good home. This home he did not have to describe, since her own imagination immediately pictured it as much below the one she lived in. And he was years younger than her, hard-working father. Delighted with this naivete, he took pains not to disabuse her mind of the simple prospects with which she was evidently so well satisfied, and succeeded in marrying her, and bringing her as far as our station below there, without her having the least suspicion of the splendor she was destined for. And now, Mr. Trevitt, picture, if you can, the scene of that first arrival. I have heard it described by him, and I have heard it described by her. He was plainly dressed, so was she, and lest the surprise should come before the proper moment, he had brought her on a train little patronized by his friends, the sumptuousness of the solitary equipage standing at the depot platform must in consequence have struck her all the more forcibly, and when he turned and asked her if she did not admire this fine turnout, you can imagine the lovely smile with which she acknowledged its splendor, and then turned away to look up and down for the street car she expected to take with him to their new bridal home. He says that he caught her back with the remark that he was glad she liked it, because it was hers and many more like it. But she insisted that he did not say a word, only smiled in a way to make her see for whom the carriage door was being held open. Such was her entrance into wealth and love and, alas, into trouble. For the latter followed hard upon the two first. Mr. Ocumpaugh's mother, who had held sway at Homewood for thirty years or more, was hard as the nether millstone. She was a Rathbone, and had brought both wealth and aristocratic connections into the family. She had no sympathy for penniless beauties. She was a very plain woman herself, and made those first few years of her daughter-in-law's life as nearly miserable as any woman's can be who adores her husband. I have heard that it was a common experience for this sharp-tongued old lady to taunt her with the fact that she brought nothing into the family but herself, not even a towel. And when two years had passed and no child came, the biting criticisms became so frequent that a cloud fell over the young wife's sensitive beauty, which no after-happiness had ever succeeded in fully dispelling. Matters went better after Gwendolen came, but in reckoning up the possible defects in Mrs. Ocumpaugh's character, you should never forget the twist that may have been given to it by that mother-in-law. "'I have heard of Madame Ocumpaugh,' I remarked, rising, anxious to end an interview whose purport was more or less enigmatic to me. "'She is dead now, happily. A woman like that is accountable for much more than she herself ever realizes.' but one thing she never succeeded in doing. She never shook Mr. Ocumpaugh's love for his wife or hers for him. Whether it was the result of that early romantic episode of which I have spoken, or whether their natures are peculiarly congenial, the bond between them has always been one of exceptional strength and purity. It will be their comfort now, I remarked. Mrs. Carew smiled, but in a dubious way that added to my perplexity, and made me question more seriously than ever just what her motive had been in subjecting me to these very intimate reminiscences of one I was about to approach on an errand of whose purport she could have only a general idea. Had she read my innermost soul? Did she wish to save her friend or save herself? or even save me from the result of a blind use of such tools as were the only ones afforded me? Impossible to determine. 
She was at this present moment, as she had always been in fact, an insolvable problem to me, and it was not at this hurried time and with such serious work before me that I could venture to make any attempt to understand her. "'You will let me know of the outcome of your talk with Mrs. Ocumpaugh,' she cried, as I moved to the front of the porch. It was for me to look dubious now. I could make no such promise as that. "'I will let you know the instant there is any good news,' I assured her. And with that I moved off, but not before hearing the peremptory command with which she entered the house. "'Now, Dinah, quick!' Evidently, her preparations for departure were to be pushed. End of chapter 16「The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green, Chapter 17, in the Green Boudoir. So far in this narrative I have kept from the reader nothing but an old experience of which I was now to make use. The experience involved Mrs. Ocumpa, and was the cause of the confidence which I had felt from the first, in my ability to carry this search through to a successful termination. I believed that in some secret but as yet undiscovered way it offered a key to this tragedy. And I still believed this, little as I had hitherto accomplished, and blind as the way continued to look before me. Nevertheless it was with anything but a cheerful heart that I advanced that morning through the shrubbery toward the Ocumpa mansion. I dreaded the interview I had determined to seek. I was young, far too young, to grapple with the difficulties it involved, yet I saw no way of avoiding it, or of saving either Mrs. Ocumpa or myself from the suffering it involved. Mrs. Carew had advised that I should first seek the girl called Celia, but Mrs. Carew knew nothing of the real situation. I did not wish to see any girl. I felt that no such intermediary would answer in a case like this, nor did I choose to trust Miss Porter. Yet to Miss Porter alone could I appeal. The sight of a doctor's gig standing at the side door gave me my first shock. Mrs. Ocumpa was ill then, really ill. Yet if I came to make her better, I stood irresolute till I saw the doctor come out. Then I walked boldly up and asked for Miss Porter. Just what Mrs. Carew had advised me not to do. Miss Porter came. She recognized me, but only to express her sorrow that Mrs. Ocumpa was totally unfit to see anyone today. Not if he brings news. News? I have news, but of a delicate nature. I should like the privilege of imparting the same to Mrs. Ocumpa herself. Impossible. Excuse me, if I urge it. She cannot see you. The doctor who is just gone says that all hazards she must be kept quiet today. Won't Mr. Atwater do? Is it, is it good news? That Mrs. Ocumpa alone can say. See Mr. Atwater, I will call him. I have nothing to say to him. But, let me advise you, leave it to Mrs. Ocumpa. Take this paper up to her, it is only a sketch, and inform her that the person who drew it has something of importance to say either to her or to Mr. Atwater, and let her decide which it shall be. You may, if you wish, mention my name. I do not understand. You hold my credentials, said I, and smiled. She glanced at the paper I had placed in her hand. It was a folded one, fastened something like an envelope. I cannot conceive, she began. I did not scruple to interrupt her. Mrs. Ocumpa has a right to the privilege of seeing what I have sketched there, I said, with what impressiveness I could, though my heart was heavy with doubt. Will you believe that what I ask is for the best and take the envelope to her? It may mean the ultimate restoration of her child. This paper? Yes, Miss Porter. She did not try to hide her incredulity. I do not see how a picture, yet you seem very much in earnest, and I know that she has confidence in you, she and Mr. Ocumpa, too. 
I will take it to her if you can assure me that good will come of it, and no more false hopes to destroy the little courage she has left. I cannot promise that. I believe that she will wish to receive me and hear all that I have to say, after seeing what that envelope contains. That is as far as I can honestly go. It does not satisfy me. If it were not for the nearness of Mr. Ocumpaugh's return, I would have nothing to do with it. He must hear at Sandy Hook that some definite news has been received of his child. You are right, Miss Porter, he must. He idolized Gwendolen. He is a man of strong feelings, very passionate and much given to follow the impulse of the moment. If his suspense is not ended at the earliest possible instant, the result may be such as I dare not contemplate. I know it. That is why I have pushed matters to this point. You will carry that up to her? Yes, and if... No ifs. Lay it before her where she sits and come away. But not beyond call. You are a good woman. I see it on your face. Do not watch her as she unfolds this paper. Persons of her temperament do not like to have their emotions observed, and this will cause her emotion. That cannot be helped, Miss Porter. Sincerely and honestly I tell you that it is impossible for her best friends to keep her from suffering now. They can only strive to keep that suffering from becoming permanent. It is a hard task you have set me, complained the poor woman, but I will do what I can. Anything must be better for Mrs. Ocumpa than the suspense that she is laboring under now. Remember, I enjoined, with the full force of my secret anxiety, that no eye but hers must fall upon this drawing. Not that it would convey meaning to any one but herself, but because it is her affair and her affair only, and you are the woman to respect another person's affairs. She gave me a final scrutinizing look and left the room. God grant that I have made no mistake, was the inward prayer with which I saw her depart. My fervency was sincere. I was myself frightened at what I had done. And what had I done? Sent her a sketch drawn by myself of Dr. Poole and of his office. If it recalled to her, as I felt it must, the remembrance of a certain memorable visit she had once paid there, she would receive me. When Miss Porter re-entered some fifteen minutes later, I saw that my hazardous attempt had been successful. Come, she said, but with no cheerful alacrity, rather with an air of gloom. Was, was Mrs. Ocumpa very much disturbed by what she saw? I fear so. She was half asleep when I went in, dreaming as it seemed, and pleasantly. It was cruel to disturb her. Indeed, I had not the heart, so I just laid the folded paper near her hand and waited, but not too near, not within sight of her face. A few minutes later, interminable minutes to me, I heard the paper rattle, but I did not move. I was where she could see me, so she knew that she was not alone, and presently I caught the sound of a strange noise from her lips, then a low cry. Then the quick inquiry in sharper and more peremptory tones than I had ever heard from her before. Where did this come from? Who has dared to send me this? I advanced quickly. I told her about you and your desire to see her. How you had asked me to bring up this little sketch so that she would know that you had real business with her. That I regretted troubling her when she felt so weak, but that you promised revelations of some sort at which I thought she grew very pale. Are you quite convinced that you have news of sufficient importance to warrant the expectations you have raised in her? Let me see her, I prayed. She made a sign, and we both left the room. Mrs. Ocumpa awaited me in her own boudoir on the second floor. As we went up the main staircase, I was afforded short glimpses of room after room of varying richness and beauty, among them one so dainty and delicate in its coloring that I presumed to ask if it were that of the missing child. Miss Porter's look as she shook her head roused my curiosity. I should be glad to see her room, I said. 
She stopped, seemed to consider the matter for a moment, then advanced quickly and, beckoning me to follow, led me to a certain door which she quietly opened. One look and my astonishment became apparent. The room before me, while large and sunny, was as simple, I had almost said, as bare, as my sister's at home. No luxurious furnishings here, no draperies of silk and damask, no half-lights drawing richness from stained glass, no gleam of silver or sparkle of glass on bedecked dresser or carved mantel. Not even the tinted muslins I had seen in some nurseries but a plain set of furniture on a plain carpet, with but one real object of adornment within the four walls. That was a picture of the Madonna opposite the bed, and that was beautiful. But the frame was of the cheapest, a simple band of oak. Catching Miss Porter's eye as we quietly withdrew, I ventured to ask whose taste this was. The answer was short, and had a decided ring of disapproval in it. Her mother's, Mrs. Ocumpa believes in simple surroundings for children. Yet she dressed Gwendolen like a princess. Yes, for the world's eye, but in her own room she wore gingham aprons, which effectively covered up her ribbons and laces. The motive for all this was in a way evident to me, but somehow what I had just seen did not add to my courage for the coming interview. We stopped at the remotest door of this long hallway. As Miss Porter opened it, I summoned up all my nerve, and the next moment found myself standing in the presence of the imposing figure of Mrs. Ocumpa, drawn up in the embrasure of a large window overlooking the Hudson. It was the same window, doubtless, in which she had stood two nights before and a day, watching for some sign from the boats engaged in the dragging of the river-bed. Her back was to me, and she seemed to find it difficult to break away from her fixed attitude, for several minutes elapsed before she turned slowly around and showed me her face. When she did, I stood appalled. Not a vestige of color was to be seen on the cheek, lip, or brow. She was the beautiful Mrs. Ocampa still, but the heart which had sent the hues of life to her features was beating slow, slow, and the effect was heartbreaking to one who had seen her in her prime, and the full glory of her beauty as wife and mother. Pardon, I faltered out, bowing my head, as if before some powerful rebuke, though her lips were silent and her eyes pleading rather than accusing. Truly I had ventured far in daring to recall to this woman an hour which at this miserable time she preferably would have given her life to forget. Pardon, I repeated, with an even more humble intonation than before, for she did not speak and I hardly knew how to begin the conversation. Still, she said nothing, and at last I found myself forced to break the unbearable silence by some definite remark. I have presumed, I therefore continued, advancing but a step toward her, who made no advance at all, to send you a hurried sketch of one who says he knows you, that you might be sure I was not one of the many eager but irresponsible men who offer help in your great trouble, without understanding your history, or that of the little one whose seemingly unaccountable disappearance all are seeking a clue. My history! The words seemed forced from her, but no change in eye or look accompanied them, nor could I catch a motion of her lips, when she presently added in a faraway tone, inexpressibly affecting, Her history. Did he bid you say that? Dr. Poole? He has given me no commands other than to find the child. I am not here as an agent of his. I am here in Mr. Ocumpa's interest and your own. With some more knowledge, a little more knowledge than others have, perhaps, to aid me in the business of recovering this child. Madam, the police are seeking her in the holes and slums of the great city, and at the hands of desperate characters who make a living out of the terrors and griefs of the rich. But this is not where I should look for Gwendolen Ocumpa. 
I should look nearer, just as you have looked nearer, and I should use means which I am sure have not commended themselves to the police. These means you can doubtless put in my hands. A mother knows many things in connection with her child, which she neither thinks to impart nor would, under any ordinary circumstances, give up, especially to a stranger. I am not a stranger. You have seen me in Mr. Ocumpaugh's confidence. Will you then pardon me if I ask what may strike you as impertinent questions, but which may lead to the discovery of the motive, if not to the method of the little one's abduction? I do not understand. She was trying to shake off her apathy. I feel confused, sick, almost like one dying. How can I help? Haven't I done everything? I believe that she strayed to the river and drowned. I still believe her dead. Otherwise we should have news, real news, and we don't. We don't. The intensity with which she uttered the last two words brought a line of red into her gasping lips. She was becoming human, and for a minute I could not help drawing a comparison between her and her friend Mrs. Carew, as the latter had just appeared to me in her little half-denuded house on the other side of the hedgerow. Both beautiful, but owing their charms to quite different sources, I surveyed this woman, white against the pale green of the curtain before which she stood, and imperceptibly, but surely the glowing attractions of the gay-hearted widow, who had found a child to love, faded before the cold loveliness of this bereaved mother, wan with suffering and alive with terrors, of whose depths I could judge from the clutch with which she still held my little sketch. Meanwhile I had attempted some kind of answer to Mrs. Ocumpa's heart-rending appeal. We do not hear because she was not taken from you simply for the money her return would bring. Indeed, after hours of action and considerable thinking, I'm beginning to doubt if she was taken for money at all. Can you not think of some other motive? Do you not know of someone who wanted the child from love, let us say? Love. Did her lips frame it, or did I see it in her eyes? Certainly I heard no sound, yet I was conscious that she was repeating the word in her mind, if not aloud. I know I have startled you, I pursued, but pardon me, I cannot help my presumption. I must be personal. I must even go so far as to probe the wound I have made. You have a claim to Gwendolen, not to be doubted, not to be gainsaid. "'But isn't there someone else who is conscious of possessing certain claims also? "'I do not allude to Mr. Ocumpa. "'You mean some relative, aunt, cousin? "'She was fully human now and keenly alert. "'Mr. Rathbone, perhaps?' "'No, Mrs. Ocumpa, none of these.' "'Then, as the paper rattled in her hand, "'and I saw her eyes fall in terror on it, I said as calm and respectfully as I could, You have a secret, Mrs. Ocumpa. That secret I share. The paper trembled from her clasp and fell fluttering downward. I pointed at it and waited until our eyes met, possibly that I might give her some encouragement from my look, if not from my words. I was a boy in Dr. Poole's employ some five years ago, and one day... I paused. She had made me a supplicating gesture. "'Shall I not go on?' I finally asked. "'Give me a minute,' was her low entreaty. "'O oh God, O oh God, that I should have thought myself secure all these years, with two in the world knowing my fatal secret!' "'I learned it by accident,' I went on, when I saw her eye turning again on mine. On a certain night six years ago, I was in the office behind an old curtain. You remember the curtain hanging at the left of the doctor's table over that break in the bookshelves? I had no business there. I had been meddling with things which did not belong to me, 
and when I heard the doctor's step at the door, I was glad to shrink into this refuge and wait for an opportunity to escape. It did not come very soon. First he had one patient, then another. The last one was you. I heard your name and caught a glimpse of your face as you went out. It was a very interesting story you told him. I was touched by it, though I hardly understood. Oh, oh! She was swaying from side to side, swaying so heavily that I instinctively pushed her toward a chair. Sit, I prayed. You are not strong enough for this excitement. She glanced at me vaguely, shook her head, but made no move toward accepting the proffered chair. She submitted, however, when I continued to press it upon her, and I felt less a brute and hard-hearted monster when I saw her sitting with folded hands before me. "'I bring this up,' said I, "'that you may understand what I mean when I say that some one else, another woman, in fact, may feel her claim upon this child greater than yours.' "'You mean the real mother? Is she known? The doctor swore. I do not know the real mother. I only know that you are not.' that to win some toleration from your mother-in-law, to make sure of your husband's lasting love, you won the doctor over to a deception, which secured a seeming heir to the Acumpas. Whose child was given you is doubtless known to you. No, no! I stared at her aghast. What, you do not know? No, I did not wish to nor was she ever to know me or my name. Then this hope has also failed. I thought that in this mother we might find the child's abductor. End of chapter 17《The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green, Chapter 18. — You look as if, as if. — I had studiously avoided looking at her while these last few words passed between us. But as the silence which followed this final outburst continued, I felt forced to glance her way if only to see what my next move should be. I found her gazing straight at me, with a bright spot on either cheek, looking as if seared there by a red-hot iron. "'You are a detective,' she said, as our regards met. "'You have known this shameful secret always, "'yet you met my husband constantly and have never told. "'No, I saw no reason. "'Did you never? "'When you saw how completely my husband was deceived, "'how fortunes were bequeathed to Gwendolen, "'gifts lavished on her, "'her small self made almost an idol of, "'because all of our friends,' All our relatives saw in her a true Ocumpa. Think it wicked to hold your peace, and let this all go on as if she were the actual offspring of my husband and myself? No. I may have wondered at your happiness. I may have thought of the consequences, if ever he found out. But I dared not go on. The quick, the agonizing nerve of her grief and suffering had been touched and I myself quailed at the result. Stammering some excuse, I waited for her soundless anguish to subside. Then, when I thought she could listen, completed my sentence by saying, I did not allow my thoughts to stray quite so far, Mrs. Ocumpa. Not till my knowledge of your secret promised to be of use did I let it rise to any proportion in my mind. I had too much sympathy for your difficulties. I have to-day. This hint of comfort, perhaps, from the only source which could afford her any, seemed to move her. "'Do you mean that you are my friend?' she cried. "'That you would help me, if any help were possible, to keep my secret and end my husband's love?' I did not know how to dash the first spark of hope I had seen in her from the beginning of this more than painful interview. To avoid it— I temporized a trifle and answered with ready earnestness. I would do much, Mrs. Ocumpa, 
to make the consequences of your act as ineffective as possible and still be true to the interests of Mr. Ocumpaugh. If that child can be found, you wish that. You loved her? Oh, yes, I loved her. There was no mistaking the wistfulness of her tone. Too well, far too well, only my husband more. If you can find her, that is the first thing, isn't it? Yes. It was a faint rejoinder. I looked at her again. You do not wish her found, I suddenly declared. She started, rose to her feet, then suddenly sat again, as if she felt that she could not stand. What makes you say that? How dare you? How can you say that? My husband loves her. I love her. She is our own child. If not by birth, by every tie which endears a child to a parent. Has that wicked man... Dr. Poole, I put in, for she stopped, gasping. Yes, Dr. Poole, whom I wish to God I had never seen. Has he told you any such lies as that? The man who swore... I put out my hand to calm her. I feared for her reason, if not for her life. Be careful, I enjoined. Your walls are thick, but tones like yours are penetrating. Then, as I saw she would be answered, I replied to the question still alive in her face. No, Dr. Poole has not talked of it. I saw it in your own manner, madam. It, or something else. Perhaps it was something else, another secret which I have not shared. She moistened her lips and placed her two hands on the knobs of the chair in which she sat, leaning passionately forward. Who could say she was cold now? Who could see anything but a feeling heart in this woman, beautiful beyond all precedent in her passion and woe? It is, it was, a secret. I have to confess to the abnormal. The child did not love me, has never loved me. Lavish as I have been in my affection and caresses, she has never done aught but endure them. Though she believes me her own mother, she has shrunk from me with all the might of her nature from the very first. It was God's punishment for the lie by which I strove to make my husband believe himself the father, which in God's providence he was not. I have borne it, but my life has been a living hell. It was that you saw in my face, nothing else. I was bound to believe her. The child had made her suffer, but she was bent upon recovering her, of course. I dared not contemplate any other alternative. Her love for her husband precluded any other desire on her part. And so I admitted when after a momentary survey of the task yet before me I ventured to remark, then we find ourselves once more at the point from which we started. Where shall we look for his child, Mrs. Ocumpa? Perhaps it would aid us in deciding this question if you told me, sincerely told me, why you had such a strong belief in Gwendolen's having been drowned in the river. You did believe this. I saw you at the windows. You are not an actress like your friend. You expected to see her body drawn from those waters. For twenty-four hours you expected it, though everyone told you it was not possible. Why? She crept a step nearer to me, her tones growing low and husky. Don't you see? I, I thought that to escape me she might have leapt into the water. She was capable of it. Gwendolen had a strong nature. The struggle between duty and repulsion made havoc even in her infantile breast. Besides, we had had a scene that morning, a secret scene in which she showed absolute terror of me. It broke my heart, and when she disappeared in that mysterious way, and, and one of her shoes was found on the slope, what was I to think but that she had chosen to end her misery? This child, this babe I had loved as my own flesh and blood, in the river, where she had been forbidden to go. Suicide by a child of six? You gave another reason for your persistent belief at the time, Mrs. Ocumpa. Was I to give this one? No, no one could expect you to do that, even if there had been no secret to preserve, and the child had been your own. 
but the child did not go to the river. You are convinced of that now, are you not? Yes. Where then did she go, or rather to what place was she taken? Somewhere near, somewhere within easy reach, for the alarm soon rose, and then she could not be found. Mrs. Ocumpa, I am going to ask you an apparently trivial and inconsequential question. Was Gwendolen very fond of sweets? Yes. She was sitting upright now, staring me in the face in unconcealed astonishment and a little fear. What sort of candy? Pardon me if I seem impertinent. Had you in your house on the Wednesday the child disappeared? Any which she could have got at or the nurse had given her? There were the confections brought by the caterer, none other that I know of. I do not indulge her much in sweets. Was there anything peculiar about these confections, either in taste or appearance? I didn't taste them. In appearance they were mostly round and red, with a brandied cherry inside. Why, sir, why do you ask? What have these miserable lumps of sugar to do with Gwendolen? Madam, do you recognize this? I took from my pocket the crushed mass of sugar and fruit I had picked up from the musty cushions of the old sofa in the walled-up room of the bungalow. She took it and looked up, staring. It is one of them, she cried. Where did you get it? You look as if, as if... I had come upon a clue to Gwendolen. Madam, I believe I have. This candy has been held in a hot little hand. Miss Graham or one of the girls must have given it to her as she ran through the dining room or across the veranda on her way to the bungalow. She did not eat it offhand. She evidently fell asleep before eating it, but she clutched it very tight, only dropping it, I judge, when her muscles were quite relaxed in sleep, and then, not far, the folds of her dress caught it, for... What are you telling me? The interruption was sudden and imperative. I saw Gwendolen asleep. She held a string in her hand, but no candy, and if she did... Did you examine both hands, madam? Think. Great issues hang on a right settlement of this fact. Can you declare that she did not have this candy in one of her little hands? No, I cannot declare that. Then I shall always believe she did, and this same sweetmeat, this morsel from the table set for your guests on the afternoon of the 16th of this month, I found last night in the disused portion of the bungalow walled up by Mr. Ocumpa's father, but made accessible since by an opening let into the floor from the cellar. This latter I was enabled to reach by means of a trap-door, concealed under the rug in the open part of that same building. I... I am all confused. Say that again, she pleaded, starting once more to her feet, but this time without meeting my eyes. In the disused part of the bungalow? How came you there? No one ever goes there. It is a forbidden place. The child has been there, and lately. Oh! Her fingers began to tremble and twist themselves together. You have something more than this to tell me. Gwendolen has been found, and... Her looks became uncertain and wandered, as I thought, toward the river. She has not been found, but the woman who carried her into that place will soon be discovered. How? Why? I had risen by this time and could answer her on a level and face to face. Because the trail of her steps leads straight along the cellar floor, we have but to measure these footprints. And what? What? We find the abductor. A silence during which one long breath issued from her lips. Was it a man's or a woman's steps? she finally asked. A woman's daintily shod, a woman about the size of... Who? Why do you play with my anguish? Because I hate to mention the name of a friend. Ah, uh, what do you know of my friends? Not much. I happened to meet one of them and, as she is a very fine woman with exquisitely shod feet, 
I naturally think of her. What do you mean? Her hand was on my arm, her face close to mine. Speak, speak the name. Mrs. Carew, I had purposely refrained up to this moment from bringing this lady, even by a hint, into the conversation. I did it now under an inner protest. But I had not dared to leave it out. The footprints I alluded to were startlingly like those left by her in other parts of the cellar floor. Besides, I felt it my duty to see how Mrs. Ocumpa bore this name, notwithstanding my almost completely restored confidence in its owner. She did not bear it well. She flushed and turned quickly from my side, walking away to the window, where she again took up her stand. "'You would have shown better taste by not following your first impulse,' she remarked. "'Mrs. Carew's footsteps in that old cellar? "'You presume, sir, and you make me lose confidence in your judgment.' "'Not at all. "'Mrs. Carew's feet have been all over that cellar floor. "'She accompanied me through it last night, at the time I found this crushed bonbon.' "'I could see that Mrs. Ocumpa was amazed.' well nigh confounded, but her manner altered from that moment. Tell me about it. And I did. I related the doubts I had felt concerning the completeness of the police investigation as regarded the bungalow, my visit there at night with Mrs. Carew, and the discoveries we had made. Then I alluded again to the footprints and the important clue they offered. But the child she interrupted. Where is the child? If taken there, why wasn't she found there? Don't you see that your conclusions are all wild, incredible? A dream, an impossibility. I go by the signs, I replied. There seems to be nothing else to go by. And you want, you intend, to measure those steps? That is why I am here, Mrs. Ocumpa to request permission to continue this investigation, and to ask for the key to the bungalow. Mrs. Carew's is no longer available, or rather, I should prefer to proceed without it. With sudden impulse, she advanced rapidly towards me. "'What is Mrs. Carew doing this morning?' she asked. "'Preparing for departure. She is quite resolved to sail today. Do you wish to see her?' Do you wish her confirmation of my story? I think she will come if you send for her. There is no need. This, after an instant's hesitation. I have perfect confidence in Mrs. Carew, and in you too, she added, and with what she meant for a kind look. She was by nature without coquetry, and this attempt to please, in the midst of an overwhelming distress absorbing all her facilities, struck me as the most pitiful effort I had ever seen. My feeling for her made it very hard for me to proceed. "'Then may I go on?' I said. "'Of course, of course. I don't know where the key is. I shall have to give orders. You will wait a few minutes, somewhere in one of the adjoining rooms, while I look up Mr. Atwater?' "'Certainly.' She was trembling, feverish, impatient." "'Shall I not go look up Mr. Atwater for you?' I asked. "'No, I am feeling better. I can go by myself.' In another moment she had left the room, having forgotten her own suggestion that I should await her return in some adjoining apartment. End of chapter 18《ハッピーバースデー・ミリオネア・ベイビー・バイ・キー・グリーン》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green, Chapter 19, Frenzy Five minutes, ten minutes elapsed, and I became greatly impatient. I walked the floor. I stared from the window. I did everything I could think of to pass away these unendurable moments of suspense with credible self-possession but I failed utterly. As the clock ticked off the quarter hour and then the half, I grew not only impatient but seriously alarmed, 
and flinging down the book I had taken up as a last resort, stepping from the room, in the hope of coming across someone in the hall whom I could interrogate. But the house seemed strangely quiet, and, when I had walked the full length of the hall without encountering either maid or mistress, I summoned up the courage to return to the room I had left and rang the bell. No answer, though I waited long for it. Thinking that I had not pressed the button hard enough, I made a second attempt, but again there was no answer. Was anything amiss? Had she? My thought did not complete itself. In sudden apprehension of I knew not what, I dashed from the room and made my way downstairs without further ceremony. The unnatural stillness which had attracted my attention above was repeated on the floor below. No one in the rooms, no one in the passages. Disturbed as I had not been yet by anything which had occurred in connection with this harrowing affair, I leaped to the nearest door and stepped out on the lawn. My first glance was toward the river. All was as usual there, with my worst fears dispelled, but still a prey to doubts for which as yet I had no name. I moved toward the kitchen windows, expecting, of course, to find someone there who would explain the situation to me. But not a head appeared to my call. The kitchen, too, was deserted. "'This is not chance,' I involuntarily exclaimed, and was turning toward the stables, when I perceived a child, the son of one of the gardeners, crossing the lawn at a run, and, hailing him, asked where everybody had gone, that the house seemed deserted. He looked back, but kept on running, shouting as he did so, "'I guess they're all down at the bungalow. I'm going there. Men are digging up the cellar.' Mrs. Ocumpaugh says she's afraid Miss Gwendolen's body is buried there. Aghast, and perhaps a trifle conscience-stricken, I stood stock still in the sunshine. So this was what I had done, driven her to frenzy, roused her imagination to such a point that she saw her darling, always her darling, even if another woman's child, lying under the clay across which I had attempted simply to prove that she had been carried or no i would not think that a detective of my experience outwitted by this stricken half-dead woman who i had trembled to see try to stand upon her feet impossible yet the thought brought the blood to my cheek digging up the bungalow cellar that meant destroying those footprints before i had secured a single impression of the same i should have roused her curiosity only not her terror. Now all might be lost unless I could arrive in time to... To do what? Order the work stopped? With what face could I do that with her standing by in all the authority of motherhood, frenzied motherhood, seeking the possible body of her child? My affair certainly looked dubious. Yet I started for the bungalow like the rest, and on a run, too. Perhaps Providence would favor me, and some expedient suggest itself, by which I might still save the clue upon which so many hopes had hung. The excitement which had now drawn every person on the place in the one direction was at its height as I burst through the thicket into the path running immediately about the bungalow. Those who could get in at the door had done so, filling the room whence Gwendolen had disappeared with awe-struck men and chattering women. Some had been allowed to descend through the yawning trap-door, down which all were endeavouring to peer, and, fortified by this fact, I armed myself with an appearance of authority despite my sense of presumption, and pushed and worked my own way to these steps, saying that I had come to aid Mrs. Ocumpa, whose attention I declared I had been the first to direct to this place. Struck with my manner, if not with my argument, they yielded to my importunity and allowed me to pass down. The stroke of the spade and the harsh voice of the men directing the work greeted my disquieted ears. With a bound I cleared the last half-dozen steps, and, alighting on the cellar bottom, was soon able, in spite of the semi-darkness, to look about me and get some notion of the scene. A dozen men were working, the full corps of gardeners without doubt, 
and a single glance sufficed to show me that such of the surface as had not been upturned by their spades had been harried by their footsteps. Useless now to promulgate my carefully formed theory with any hope of proof to substantiate it. The crushed bonbon, the piled up boxes, and the freshly sawed hole were enough without doubt to establish the fact that the child had been carried into the walled-up room above, but the link which would have fixed the identity of the person, so carrying her, was gone from my chain of evidence forever. She, who should have had the greatest interest in establishing this evidence, was leaning on the arm of Miss Porter and directing, with wavering finger and a wild air, the movements of the men, who, in a frenzy caught up from her own, dug here and dug there, as that inexorable finger pointed. Sobs choked Miss Porter, but Mrs. Ocumpaugh was beyond all such signs of grief. Her eyes moved, her breast heaved. Now and then a confused command left her lips, but that was all. Yet to me she was absolutely terrifying, and it took all the courage left from my disappointment for me to move so as to attract her attention. When I saw that I had succeeded in doing this, I regretted the impulse which had led me to break into her mood. The change which my sudden appearance caused in her was too abrupt, too startling. I feared the effects and put up my hand in silent deprecation, as her lips essayed to move in what might be a very disturbing command. If she heeded it, I cannot say. What she said was this. It's the child. I'm looking for the child. She was brought here. You proved that she was brought here. Then why don't we find her, or, or her little innocent body? I did not attempt an answer. I dared not. I merely turned away into the corner, where I should be out of the way of the men. A thought was rising in my mind, a thought which might have led to some definite action, if her voice had not risen shrilly and with a despairing utterance in these words. Useless! It is not here she will be found. I was mad to think it. Pull up your spades, and go. A murmur of relief from one end of the cellar to the other, and every spade was drawn out of the ground. "'I could have told you,' ventured one more hardy than the rest, "'that there was no use disturbing this old clay for any such purpose. "'Any one could see that no spade has been at work here before in years.' "'I said that I was mad,' she repeated and waved the men away. "'Slowly they retreated with clattering spades and a heavy tread.' The murmur which greeted them above slowly died out, and the bungalow was deserted by all but our three selves. When quite sure of this, I turned, and Miss Porter's eyes met mine with a reproachful glance, easy enough for me to understand. "'I will go, too,' whispered Mrs. Ocumpa. "'Oh, this has been like losing my darling for the second time. Real grief is unmistakable.' Recognizing the heartfelt tone in which those words were uttered, I recurred to the idea of frenzy with all the sympathy her situation called for. Yet I felt that I could not let her leave before we had come to some understanding. But how express myself? How say here and now in the presence of a sympathetic but unenlightened third party, what it would certainly be difficult enough for me to utter to herself in the privacy of that secluded apartment in which we had met and talked before our confidence was broken into by this impetuous act of hers. Not seeing at the moment any natural way out of my difficulties, I stood in painful confusion, conscious of Miss Porter's eyes, and also conscious that unless some miracle came to my assistance, I must henceforth play but a sorry figure in this affair. When my eyes, which had fallen to the ground, chanced upon a morsel of paper, so insignificant in size, and of such doubtful appearance, that the two ladies must have wondered to see me stoop with ill-concealed avidity, pick it up, and place it in my pocket. 
Mrs. Ocumpaugh, whose false strength was fast leaving her, now muttered some words which were quite unintelligible to me, though they caused Miss Porter to make me a motion very expressive of a dismissal. I did not accept it as such, however, without making one effort to regain my advantage. At the foot of the steps I paused and glanced back at Mrs. Ocumpa. She was still looking my way, but her chin had fallen on her breast, and she seemed to sustain herself erect only by a powerful effort. Again her pitiable and humiliating position appealed to me, and it was with some indication of feeling that I finally said, Am I not to have an opportunity of finishing the conversation so unhappily interrupted, Mrs. Ocumpa? I am not satisfied, and I do not believe you can be, with the partial disclosures I had then made. Afford me, I pray, a continuation of that interview, if only to make plain to me your wishes. Otherwise I may fall into some mistake, say or do something which I might regret for matters cannot stand where they are. You know that, do you not, madam? Adelaide, go, go, this, she said to Miss Porter. I must have a few words with Mr. Trevitt. I have forgotten what I owe him in the frenzy which possessed me. Do you wish to talk to him here? asked the lady, with very marked anxiety. No, no, it is too cold, too dark. I think I can walk to Mrs. Carew's. Will you join me there, Mr. Trevitt? I bowed, but as she passed near me in going out, I whispered in her ear, I should suggest that we hold our talk anywhere but at Mrs. Carew's house, since she is liable to be the chief suspect in our conversation. Now? Now, more than ever. Her share in the child's disappearance was not eliminated, or affected in any way by the destruction of her footprints. I will go back to the house. I will see him in my own room, Mrs. Ocumpa suddenly announced to her greatly disturbed companion. Mr. Trevitt will follow in a few minutes. I, I must have time to think, to compose myself, to decide. She was evidently thinking aloud, anxious to save her from any self-betrayal, I hastily interrupted her, saying quietly, I will be at your boudoir door in a half hour from now. I myself have something to think of in the interim. Be careful. It was Miss Porter who stopped to utter this word in my ear. Be very careful, I entreat. Her heartstrings are strained almost to breaking. I answered with a look. She could not be more conscious of this than I was. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20 of The Millionaire Baby。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green。Chapter 20 。What do you know? I was glad of that half hour. I, too, wanted a free moment in which to think and examine the small scrap of paper I had picked up from this cellar floor. In the casual glance I had given it, it had seemed to offer me a fresh clue, quite capable of replacing the old one, and I did not change my mind on a second examination. The shape, the hue, the few words written on it, even the musty smell pervading it, all going to prove it to be one possible link which could reunite the chain whose continuity I believed to be gone forever. Rejoicing in my good luck, yet conscious of still moving in very troubled waters, I cast a glance in the direction of Mrs. Carew's house, from the door of the bungalow whence I had seen Mrs. Ocumpa depart, and asked myself why Mrs. Carew, of all persons in the vicinity, had been the only one to hang back from this scene of excitement. It was not like her to hide herself in such a crisis." how invariably she had followed me in each and every visit I had paid here. And though I remembered all her reasons for preoccupation, her absence under the present conditions bore an aspect of guilt which sent my mind working in a direction which was not entirely new to me, but which I had not as yet resolutely faced. Guilt! 
The word recalled that other and similar one uttered by Mr. Rathbone in that adventure which had impressed me as so unreal, and still held its place in my mind as something I had dreamed. He was looking up when he said it, up the hill, up toward Mrs. Carew's house. He had struck his own breast, but he had looked up, not down, and though I had naturally associated the word he had used with himself, and Miss Graham with a womanly intuition, had supplied me with an explanation of the same, which was neither far-fetched nor unnatural. Yet, all through this day of startling vicissitudes and unimaginable interviews, faint doubts, bidden and unbidden, had visited my mind, which at this moment culminated in what I might call the irresistible question, as to whether he might not have had in mind someone nearer and dearer than himself when he uttered that accusing word. Her position, as I saw it now, did not make this supposition too monstrous for belief. That is, if she secretly loved this man, who did not dare, or was too burdened with responsibility to woo her, and who can penetrate a woman's mind? To give him, possibly without his knowledge, what every one who knew him declared him to stand in special need of, money and relief from too exacting work, might have seemed motive enough to one of her warm and impulsive temperament for eliminating the child she cared for, but not as she cared for him. It was hard to think it, it would be harder yet to act upon it, but the longer I stood there brooding, the more I felt my conviction grow, that from her and from her alone we should yet obtain definite traces of the missing child, if only Mrs. Ocumpa would uphold me in the attempt. But would Mrs. Ocumpa do this? I own that I had my doubts. Some hidden cause or instinct which I had not been able to reach, though I had plunged deep into the most galling secrets of her life, seemed to stand in the way of her full acceptance of the injury I believed her to have received from Mrs. Carew, or rather, in the way of her public acknowledgment of it. Though she would fain have this upturning of the bungalow cellar pass for an act of frenzy, I could not quite bring myself to look upon it as such, since taking a final observation of its condition. Though her professed purpose had been to seek the body of her child, the spades had not gone deeper than their length. It had been harrowing, not digging, she had ordered, and harrowing meant nothing more than an obliteration of the footprints which I had menaced her with, comparing with those of Mrs. Carew. Why this show of consideration to one she might call a friend, but who could hold no comparison in her mind with the safety or recovery of the child which, if not hers, was the beloved object of her husband's heart, and only too deeply cherished by herself. Did she fear her charming neighbor? Was the bond between them founded on something besides love, and did she apprehend that a discovery of Mrs. Carew's connection with Gwendolen's disappearance would only precipitate her own disgrace, and open up to public recognition the false relationship she held toward the little heiress? Hard questions, these, but ones which must soon be faced and answered, for wretched as was Mrs. Ocumpa's position, and truly as I sympathized with her misery, I was none the less resolved to force such acknowledgment from her as would allow me to approach Mrs. Carew with a definite accusation such as even that daring spirit could not withstand. Thus resolved, and resisting all temptation to hazard an interview with the latter lady before I had seen Mrs. Ocumpa again, I made my way up slowly through the grounds and entered by the side door, just as my watch told me that the half-hour of my waiting was over. Miss Porter was in an upper hall, but turned aside at my approach, with a meaning gesture in the direction of the boudoir. I thought that her eyes looked red, Certainly she was trembling very much, and with this poor preparation for an interview before which the strongest and most experienced man might quail, I advanced for the second time that morning to the door, behind which the distracted mother awaited me. 
If I knocked, I do not remember it. I rather think she opened the door for me herself upon hearing my step in the hall. At all events, we were soon standing face to face again, and the battle for our two wills, for it would be nothing less now, had begun. She was the first to speak. Braving my inquiring look with eyes in whose depths determination struggled with growing despair, she asked me peremptorily, almost wildly, "'Have you told anyone? Do you mean to publish my shame to the world?' I see decision in your face. Does it mean that? Tell me, does it mean that? No, madam, far be it from me to harbor such an intention, unless driven to it by the greatest necessity. Your secret is your own. My only reason for betraying my knowledge of it was in the hope I cherished of its affording some clue to the identity of Gwendolen's abductor. It has not done so yet, may never do so. Then let us leave that topic and return to the clue offered by the carrying off of that child into the long closed room back of the bungalow. Mrs. Ocumpa, intentionally or unintentionally, the proof upon which I relied for settling the identity of the person so carrying her, has been destroyed. With a flush, which her seemingly bloodless condition made perfectly startling, she drew back, breaking into wild disclaimers. I know, I fear, I was too wild, too eager. I, I thought only of what might lie under that floor. In a half foot of earth, madam, spades did not enter any deeper. With a sudden access of courage, born possibly of her despair, she sought neither to attempt denial or palliate the fact. And if this was my intention, though I don't acknowledge it, you must recognize my reason. I do not believe, you cannot make me believe, that Gwendolen was carried into that room by Mrs. Carew. But I could see that you believed it, and to save her the shame of such an accusation, and all that might follow from it, I... Oh, Mr. Trevitt, you do not think this possible. Do you know so little of the impulses of a mind, bewildered as mine has been by intolerable suffering? I can understand madness, and I am willing to think that you were mad just then, especially as no harm has been done, and I can still accuse Mrs. Carew of a visit to that room, with the proof in my hand. What do you mean? The steady voice was faltering, but I could not say with what emotion. Hope for herself? Doubt of me? Fear for her friend? It might have been any of these. It might have been all." "'Was there a footprint left, then? You say proof. Do you mean proof? A detective does not use that word lightly.' "'You may be sure that I would not,' I returned. Then, in answer to the appeal of her whole attitude and expression, "'No, there were no footprints left, but I came upon something else, which I have sufficient temerity to believe will answer the same purpose.' Remember that my object is first to convince you, and afterwards, Mrs. Carew, that it will be useless for her to deny that she had been in that room. Once that is understood, the rest will come easy, for we know the child was there, and it is not a place she could have found alone. The proof? She had no strength for more than that. The proof? Mr. Trevitt? The proof? I put my hand in my pocket, then drew it out again, empty, making haste, however, to say, Mrs. Ocumpa, I do not want to distress you, but I must ask you a few questions first. Do you know the secret of that strangely divided room? Only in a general way, Mr. Ocumpa has never told me. You have not seen the written account of it? No nor given into Mrs. Carew's hand such an account? No. Mrs. Carew's duplicity was assuming definite proportions. Yet there is such an account, and I have listened to a reading of it. You? Yes, madam. Mrs. Carew read it to me last night in her own house. She told me it came to her from your hands. You see, she is not always particular in her statements. 
A lift of the hand, whether in depreciation or appeal I could not say, was all the answer this received. I saw that I must speak with the utmost directness. This account was in the shape of a letter on several sheets of paper. These sheets were very old, and were torn as well as discolored. I had them in my hand, and noticed that a piece was lacking from one of them. Mrs. Ocumpa, are you ready to repeat that Mrs. Carew did not receive this old letter from you, or obtain it in any way you know of from the house we are in now? I'd rather not be forced to contradict Mrs. Carew, was the low reply, but in justice to you I must acknowledge that I hear of this letter for the first time. God grant, but what can any old letter have to do with this agonizing question before us? I am not strong, Mr. Trevitt. I am suffering. Do not confuse me and burden me, I pray. Pardon, but I am not saying one unnecessary word. These old sheets, a secret from the family, did not come from this house. Whence then did they come into Mrs. Carew's possession? I see you have forestalled my answer, and if you will now glance at this end of paper, picked up by me in your presence from the cellar floor, across which we both know that her footsteps have passed, you will see that it is a proof capable of convicting her of the fact. I held out the scrap I now took from my pocket. Mrs. Ocumba's hand refused to take it, or her eyes to consult it. Nevertheless, I still held it out. "'Pray read the few words you will find there,' I urged. "'They are in explanation of the document itself, "'but they will serve to convince you that the letter to which they were attached, "'and which is now in Mrs. Carew's hand, came from that decaying room.' "'No, no!' "'The gesture which accompanied this exclamation was more than one of refusal. "'It was that of repulse. "'I cannot see. I do not need to.' I, I am convinced. Pardon me, but that is not enough, Mrs. Ocumpa. I want you to be certain. Let me read these words. The story they prefaced is unknown to you. Let it remain so. All I need to tell you about is this, that it was written by Mr. Ocumpa's father, he who raised this partition, and who is undoubted author of these lines. Remember that they headed the letter. Perish with the room whose ceiling oozes blood. If in time to come any man reads these lines, he will know why I pulled down the encircling wall built by my father, and why I raised a new one across this end of the pavilion. Mrs. Ocumpa's eyes opened wide in terror. Blood, she repeated, a ceiling oozing blood? An old superstition, Mrs. Ocumpa, quite unworthy of your attention at the moment. Do not let your mind dwell upon the portion of what I have read, but on the word room. Perish with the room. We know what room was meant. There can be but one. I have myself seen the desk from which these sheets were undoubtedly taken, and for them to be in the hand of a certain person argues. Mrs. Ocumpa's hand went up in dissuasion, but I relentlessly finished that she has been in that room. Are you more than convinced of this now? Are you sure? She did not need to make reply. Eyes and attitude spoke for her. But it was the look and attitude of despair, not hope. Evidently she had the very greatest reason to fear Mrs. Carew, who possibly had her hard side as well as her charming one. To ease the situation I spoke, what was in both our minds. I see that you are sure. That makes my duty very plain, Mrs. Ocumpa. My next visit must be upon Mrs. Carew. The spirit which, from the beginning of this latter interview, had infused fresh strength into her feeble frame, seemed to forsake her at this simple declaration. Her whole form drooped and the eyes which had rested on mine turned in their own way to the river. I took advantage of the circumstance. Someone who knows you well, who knows the child well, dropped the wrong shoe into the river. 
A murmur, nothing more, from Mrs. Ocumpaugh's set lips. Could it? I do not say that it was. I don't see any reason why it should be. But could it have been Mrs. Carew? Not a sound this time. Not a sound. She was down at the dock that night. Did you know it? A gesture, but whether of assent or dissent, I could not tell. We know of no other person who was there but the men employed. What do you know? With all her restraint gone, a suffering and despairing woman, Mrs. Ocumpa was on her knees, grasping my arm with both hands. Quit this torture. Tell me that you know it all, and leave me to... to die. Madam, I was confounded and as I looked at her face, strained back in wild appeal, I was more than confounded. I was terrified. Madam, what does this mean? Are you, you? Lock the door, she cried. No one must come in here now. I have said so much that I must say more. Listen, and be my friend. Oh, be my friend. Those were my footsteps you saw in the bungalow. It was I who carried Gwendolen into that secret hole. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of the Millionaire Baby – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green Chapter 21 – Providence Had I suspected this? Had all my efforts for the last half hour been for the purpose of entrapping her into some such avowal? I do not know. My own feelings at the time are a mystery to me. I blundered on, with a blow here and a blow there, till I hit this woman in a vital spot and achieved the above-mentioned results. I was not happy when I reached it. I felt no elation, scarcely any relief. It all seemed so impossible." She marked the signs of incredulity in my face and spoke up quickly, almost sharply. "'You do not believe me. I will prove the truth of what I say. Just wait, wait.' And, running to a closet, she pulled out a drawer. Where was her weakness now? And brought from it a pair of soiled white slippers. "'If the house had been ransacked,' she proceeded pantingly, "'these would have told their own tale.' I was shocked when I saw their condition, and kept my guests waiting till I changed them. Oh, they will fit the footprints. Her smile was ghastly. Softly she set the shoes down. Mrs. Carew helped me. She went for the child at night. Oh, we are in a terrible strait, we two, unless you will stand by us like a friend. And you will do that, won't you, Mr. Trevitt? No one else knows what I have just confessed, not even Dr. Poole, though he suspects me in ways I never dreamed of. Money shall not stand in the way. I have a fortune of my own now. Nothing shall stand in the way if you will have pity on Mrs. Carew and myself and help us to preserve our secret. Madam, what secret? I pray you to make me acquainted with the whole matter in all its details before you ask my assistance. "'Then do you not know it?' "'Not altogether, and I must know it altogether. First, what became of the child?' "'She is safe and happy. You have seen her. You mentioned doing so just now. "'Harry?' "'Harry!' I rose before her in intense excitement. What a plot! I stood aghast at its daring and at the success it so nearly met with. I've had moments of suspicion, I admitted, after a short examination of this beautiful woman's face, for the marks of strength which her part in this plot seemed to call for. But they all vanished before Mrs. Carew's seemingly open manner, and the perfect boyishness of the child. Is she an actress too, Gwendolen? Not when she plays boyish games like horse and Indian. She is only acting out her nature. She has no girl tastes. She is all boy, and it was by means of these instincts that Mrs. Carew won her. She promised her that if she would leave her home and go with her to Europe, 
She would cut her hair and call her Harry, and dress her so that everyone would think her a boy. And she promised her something else, that she should go to her father. Gwendolen idolizes Mr. Ocumpa. But I know. You wonder why, if I loved my husband, I should send away the one cherished object of his life. It is because our love was threatened by this very object. I saw nothing but death and chaos before me if I kept her. My husband adores that child, but he hates and despises a falsehood, and my secret was threatened by the one man who knows it, your Dr. Poole. My accomplice once, he declared himself ready to become my accuser if the child remained under the Ocumpa roof one day after the date he fixed for her removal. Ah, I ejaculated with sudden comprehension of the full meaning of the scrawls I had seen in so many parts of the grounds. And by what right did he demand this? What excuse did he give you? His wish for money, immense money, old miser that he is? No, for money I could have given him. His motive is a less tangible one. He has scruples, he says, religious scruples following a change of heart. Oh, he was a cruel man to meet, determined, inexorable. I could not move or influence him. The proffer of money only hurt my cause. A fraud had been perpetrated, he said, and Mr. Ocumpa must know it. Would I confess the truth to him myself? No. Then he would do so for me, and bring proofs to substantiate his statements. I thought all was lost, my husband's confidence, his love, his pleasure even in the child, for it was his own blood that he loved in her, and her connection with his family, of whose prestige he has an exaggerated idea. Made desperate by the thought, I faced this cruel doctor. It was in his office. He had presumed upon that old secret linking us together to summon me there, and told him solemnly that rather than do this, I would kill myself. And he almost bade me kill, but refrained when the word had half left his lips, and changed it to a demand for the child's immediate removal from the benefits it enjoyed under false pretenses. And from this Mrs. Ocumpa went on to relate how he had told her that Gwendolen had inherited fortunes because she was believed to be an Ocumpa, that not being an Ocumpa she must never handle those fortunes, winding up with some language as this. Manage it how you will, only relieve me from the oppression of feeling myself a party to the grossest of deceptions. Cannot the child run away and be lost? I am willing to aid you in that, even to paying for her bringing up in some decent, respectable way, such as would probably have been her lot, if you had not interfered to place her in the way of millions. It was a mad thought, half meant and apparently wholly impossible to carry out, without raising suspicions as damaging as confession itself. But it took an immediate hold upon the miserable woman he addressed though she gave little evidence of it, for he proceeded to add in a harsh tone, that or immediate confession to your husband, with me by your side to substantiate your story. No slippery woman's tricks will go down with me. Fix the date here and now, and I promise to stand back and await the result in total silence. Dally with it by so much as an hour, and I am at your gates with a story that all must hear." Is it a matter of wonder that the stricken woman, without counsel and prohibited from the very nature of her secret from seeking counsel, uttered the first one that came to mind and went home to brood over her position, and plan how she could satisfy his demands with the least cost to herself, her husband, and the child? Mr. Ocumpa was in Europe. This was her one point of comfort. What was done could be done in his absence, and this fact greatly minimized any risk she was likely to incur. When he returned he would find the house in mourning, for she had already decided within herself that only by apparent death could this child be safely robbed of her endowments, 
as an Ocumpa and an heiress. He would grieve, but his grief would lack the sting of shame, and so in course of time would soften into a lovely memory of one who had been as the living sunshine to him, and, like the sunshine, brief in its shining. Thus, and thus only, could she show her consideration for him. For herself no consideration was possible. It must always be her fate to know the child alive, yet absolutely removed from her. This was a sorrow capable of no alleviation, for Gwendolen was passionately dear to her, all the dearer, perhaps, because the mother thirst had never been satisfied, because she had held the cup in hand, but had never been allowed to drink. The child's future how to rob her of all she possessed, yet secure her happiness and the prospect of an honorable estate. Ah, there was the difficulty, and one she quite failed to solve, till, in a paroxysm of terror and despair, after five sleepless nights, she took Mrs. Carew into her confidence and implored her aid. The free, resourceful, cheerful nature of the broader-minded woman saw through the difficulty at once. "'Give her to me,' she cried. "'I love little children passionately, and have always grieved over my childless condition. I will take Gwendolen, raise her, and fill her little heart so full of love. She will never miss the magnificence she had been brought to look upon as her birthright. Only I shall have to leave this vicinity, perhaps the country.' "'And would you be willing?' asked the poor mother, mother by right of many years of service, if not of blood. The answer broke her heart, though it was only a smile. But such a smile, confident, joyous, triumphant, the smile of a woman who had got her heart's wish, while she, she must henceforth live childless. So that was settled, but not the necessary ways and means of accomplishment, those came only with time. The two women had always been friends, so their frequent meetings in the green boudoir did not waken a suspicion. A sudden trip to Europe was decided on by Mrs. Carew, and by degrees the whole plot was perfected. In her eyes it looked feasible enough, and they both anticipated complete success. Having decided that the scheme, as planned by them, could be best carried out in the confusion of a great entertainment. Cards were sent out for the 16th, the date agreed upon by the doctor's office, as the one in which should see a complete change in Gwendolen's prospects. It was also settled that on that same day Mrs. Carew should bring home from a certain small village in Connecticut her nephew, who had lately been left an orphan. There was no deception about this nephew, Mrs. Carew had for some time supplied his needs, and paid for his board in the farmhouse where he had been left, and, in the emergency which had just come up, she took care to publish to all her friends that she was going to bring him home and take him with her to Europe. Further, a market man and woman, with whom Mrs. Carew had had dealings for years, were persuaded to call at her house, shortly after three that afternoon, to take this nephew of hers by a circuitous and prolonged ride through the country to an institution in which she had had him entered under an assumed name. All this in one day. Meanwhile, Mrs. Carew undertook to open with her own hands a passage from the cellar of the bungalow into the long closed room behind the partition. This was to ensure a safe retreat for the child during the first search, that by no possibility could anything be found to contradict the testimony of the little shoe which Mrs. Ocumpa proposed presenting to all eyes as found on the slope leading to the great burial place, the river. Otherwise the child might have been passed over to Mrs. Carew at once. All this being decided upon, each waited to perform the part assigned to her, Mrs. Carew, in the fever of delight, for she was passionately devoted to Gwendolen, and experienced nothing but rapture at the prospect of having this charming child all to herself. Mrs. Ocumpa, whose only recompense would be freedom from the threatening exposure 
which would cost her the only thing she prized, her husband's love, in a condition of cold dread, relieved only by the burning sense of the necessity of impressing upon the whole world, and especially upon Mr. Ocumpaugh, an absolute belief in the child's death. This was her first care. To this her mind clung with an agony of purpose, which was the fittest preparation possible for the real display of feeling when the time came. But she forgot one thing. They both forgot one thing. That chance or providence might ordain that witness should be on the road below Homewood to prove that the child did not cross the track at the time of her disappearance. To them it seemed enough to plead the child's love for the water, her desire to be allowed to fish, the opportunity given her to escape, and, and the little shoes. Such short-sightedness in face of a great peril could be pardoned Mrs. Ocumpaugh on the verge of delirium under her cold exterior, but Mrs. Carew should have taken this possibility into account, and would have done so, probably, had she not been completely absorbed in the part she would be called upon to play, when the exchange of children should be made, and Gwendolen be entrusted to her charge, within a dozen rods of her own home. This she could dwell on with the whole force of her mind, this she could view in all its relations, and make such a study of it, as to provide herself against all contingencies. But the obvious danger of a gang of men being placed just where they could serve as witness, in contradiction of the one fact upon which the whole plot was based, never even struck her imagination. The nursery governess, whose heart was divided between her duty to the child and her strong love of music, was chosen as their unconscious accomplice in this fraud. As the time for the great musicale approached, she was bidden to amuse Gwendolen in the bungalow, with the understanding that if the child fell asleep, she might lay her on the divan, and so far leave her as to take her place on the bench outside, where the notes of the solo singers could reach her. That Gwendolen would fall asleep, and fall asleep soon, the wretched mother well knew, for she had given her a safe but potent sleeping draught, which could not fail to ensure a twelve hours undisturbed slumber to so healthy a child. The fact that the little one had shrunk more than ever from her attentions that morning both hurt and encouraged her. Certainly it would make it easier for Mrs. Carew to influence Gwendolen. In her own mind, filled with terrible images of her husband's grief and her long prospective dissimulation, one picture rose in brilliant contrast, to the dark one embodying her own miserable future, and that of the soon-to-be bereaved father. It was that of the perfect joy of the hungry-hearted child, in the arms of the woman she loved best. It brought her cheer. It brought her anguish. It was a salve to her conscience, and a mortal thrust in an already festering wound. She shut it from her eyes, as much as possible, and so the hour came. We know the results, how far the scheme succeeded, and whence its great failure arose. Gwendolen fell asleep almost immediately on reaching the bungalow, and Mrs. Graham, dreaming no harm and having the most perfect confidence in Mrs. Ocumpa, took advantage of the permission she had received, and slipped outside to sit on the bench and listen to the music. Presently, Mrs. Ocumpa appeared, saying that she had left her guests for a moment just to take a look at Gwendolen and see if all were well with her. As she needed no attendance, Miss Graham might stay where she was, and Miss Graham did, taking a pleasure in the music, which was the finest she had ever heard. Meanwhile, Mrs. Ocumpa entered the bungalow, and, untying the child's shoes as she had frequently done before, when she found her asleep, she lifted her and carried her just as she was down the trap, the door of which she had previously raised. The darkness lurking in such places, a darkness which had rendered it so impenetrable by midnight, was relieved to some extent in daylight by means of a little grated opening in the wall under the beams, 
so that her chief difficulty lay in holding up her long dress and sustaining the heavy child at the same time. But the exigency of the moment, and her apprehension lest Miss Graham should re-enter the bungalow before she could finish her task and escape, gave great precision to her movements, and in an incredible short space of time she had reached those musty precincts, which, if they should not prove the death of the child, would safely shelter her from every one's eye till the first excitement of her loss was over, and the conviction of her death by drowning become a settled fact in every mind. Mrs. Ocumpaugh's return was a flight. She had brought one of the little shoes with her concealed in a pocket she had made especially for it, in the trimmings of her elaborate gown. She found the bungalow empty, the trap still raised, and Miss Graham, toward whom she cast a hurried look through the window, yet in her place, listening with enthralled attention to the great tenor upon whose magnificent singing Mrs. Ocumpa had relied for the successful carrying out of what she and Mrs. Carew considered the most critical part of the plot. So far, then, all was well. She had but to drop the trap-door carefully to its place, replace the corner of the carpet she had pulled up, push down with her foot the two or three nails she had previously loosened, and she would be quite at liberty to quit the place and return to her guests. But she found that this was not as easy as she had imagined. The clogs of a terrible, almost a criminal consciousness, held back her steps. The stumble as she left the bungalow and stopped to catch her breath, as if the oppression of the room in which she had immured her darling had infected the sunny air of this glorious day and made free breathing an impossibility. The weights on her feet were so palpable to her that she unconsciously looked down at them. This was how she came to notice the dust on her shoes. Alive to the story it told, she burst the spell which held her and made a bound to the house. Rushing to her room, she shook her skirts and changed her shoes, and thus freed from all the connecting links with that secret spot, re-entered among her guests, as beautiful and probably as wretched a woman as the world contained that day. Yet as wretched as she could be, there were depths beneath these depths. If he should ever know, if he should ever come to look at her with horrified, even alienated eyes? Ah, that were the end. That would mean the river for her, the river which all so soon were to think had swallowed the little Gwendolen. Was that Miss Graham coming? Was the stir she now heard outside the first indication of the hue and cry, which would soon ring through the whole place, and her shrinking heart as well? No, no, not yet. She could still smile, must smile, and smite her two glove-covered hands together in simulated applause of notes and tones she did not even hear. And no one noted anything strange in the smile, or in that gracious bringing together of hands, which, if any one had had the impulse to touch, but no one thought of doing that. A heart may bleed drop by drop to its death in our full sight, without our expecting it, if the eye above it still beam with the natural brightness. And hers did that. She had always been called impassive. God be thanked that no warmth was expected from her, and that no one would suspect the death she was dying if she did not cry out. But the moment came when she did cry out. Miss Graham entered, told her story, and all Mrs. Ocumpaugh's pent-up agony burst its bounds in a scream, which to others seemed but the natural outburst of an alarmed mother. She fled to the bungalow, because that seemed the natural thing to do, and, never forgetting what was expected of her, cried aloud in presence of its emptiness, the river, the river, and went stumbling down the bank. The shoe was near at hand, and she drew it out as she went on. 
When they found her, she had fainted. The excess of excitement had this natural outcome. She did not have to play a part. The humiliation of her own deed and the terrors yet to come were eating up her very soul. Then came the blow, the unexpected, overwhelming blow of finding that the deception planned with such care, a deception upon the success of which the whole safety of the scheme depended, was likely to fail, just for the simple reason that a dozen men could swear that the child had never crossed the track. She was dazed, confounded. Mrs. Carew was not by to counsel her. She had her own part in this business to play. And Mrs. Ocumpa, conscious of being mentally unfit for any new planning, conscious indeed of not being able to think at all, simply followed her instinct and held to the old cry in face of proof, of persuasion, of reason even. And so did the very wisest thing possible no one expecting reason in a mother reeling under such a vital shock. But the cooler, more subtle, and less guilty Mrs. Carew had some judgment left, if her own friend had lost hers. Her own part had been well played. She had brought her nephew home without giving anyone, not even the maid she had provided herself with in New York, an opportunity to see his face, and she had passed him over, dressed in quite different clothes, to the couple in the farm wagon, who had carried him, as she supposed, safely out of reach and any possibility of discovery. You see, her calculations failed here also. She did not credit the doctor with even the little conscience he possessed, and, unconscious of his near waiting on the highway, in anxious watch, for the event concerning which he had his own secret doubts, she deluded herself into thinking that all they had to fear was a continuation of the impression that Gwendolen had not gone down to the river and been drowned. When, therefore, she had acted out her little part, received the searching party, and gone with them over the house, even to the door of the room, where she said her little nephew was resting after his journey, did they look in? Perhaps and perhaps not. It mattered little, for the bed had been arranged against this contingency, and no one but a detective bent upon ferreting out a crime would have found it empty. She asked herself how she could strengthen the situation, and cause the theory advanced by Mrs. Ocampa to be received, notwithstanding the evidence of seeming eyewitnesses. The result was the throwing of an additional shoe into the water, as soon as it was dark enough for her to do this unseen. As she had to approach the river by her own grounds, and as she was obliged to choose a place sufficiently remote from the lights about the dock, not to incur the risk of being detected in her hazardous attempt, the shoe fell at a spot farther down the stream than searchers had yet reached and the intense excitement I had seen myself in Mrs. Ocumpa's face the day I made my first visit to Homewood sprang from the agony of suspense with which she watched, after twenty-four hours of alternating expectation and disappointment. The finding of this second shoe which, with fanatic confidence, she hoped would bring all the confirmation to be desired of her oft-repeated declaration that the child would yet be found in the river, Meanwhile, to the infinite dismay of both, the matter had been placed in the hands of the police, and word sent to Mr. Ocumpa. Not that the child was dead, but missing. This meant worldwide publicity, and the constant coming and going about Homewood, of the very men whose insight and surveillance were most to be dreaded. Mrs. Ocumpa sank under the terrors thus accumulating upon her, but Mrs. Carew, of different temperament and history, rose to meet them with a courage which bade fair to carry everything before it. As midnight approached, the hour agreed upon in their compact, she prepared to go for Gwendolen. Mrs. Ocumpa, who had not forgotten what was expected of her at that hour, roused as the clock struck twelve, and, uttering a loud cry, rushed from her place at the window to the lawn, calling out that she had heard the men shout aloud from the boats. Her plan was to draw everyone who chanced to be about, 
down to the river bank, in order to give Mrs. Carew full opportunity to go and come unseen on her dangerous errand. And she apparently succeeded in this, for, by the time she had crept back in seeming disappointment to the house, a light could be seen burning behind a pink shade in one of Mrs. Carew's upper windows, the signal agreed upon between them of the presence of Gwendolen in her new home. But small was the relief as yet. The shoe had not been found, and at any moment some intruder might force his way into Mrs. Carew's house, and, in spite of all her precautions, succeed in obtaining a view of the little Harry and recognize him as the missing child. Of these same precautions some mention must be made. The artful widow had begun by dismissing all her help, giving as an excuse her speedy departure for Europe, and the colored girl she had brought up from New York saw no difference in the child running about the house in its little velvet suit from the one who, with bound-up face and a heavy shade over his eyes, came up in the cars with her in Mrs. Carew's lap. Her duty being limited to a far-off watch on the child, to see that it came to no harm. She was the best witness possible in case of police intrusion or neighborhood gossip. As for Gwendolen herself, the novelty of the experience, and the prospect held out by a speedy departure to Papa's country, kept her amused and even hilarious. She laughed when her hair was cut short, darkened and parted. She missed but one thing, and that was her pet plaything, which she used to carry to bed with her at night. The lack of this caused some tears, a grief which was divined by Mrs. Ocumpa, who took pains to assuage it in the manner we all know. But this was after the finding of the second shoe, the event so long anticipated and so little productive. Somehow neither Mrs. Carew nor Mrs. Ocumpa had taken into consideration the fact of the child's shoes being rights and lefts, and when this attempt to second the first deception was decided on, it was thought a matter of congratulations that Gwendolen had been supplied with two pairs of the same make, and that one pair yet remained in her closet. The mate of that shown by Mrs. Ocumpa was still on the child's foot in the bungalow, but there being no difference in any of them, what was simpler than to take one of these and fling it where it would be found? Alas, the one seized upon by Mrs. Carew was for the same foot as that already shown and commented on, and thus this second attempt failed even more completely than the first, and people began to cry, a conspiracy! And a conspiracy it was, but one which might yet have succeeded, if Dr. Poole's suspicion of Mrs. Ocumpa's intentions, and my own secret knowledge of Mrs. Ocumpa's real position toward the child, could have been eliminated from the situation. But, with those two factors against them, detection had crept upon them in unknown ways, and neither Mrs. Ocumpa's frantic clinging to the theory she had so recklessly advanced nor Mrs. Carew's determined effort to meet suspicion with the brave front calculated to disarm it, was of any avail. The truth would have its way, and their secret stood revealed. This was the story told me by Mrs. Ocumpa, not in the continuous and detailed manner I have here set down, but in disjointed sentences and wild bursts of disordered speech. When it was finished, she turned upon me, eyes full of haggard inquiry. "'Our fate is in your hands,' she falteringly declared. "'What will you do with it?' It was the hardest question which has ever been put me. For minutes I contemplated her in a silence which must have been one prolonged agony to her. I did not see my way. I did not see my duty. Then— the fifty thousand dollars. At last I replied as follows. Mrs. Ocumpa, if you will let me advise you, as a man intensely interested in the happiness of yourself and husband, I would suggest your meeting him at quarantine and tell him the whole truth. I would rather die, she said. 
Yet only by doing what I suggest can you find peace in life. The consciousness that others know your secret will come between you and any satisfaction you can ever get out of your husband's continued confidence. A wrong has been done. You are the only one to right it. I cannot. I can die, but I cannot do that. And for a minute I thought she would die then and there. Dr. Poole is a fanatic. He will pursue you until he is assured that the child is in good hands. You can assure him of that now. Next month his exactions may take another direction. You can never trust a man who thinks he has a mission. Pardon my presumption. No mercenary motives prompts what I am saying now. So you intend to publish my story if I do not? I hesitated again. Such questions cannot be decided in a moment. Then, with a certain consciousness of doing right, I answered earnestly, To no one but Mr. Ocumpa do I feel called upon to disclose what really concerns no one but yourself and him. Her hands rose toward me in a gesture, which may have been an expression of gratitude or only one of simple appeal. He is not due until Saturday, I added gently. No answer from the cold lips. I do not think she could have spoken if she had tried. End of chapter 21「Chapter twenty two of the Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green. Chapter twenty two on the second terrace. My first step on leaving Homewood was to seek a public telephone. Calling up Dr. Poole in Yonkers, I assured him that he might rest easy as to the young patient to whose doubtful condition he had called my attention. That she was in good hands and was doing well. That I had seen her and would give him all the necessary particulars when I came to interview him later in the day. To his uneasy questions I vouchsafed little reply. I was by no means sure of the advisability of taking him into my confidence. It was enough for him to know that his demands had been complied with without injury to the child. Before hanging up the receiver I put him a question on my own behalf. How was the boy in his charge? The growl he returned me was very non-committal, and afforded me some food for thought as I turned back to Mrs. Carew's cottage, where I now proposed to make a final visit. I entered from the road. The heavily wooded grounds looked desolate. The copper beeches, which are the glory of the place, seemed to have lost color since I last saw them above the intervening hedges. Even the house, as it gradually emerged to view through the close shrubbery, wore a different aspect from usual. In another moment I saw why. Every shutter was closed, and not a vestige of life was visible above or below. Startled, for I had not expected quite so hasty a departure on her part, I ran about to the side door where I had previously entered and rang, fit to wake the dead. Only solitary echoes came from within, and I was about to curse the time I had lost in telephoning to Dr. Poole, when I heard a slight sound in the direction of the private path, and, leaping hastily to the opening, caught the glimpse of something, or somebody, disappearing down the first flight of steps. Did I run? You may believe I did, at least till I had descended the first terrace, then my steps grew gradually wary and finally ceased, for I could hear voices ahead of me, on the second terrace to which I had now come, and these voices came from persons standing still. If I rushed on, I should encounter these persons, and that was undesirable. I accordingly paused just short of the top, and so heard what raised the moment into one of tragic importance. One of the speakers was Mrs. Carew, there was no doubting this. The other was Mr. Rathbone. From no other lips than his could I hope to hear words uttered with such intensity, though he was guarded in his speech, or thought he was, which is not always the same thing. He was pleading with her, 
and my heart stood still with the sense of threatening catastrophe as I realized the attitude of the pair. He, as every word showed, was still ignorant of Gwendolen's fate, consequently of the identity of the child who I had every reason to believe was at that very moment fluttering a few steps below in the care of a colored maid, whose voice I could faintly hear. She, with his passion to meet and quell, had this secret to maintain, hearing his wild entreaties with one ear, and listening for the possible outbursts of the not-to-be-restrained child with the other. Mad to go, to catch the train before discovery overwhelmed her, yet not daring to hasten him, for his mood was a man's mood, and not to be denied. I felt sorry for her, and cast about in my mind what aid to give the situation, when the passion of his words seized me, and I forgot her position in the interest I began to feel in his. "'Valerie, Valerie,' he was saying, "'this is cruelty. You go with no good cause that I can see, put the sea between us, and yet say no word to make the parting endurable. You understand what I suffer, my hateful thoughts, my dread, which is not so much dread as, oh, that I should say it, oh, that I should feel it, hope, guilty, unpardonable hope. Yet you refuse me the little word, the kindly look, which would alleviate the oppression of my feelings, and give me thought of you to counteract this eternal brooding upon Gwendolen and her possible fate. I want a promise, conditional, oh God, but yet a promise, and you simply bid me to have patience, to wait, as if a man could wait who sees his love, his life, his future trembling in the balance against the fate of a little child. If you loved me, hush. The feeling in that word was not for him, I felt it at once. It was for her secret, threatened every instant she lingered there by some move, by some word which might escape a thoughtless child. You do not understand me, Justin. You talk with no comprehension of myself or of the event. Six months from now, if all goes well, you will see that I have been kind, not cruel. I cannot say any more. I should not have said so much. Go back, dear friend, and let me take the train with Harry. The sea is not impassable. We shall meet again, and then... Did she pause to look behind her down those steps, to make some gesture of caution to the uneasy child? You will forgive me what seems cruelty to you now. I cannot do differently. With all the world weeping over the doubtful fate of this little child, you cannot expect me to, to make any promise conditional upon her death. The man's cry drove the irony of the situation out of my mind. Perilities, all perilities. I, a man, life, soul, are worth some sacrifices. If you loved me, a quick ingathering of his breath, then a low moan, then the irrepressible cry she vainly sought to hush. Oh, Valerie, you are silent. You do not love me. Two years of suffering, two years of repression, then this delirium of hope, of possibility, and you, silent. I will trouble you no more. Gwendolen alive or Gwendolen dead, what is it to me? I... Hush! There is no doubt on that topic. The child is dead. Let that be understood between us. This was whispered and whispered very low, but the air seemed breathless at that moment, and I heard her. This is my last word to you. You will have your fortune whether you have my love or not. Remember that, and... Auntie, make Dinah move away. I want to see the man you are talking to. Gwendolen had spoken. End of chapter 22「twenty three of a millionaire baby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green, Chapter 23, A Coral Bead. What's that? It was Mr. Rathbone who first found his voice. To what a state have I come when, in every woman's face, even in hers, who is dearest, I see expressions I no longer understand, and in every child's voice catch the sound of Gwendolen's. Harry's voice is not Gwendolen's, came a desperate protest from the ready widow. A daring assertion for her to make to him, who had often held this child in his arms for hours together. You are not yourself. Justin, I am sorry. I... She almost gave her promise. Almost she risked her future, possibly his, by saying, under the stress of her fears, what her heart did not prompt her to, when, a quick move on her part, a low cry on his, and he came rushing up the steps. I had advanced at her hesitating words and shown myself. When Mr. Rathbone was well up the terrace, he hardly honored me with a look as he went by, I slowly began my descent to where she stood, with her back toward me and her arms thrown round the child, she had evidently called to her, in her anxiety to conceal the little beaming face from this new intruder. She had not looked as high as my face, I felt assured. That she would not show me hers unless I forced her to seemed equally certain. Every step I took downward was consequently of moment to me. I wondered how I should come out of this. What would she do? What I myself should say? The bold course commended itself to me. No more circumlocation, no more doubtful playing of the game with this woman. I would take the bull by the horns, and... I had reached the step on which she crouched. I could catch sight of the child's eyes over her shoulder, a shoulder that quivered. Was it with the storm of the last interview, or with her fear of this? I would see. Pausing, I said to her with every appearance of respect, but in my most matter-of-fact tones, Mrs. Carew, may I request you to send Gwendolen down to the girl I see below there? I have something to say to you before you leave. Gwendolen? With a start which showed how completely she was taken by surprise, Mrs. Carew rose. She may have recognized my voice, and she may not. It is hard to decide in such an actress. Whether she did or not, she turned with a frown, which gave way to a ravishing smile as her eyes met my face. You, she said, and without any betrayal in her voice or gesture, that she recognized that her hopes, and those of the friend to whose safety she had already sacrificed so much, had just received their death blow. She gave a quick order to the girl, who, taking the child by the hand, sat down on the steps Mrs. Carew now quitted, and laid herself out to be amusing. Gravely, Mrs. Carew confronted me on the terrace below. Explain, she said. I have just come from Mrs. Ocumpa, I replied. The veiled head dropped a trifle. She could not sustain herself, so all is lost? That depends, but I must request you not to leave the country till Mr. Ocumpa returns. The flash of her eye startled me. Who can detain me, she cried, if I wish to go? I did not answer in kind. I had no wish to rouse this woman's opposition. I do not think you will want to go when you remember Mrs. Ocumpa's condition. Would you leave her to bear the full burden of this deception alone? She is a broken woman. Her full story is known to me. I have the profoundest sympathy for her. She has only three days in which to decide upon her course. I have advised her to tell the whole truth to her husband. You! But the word was but a breath. But I heard it, yet I felt no resentment against this woman. No one could under the spell of so much spirit and grace. Did I not advise her right? Perhaps, but you must not detain me. You must do nothing to separate me from this child. I will not bear it. I have experienced for days now what motherhood might be 
and nothing on earth shall rob me of my present rights in this child. Then, as she met my unmoved countenance, If you know Mrs. Ocumpaugh's whole story, you know that neither she nor her husband has any real claim on the child. In that you are mistaken, I quickly protested. Six years of care and affection such as they have bestowed on Gwendolen, to say nothing of the substantial form which these have taken from the first, constitute a claim which all the world must recognize if you do not. Think of Mr. Ocumpa's belief in her relation to him. Think of the shock which awaits him when he learns that she is not of his blood and lineage. I know, I know. Her fingers worked nervously. The woman was showing through the actress. But I will not give up the child. Ask anything but that. Madam, I have had the honor so far to make but one requirement, that you do not carry the child out of the country, yet. As I uttered this ultimatum, some influence, acting equally upon both, caused us to turn in the direction of the river, possibly an apprehension lest some word of this conversation might be overheard by the child or the nurse. A surprise awaited us, which effectually prevented Mrs. Carew's reply. In the corner of the Ocumpa grounds stood a man staring with all his eyes at the so-called little Harry. An expression of doubt was on his face. I knew the minute to be critical and was determined to make the most of it. "'Do you know that man?' I whispered to Mrs. Carew. The answer was brief, but suggestive of alarm. Yes, one of the gardeners over there, one of whom Gwendolen is especially fond. She's the one to fear, then. Engage his attention while I divert hers. All this in a whisper, while the man was summoning up courage to speak. A pretty child, he stammered, as Mrs. Carew advanced toward him, smiling. Is that your little nephew I've heard them tell about? "'Seems to me he looks like our own little lost one, only darker and sturdier.' "'Much sturdier,' I heard her say, as I made haste to accost the child. "'Harry,' I cried, recalling my old address when I was in training for a gentleman, "'your aunt is in a hurry. The cars are coming. Don't you hear the whistle? "'Will you trust yourself to me? Let me carry you, I mean. Pick a back. "'While we run for the train?' The sweet eyes looked up. It was fortunate for Mrs. Carew that no one but myself had ever got near enough to see those eyes, or she could hardly have kept her secret. And, at first slowly, then with instinctive trust, the little arms rose and I caught her to my breast, taking care as I did so to turn her quite away from the man whom Mrs. Carew was about leaving. "'Come!' I shouted back. "'We shall be late!' and made a dash for the gate. Mrs. Carew joined me, and none of us said anything till we reached the station platform. Then, as I set the child down, I gave her one look. She was beaming with gratitude. That saved us, together with the few words I could edge in between his loud regrets at my going, and his exclamations over the grief of Gwendolen's loss. On the train I shall fear nothing, if you will lift him up, I will wrap him in this shawl as if he were ill. Once in New York, are you not going to permit me? To go to New York, yes, but not to the steamer. She showed anger, but she also showed admirable self-control. Far off we could catch the sounding thrill of the approaching train. I yield, she announced suddenly, and, opening the bag at her side, she fumbled in it for a card, which she presently put in my hand. I was going there for lunch, she explained. Now I will take a room and remain there until I hear from you. Here she gave me a quick look. You do not appear satisfied. Yes, yes, I stammered, as I looked at the card, and saw her name over that of an inconspicuous hotel in the downtown portion of New York City. I merely... the train... The nearing of the train gave me the opportunity of cutting short the sentence I should have found it difficult to finish. 
"'Here is the child,' I exclaimed, lifting the little one, whom she immediately enveloped in a light but ample wrap she had chosen as a disguise. "'Good-bye, Harry. Good-bye. I like you. Your arms are strong, and you don't shake me when you run.' Mrs. Carew smiled. There was deep emotion in her face. "'Au revoir,' she murmured, in a tone implying promise. Happily I understood the French phrase. I bowed and drew back. Was I wrong in letting her slip from my surveillance? The agitation I probably showed might have caused her some thought. But she would have been more than a diviner of mysteries to have understood its cause. Her bag, when she opened it before my eyes, revealed among its contents a string of remarkable corals. A bead similar in shape, color, and marking rested at that very moment over my own heart. Was that necklace one bead short? With the start of conviction I began to believe so, and that I was the man who could complete it. If that was so, why then, then? It isn't often that a detective's brain reels, but mine did then. The train began to move. This discovery, the greatest of all, if I were right, would... I had no more time to think. Instinctively, with a quick jump, I made my place good on the rear car. End of chapter 23Chapter 24 of The Millionaire Baby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green. Chapter 24. Shall I give him my word, Harry? I did not go all the way to New York on the train which Mrs. Carew and the child had taken. I went only as far as Yonkers. When I reached Dr. Poole's house, I thought it entirely empty. Even the office seemed closed. But appearances here could not always be trusted, and I rang the bell with a vigor which must have awakened echoes in the uninhabited upper portions. I know that it brought the doctor to the door, and in a state of doubtful amiability. But when he saw who awaited him, his appearance changed, and he welcomed me in, with a smile, or what was as nearly like one as his austere nature would permit. "'How now? Want your money?' "'Seems to me you have earned it with unexpected ease.' "'Not such great ease,' I replied, as he carefully closed the door and locked it. "'I know that I feel as tired as I ever did in my life. "'The child is in New York under the guardianship of a woman who is really fond of her. "'You can dismiss all care concerning her.' "'I see. And who is the woman? Name her.' "'You do not trust me, I see.' I trust no one in business matters. This is not a business matter, yet. What do you mean? I have not asked for money. I am not going to until I can perfectly satisfy you that all deception is at an end, so far as Mr. Ocumpa, at least, is concerned. Oh, you would play fair, I see. I was too interested in noting how each of his hands involuntarily closed on itself in his relief at not being called upon to part with some of his hoardings, to answer with aught but a nod. "'You have your reasons for keeping close, of course,' he growled, as he led me toward the basement stairs. "'You're not out of the woods, is that it? Or has the great lady bargained with you? Hum?" He threw the latter ejaculations back over his shoulder as he descended to the office. This displeased me, and I made no attempt to reply. In fact, I had no reply ready. Had I bargained with Mrs. Ocumpa? Hardly. Yet. She is handsome enough, the old man broke in sharply, cutting in two my self-communings. You are a fellow of some stamina. If you have got at her secret without making her a promise. So, the child is well. That's good. There's one long black mark eliminated from my account. But I have not closed the book, and I am not going to, till my conscience has nothing more to regret. 
it is not enough that the child is handed over to a different life. The fortunes that have been bequeathed her must be given to him who would have inherited them had this child not been taken for a veritable Ocumpa. That raises a nice point, I said, but one that will drag all false things to light. Your action in the matter along with the rest, I suggested. True, but do you think I stop because of that? He did not look as if he would stop because of anything. Do you not think Mrs. Ocumpa worthy of some pity? Her future is a ghastly one, whichever way you look at it. She sinned, was his uncompromising reply. The wages of sin is death. But such death, I protested, death of the heart, which is the worst death of all. He shrugged his shoulders, leading the way into the office. Let her beware, he went on surlily. Last month I saw my duty no further than the exaction of this child's dismissal from the home whose benefits she enjoyed under a false name. Today I am led further by the inexorable guide which prompts the anxious soul. All that was wrong must be made good. Mr. Ocumpa must know on whom his affections have been lavished. I will not yield. The woman has done wrong, and she shall suffer for it till she rises, a redeemed soul, into a state of mind that prefers humiliation to a continuance in a life of deception. You may tell her what I say, that is, if you enjoy the right of conversation with her. The look he shot me at this was keen as hate and spite could make it. I was glad that we were by this time in the office, and that I could avoid his eye by a quick look about the well-remembered place. This proof of the vindictive pursuit he had marked out for himself was no surprise to me. I expected no less, yet it opened up difficulties which made my way, as well as hers, look dreary in the prospect. He perceived my despondency and smiled, then suddenly changed his tone. "'You do not ask after the little patient I have here. "'Come, Harry, come. "'Here is someone I would like you to meet.' "'The door of my old room swung open, "'and I do not know which surprised me more. "'The kindness in that rugged old voice "'that I had never before heard lifted in tenderness, "'or the look of confidence and joy "'on the face of the little boy who now came running in so inexorable to a remorseful and suffering woman, and so full of consideration for a stranger's child. Almost well, pronounced the doctor, and lifted him on his knee. Do you know this child's parentage and condition? he sharply inquired, with a quick look toward me. I saw no reason for not telling the truth. He is an orphan and was destined for an institution. You know this? "'Positively. "'Then I shall keep the child. "'Harry, will you stay with me?' "'To my amazement the little arms crept around his neck. "'A smile, grim enough in my estimation, "'but not at all frightful to a child, "'responded to this appeal. "'I did not like the old man and woman,' he said. "'Dr. Poole's whole manner showed triumph. "'I shall treat him better than I did you,' he remarked. I am a regenerate man now. I bowed. I was very uneasy. There was a question I wanted to ask, and could not in the presence of this child. He is hardly of an age to take my place, I observed, still under the spell of my surprise, for the child was handling the old man's long beard, and seeming almost as happy as Gwendolen did in Mrs. Carew's arms. He will have one of his own, was the doctor's unexpected reply. I rose. I saw that he did not intend to dismiss the child. I should like your word, in return for the relief I have undoubtedly brought you, that you will not molest certain parties till the three days are up which I have mentioned as the limit of my own silence. Shall I give my word, Harry? The child, startled by the abrupt address, drew his fingers from the long beard he was playfully stroking, and, eyeing me with elfish gravity, seemed to ponder the question as if some comprehension of its importance 
had found entrance into his small brain. Annoyed at the doctor's whim, yet trusting to the child's intuition, I waited with inner anxiety for what those small lips would say, and felt an infinite relief, even if I did not show it, when he finally uttered a faint, Yes, and hid his face against the doctor's breast. My last remembrance of them both was the picture they made as the doctor closed the door upon me, with the sweet, confiding child still clasped in his arms. End of chapter 24「The Millionaire Baby」by Anna K. Green, Chapter 25 The Work of an Instant I did not take the car at the corner. I was sure that Jupp was somewhere around, and I had a new mission for him of more importance than any he could find here now. I was just looking about for him when I heard cries and screams at my back, and, turning, saw several persons all running one way. As that way was the one by which I had just come, I commenced running too, and in another moment was one of the crowd collected before the doctor's door. I mean the great front door which, to my astonishment, I had already seen was wide open. The sight which there met my eyes almost paralyzed me. Stretched on the pavement, spotted with blood, lay the two figures I had seen within the last five minutes, beaming with life and energy. The old man was dead, the child dying, one little hand outstretched as if in search of the sympathetic touch which had made the last few hours perhaps the sweetest of his life. How had it happened? Was it suicide on the doctor's part, or just pure accident? Either way, it was horrible, but... I looked about me. There was a man ready to give explanations. He had seen it all. The doctor had been racing with the child in the long hall. He had opened the door, probably for air. A sudden dash of the child had brought him to the verge. The doctor had plunged to save him, and losing his balance toppled headlong to the street, carrying the child with him. It was all the work of an instant. One moment, two vigorous figures, the next, a mass of crushed humanity. A sight to stagger a man's soul, but the thought which came with it staggered me even more. The force which had been driving Mrs. Ocumpa to her fate was removed. Henceforth her secret was safe, if I chose to have it so. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green Chapter 26 He Will Never Forgive I was walking away when a man touched me. Someone had seen me come from the doctor's office a few minutes before. Of course this meant detention till the coroner should arrive. I quarreled with the circumstances, but felt forced to submit. Happily Jupp now came to the front, and I was able to send him to New York to keep that watch over Mrs. Carew, without which I could not have rested quiet an hour. One great element of danger was removed, most remarkably, if not providentially, from the path I had marked out for myself, but there still remained that of this woman's possible impulses, under her great determination to keep Gwendolen in her own care. But with Jupp to watch the dock, and a man in plain clothes at the door of the small hotel, she was at present bound for. I thought I might remain in Yonkers contentedly the whole day. It was not, however, till late the next afternoon that I found myself again in Homewood. I had heard from Jupp. The steamer had sailed, but without two passengers who had been booked for the voyage. Mrs. Carew and the child were still at the address she had given me. All looked well in that direction, but what was the aspect of affairs at Homewood? I trembled in some anticipation of what these many hours of bitter thought might have affected in Mrs. Ocumpa. 
evidently nothing to lessen the gloom into which her whole household had now fallen. Miss Porter, who came in haste to greet me, wore the careworn look of a long and unrelieved vigil. I was not astonished when she told me she had not slept a wink. "'How could I?' she asked, when Mrs. Ocumpa did not close her eyes. She did not even lie down, but sat all night in an armchair, which she had wheeled into Gwendolen's room, staring like one who sees nothing out into the night through the window which overlooks that river. This morning we cannot make her speak. Her eyes are dry with fever, only now and then she utters a little moan. The doctor says she will not live to see her husband unless something comes to rouse her. But the papers give no news, and all the attempts of the police end in nothing. You saw what a dismal failure their last attempt was. The child on which they counted proved to be both red-haired and pockmarked. Gwendolen appears to be lost. Lost. In spite of the despair thus expressed, my way seemed to open a little. I think I can break Mrs. Ocumpa's dangerous apathy if you will let me see her again. Will you let me try? The nurse, we have a nurse now, will not consent, I fear. Then telephone to the doctor. Tell him I am the only man who can do anything for Mrs. Ocumpa. This will not be an exaggeration. Wait, I will get his order. I do not know why I have so much confidence in you. In another fifteen minutes she came to lead me to Mrs. Ocumpa. I entered without knocking. They told me to. She was seated, as they said, in a large chair, but with no ease to herself, for she was not even leaning against its back, but sat with body strained forward, eyes fixed on the ripple of that great river, where, from what she had intimated to me in our last interview, she probably saw as her grave. There was a miniature in her hand, but I saw at first glance that it was not the face of Gwendolen over which her fingers closed so spasmodically. It was her husband's portrait, which she held, and it was his face, aroused and full of denunciation, which she evidently saw in her fancy, as I drew nearer her in my efforts to attract her attention. For a shiver suddenly contracted her lovely features, and she threw her arms out as if to ward from herself something which she had no power to meet. In doing this her head turned slightly and she saw me. Instantly the spell under which she sat frozen yielded to a recognition of something besides her own terrible brooding. She let her arms drop, and the lips which had not spoken that morning moved slightly. I waited respectfully. I saw that in another moment she would speak. "'You have come,' she panted out at last, "'to hear my decision. "'It is too soon. "'The steamer has twenty-four hours yet before it can make port. "'I have not finished weighing my life "'against the good opinion of him I live for.' Then faintly, Mrs. Carew has gone. To New York, I finished. No farther than that, she asked anxiously. She has not sailed. I did not see how it was compatible with my duty to let her. Mrs. Ocumpa's whole form collapsed. The dangerous apathy was creeping over her again. You are deciding for me, she spoke very faintly. "'You and Dr. Poole.' "'Should I tell her Dr. Poole was dead? "'No, not yet. "'I wanted her to choose the noble course for Mr. Ocumpa's sake. "'Yes, and for her own. "'No,' I ventured to rejoin. "'You are the only one who can settle your own fate. "'The word must come from you. "'I am only trying to make it possible for you to meet your husband "'without any additional wrong.' "'to blunt his possible forgiveness. "'Oh, he will never forgive, and I have lost all.' "'And the set look returned in its full force. "'I made a final attempt. "'Mrs. Ocumpa, we may never have another moment together in confidence. "'There is one thing I have never told you, "'something which I think you ought to know, "'as it may affect your whole future course.' 
It concerns Gwendolen's real mother. You say you do not know her. No, no, do not bring that up. I do not want to know her. My darling is happy with Mrs. Carew, too happy. Oh, God, give me no opportunity for disturbing that contentment. Don't you see that I am consumed with jealousy, that I might... She was roused enough now, cheek and lip and brow were red. Even her eyes looked bloodshot. Alarmed, I put out my hand in a soothing gesture, and when her force stopped and her words trailed off into inarticulate murmur, I made haste to say, "'Listen to my little story. It will not add to your pain. Rather alleviate it. When I hid behind the curtain that day we all regret, I did not slip from my post at your departure. I knew that another patient awaited the doctor's convenience in my own small room, where he had hastily seated her when your carriage drove up. I also knew that this patient had overheard what you said as well as I, for impervious as the door looked, I had often heard the doctor's muttering when he thought I was safe beyond earshot, if not asleep, and I wanted to see how she would act when she rejoined the doctor, for I had heard a little of what she had said before, and was quite aware that she could help you out of your difficulty if she wished. She was a married woman, or she had been, and she had no use for a child, being very poor and anxious to earn her own living. Would she embrace this opportunity to part with it when it came? You may imagine my interest, boy though I was. And did she? Was she? Yes. She was ready to make her compact with the doctor, just as you had done. Before she left, everything was arranged for. It was her child you took, reared, loved, and have now lost. At another time she might have resented these words, especially the last, but I had roused her curiosity, her panting, eager curiosity, and she let them pass altogether unchallenged. Did you see this woman? Was she of common blood, common manners? It does not seem possible. Gwendolen is by nature so dainty in all her ways. The woman was a lady. I did not see her face. It was heavily veiled. But I heard her voice. It was a lady's voice, and... What? She wore beautiful jewels. Jewels? You said she was poor. So she declared herself, but she had on her neck under her coat a string of beads which were both valuable and of exquisite workmanship. I know, because it broke just as she was leaving, and the beads fell all over the floor, and one rolled my way, and I picked it up, scamp that I was, when both their backs were turned in their search for the others. A bead, a costly bead, and you were not found out? No, Mrs. Ocumpa, she never seemed to miss it. She was too excited over what she had done just then to count correctly. She thought she had them all. But this has been in my pocket for six years. Perhaps you have seen its like. I never have in jewelry shops or elsewhere, till yesterday. Yesterday? Her great eyes, haggard with suffering, rose to mine. Then they fell on the bead which I had taken from my pocket. The cry she gave was not loud, but it effectually settled all my doubts. "'What did you know of Mrs. Carew before she came to the area?' I asked impressively. For a minute she did not answer. She was trembling like a leaf. "'Her mother!' she exclaimed at last. "'Her mother, her own mother! And she never hinted it to me by word or look. "'Oh, Valerie!' "'Valerie, what tortures we have both suffered, and now you are happy, while I—' Grief seemed to engulf her. Feeling my position keenly, I walked to the window, but soon turned and came back in response to her cry. "'I must see Mrs. Carew instantly. Give my orders. I will start at once for New York. They will think I have gone to be on hand to meet Mr. Ocumpa, and will say that I have not the strength.' override their objections. 
I put my whole cause in your hands. You will go with me? With pleasure, madam. And thus was that terrifying apathy broken up, to be succeeded by a spell of equally terrifying energy. End of chapter 26《Chapter Twenty Seven》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green》Chapter Twenty Seven The Final Struggle She, however, did not get off that night. I dared not push the matter to the point of awakening suspicion, and when the doctor said that the ship was not due for twenty-four hours, and that it would be madness for her to start without a night's rest and two or three good meals, I succumbed, and she also to the few hours' delay. More than that, she consented to retire, and when I joined her in her carriage the following morning, it was to find her physically stronger, even if the mind was still a prey to deepest anguish and a torturing indecision. Her nurse accompanied us, and the maid called Celia, so conversation was impossible a fact I did not know whether to be thankful for or not. On the cars she was shielded as much as possible from everyone's gaze, and when we reached New York we were driven at once to the plaza. As I noticed the respect and intense sympathy with which her presence was met by those who saw nothing in her broken aspect but a mother's immeasurable grief, I wondered at the secrets which lie deep down in the hearts of humanity and what the effect would be if I should suddenly shout aloud. She is more wretched than you think. Her suspense is one that the child's return would not appease. Dig deeper into mortal fear and woe, if you would know what has changed this beautiful woman into a shadow in five days. And I myself did not know her mind. I could neither foresee what she contemplated, nor what the effect of seeing the child again would have upon her. I only knew that she must never for a moment be out of sight of someone who loved her. I myself never left the hall upon which her room opened, a precaution for which I felt grateful, when, late in the evening, she opened the door and, seeing me, stepped out fully dressed for the street. "'Come and tell Sister Angelina that I may be trusted with you,' she said." Sister Angelina was the nurse. Of course I did as she bade me, and after a few more difficulties I succeeded in getting her into a carriage without attracting any special attention. Once there she breathed more easily, and so did I. Now take me to her, she said. Whether she meant Mrs. Carew or Gwendolen I never knew. I now saw that the hour had come, for telling her that she no longer need have any fear of Dr. Poole. Whatever she contemplated must be done with a true knowledge of where she stood and to just what extent her secret remained endangered. I do not know if she felt grateful. I almost think that for the first few minutes she felt rather frightened than relieved to find herself free to act as her wishes in her preservation of her place in her husband's heart, and the world's regard impelled her. For she never for a moment seemed to doubt that now the doctor was gone, I would yield to her misery and prove myself the friend she had begged me to be from the first. She turned herself toward me and sought to read my face, but it was rather to find out what I expected of her than what she had yet to fear from me. I noted this and muttered some words of confidence, but her mood had already changed and they fell on deaf ears. I was not present at the meeting of the two women. That is, I remained in what they call a private parlor while Mrs. Ocumpa passed into the inner room, where she knew she would find Mrs. Carew and the child. Nor did I hear much. Some words came through the partition. I caught most of Mrs. Carew's explanation of how she came to give up her newborn child. She was an actress at the time, with a London success to her credit, but with no hold as yet in this country. She was booked for a tour the coming season. The husband who might have seen to the child was dead. She had no friends, no relatives here save a brother poorer than herself, 
and the mother instinct had not awakened. She bartered her child away as she would have parted with any other encumbrance likely to interfere with her career. But, here her voice rose, and I heard distinctly, a fortune was suddenly left me. An old admirer dying abroad bequeathed me two million dollars, and I found myself rich, admired and independent, with no one on earth to care for or to share the happiness of what seemed to me, after the brilliant life I had hitherto led, a dreary inaction. Love had no interest for me. I had had a husband, and that part of my nature had been satisfied. What I wanted now, and the wish presently grew into a passion, was my child. From passion it grew to mania. Knowing the name of her to whom I had yielded it, I had overheard it in the doctor's office. I hunted up your residence and came one day to Homewood. Perhaps some old servant can be found there today who could tell you of the strange, deeply veiled lady who was found one evening at sunset, clinging to the gate with both hands, and sobbing as she looked in at the triumphant little heiress, racing up and down the walks with a great mastiff named Don. They will say that it was some poor crazy woman or some mother who had buried her own little darling, but it was I, Marion, it was I, looking upon the child I had sold for a half-year's independence. I, who was broken-hearted now for her smiles and her touches, and saw them all given to strangers, who had made her a princess, but who could never give her such love as I felt for her then in my madness. I went away that time, but I came again soon, with the titles of the adjoining property in my pocket. I could not keep away from the sight of her, and felt that the torture would be less to see her in your arms than not to see her at all. The answer was not audible, but I could well imagine what it was. As every one knew, the false mother had not long held out against the attractions of the true one. Instinct had drawn the little one to the heart that beat responsive to its own. What followed I could best judge from the frightened cry which the child suddenly gave. She had evidently waked to find both women at her side. Mrs. Carew's hush, hush, did not answer this time. The child was in a frenzy and evidently turned from one to the other, sobbing out alternately, I will not be a girl again. I like my horse and going to Papa and sailing on the big ocean in trousers and a little cap and the softer phrases she evidently felt suited to Mrs. Ocumpa's deep distress. "'Don't feel bad, Mamma. You shall come to see me some time. Papa will send for you. I am going to him.' Then silence, then such a struggle of woman-heart with woman-heart as I hope never to be witness to again. Mrs. Ocumpa was pleading with Mrs. Carew, not for the child, but for her life. Mr. Ocumpa would be in port the next morning. If she could show him the child, all would be well. Mr. Trevitt would manage the details, take the credit of having found Gwendolen somewhere in the city, and that would ensure him the reward, and them his silence. I heard this. There was no one else to fear. Dr. Poole, the cause of all this misery, was dead, and in the future her heart being set to rest about her secret, she would be happier and make the child happier, and they could enjoy her between them. And she would be unselfish and let Gwendolen spend an hour or more every day with Mrs. Carew, on some such plea as lessons in vocal training and music. Thus pleaded Mrs. Ocumpa. But the mother hardly listened. She had eaten with the child, slept with the child, and almost breathed with the child for three days now, and the ecstasy of the experience had blinded her to any other claim than her own. She pitied Mrs. Ocumpa, pitied most of all her deceived husband, but no grief of theirs could equal that of Rachel crying for her child. Let Mrs. Ocumpa remember that when the evil days come. She had separated child from mother, child from mother, Oh, how the wail swept through those two rooms! 
I dared not prophesy to myself at that point how this would end. I simply waited. Their voices had sunk after each passionate outbreak, and I was only able to catch now and then a word which told me that the struggle was yet going on. But finally there came a lull, and while I wondered, the door flew suddenly open, and I saw Mrs. Ocumpa standing on the threshold, pallid and stricken, looking back at the picture made by the other two, as Mrs. Carew fell on her knees by the bedside, and held to her breast the panting child. "'I cannot go against nature,' she said. "'Keep Gwendolen, and may God have pity on me, and Philo.' I stepped forward. Meeting my eye, she faltered this last word. "'Your advice was good. "'Tomorrow, when I meet my husband, "'I will tell him who found the child "'and why that child is not at my side to greet him.' "'That night I had a vision I saw a door, "'shut, ominous. "'Before that door stood a woman, "'tall, pale, beautiful. "'She was there to enter, "'but to what no mortal living could say.' She saw nothing but lost in the hollowness of a living death behind that closed door. But who knows? Angels spring up unknown on the darkest road, and perhaps... Here the vision broke. The day and its possibilities lay before me. End of chapter 27 End of The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green read for you by Don Larson in Minnesota. Thank you for listening.